So today we're gonna do some polishing on our network stack. We're probably gonna write a TFTP client. Um, so we're just gonna hop into it. Get status, get diff. Um, I'm basically gonna undo this whole diff, if I'm not mistaken. Um, added my page fault handler. Yep. Uh, get log. Get reset hard. Okay, so all of that stuff goes away. That was kind of our test of network map memory, which worked great, um, but it's gone now. Oh yeah, and let's see the build time because someone was asking about that. One second for the bootloader, two point three seconds for the kernel. They can be ser uh, they can be parallelized, so it's two point three seconds to build right now. Um. The indie game dev community is mostly people asking others to write their games for them. Uh, they don't even accept guidance. Uh, they just code that just they, just code they can copy paste. Yeah, that sounds about right. Um, cargo count. Cargo count last time was not working. Yeah, cargo count's not working right now, so I don't know how many lines of code there are. I have no idea why cargo count is broken. Cargo. Um, I can't imagine it's more than 5,000 lines of code. This is on GitHub? Yeah. The, you can just search project here. Okay. All right, so let's go cargo run. Let's get... Are we doing this on hardware right now? Not necessarily. We're probably gonna do a little bit of benchmarking of our network stack as well. Um, there are a couple things I wanna test. I'm gonna actually do a sweeping range over the packet size. Uh, I wanna use that to identify if I'm bottlenecking on the network or if I'm bottlenecking on myself. So that's one thing I wanna check into. Uh, right now I think I'm bottlenecking on myself, but I, I, I also don't see how that is possible because I don't see any room for improvement. Um, <laughs> So, yeah. All right. Yeah, most, most indie developers are just learning. Absolutely. Yep. All right. So, we're going to go into kernel source main. And I think this is in a relatively good state right now. So, let's uh, get this run in. Okay, we got PyPixie running, and we'll wait for Vert Manager to come up. Most of the people are like that. They just want working code and aren't in really interested in understanding it. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people... Uh, the, the programmers are like 75% are doing it only for the money. 15% are only doing it for the, like, feature dev and, and the rush of, like, shipping something to prod and, like, having users get it. And then the remainder is, like, people who actually care about the, like, art of programming. And I'm not saying it should be everyone focused on the art of programming because there aren't enough developers who can do that. Um, it's not a lifestyle a lot of people can afford. Okay. OS dev. Ship that off to 8. And let me adjust my music vols. That looks good. And then switch up. We'll put, hmm, put this album on today. Okay. At least from my experience of being a mod in a big community for two years. Yeah. I mean, people just want stuff to work. People want to see the features ship. People want to see magic happen people people don't get into programming because they want to program people get into programming because they want to uh they want to do something they want to make a game that's in their own vision they want to implement a physics implementation in a game engine that no one else has done yet right no one actually really oh very few people actually care about the code and the performance and the interactions it has and the longevity of it and the styles of it and the developer workflows and the make systems and all this stuff. <laughs> I like the custom headphone padding. It's nice. Yeah. I got a new pair of headphones coming in like the next couple days here. 
Um, hey man, sorry if this question bothers you, but I was wondering how I can calculate the size of a function uh, written in inline assembly in Rust. There's not enough information in Google, and I uh, suspect you're plenty fluent in assembly. Uh, I'm moving from C++ to Rust. Um, I think you can do that by just using labels. Uh, I don't think you can get the labels out in Rust because the Rust stuff crashes pretty easily. Um, the Rust assembler crashes pretty easy, but I'm pretty sure you can do this. Um, vim test rs fn main uh, feature feature assembly, and then we'll do um, let's do something we know the size of. We'll just do like three knobs. Okay, and volatile intel. I don't know if you can make globals here. Uh, int3, 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 and then return. Oh, Russ is probably not going to like that. We'll do three knobs. Um, yeah, and let's see if I can do a global here. Russ C test RS. Okay, use of inline assembly is apparently unsafe. Shocker. Global foo bar. Okay, and then let's try global foo bar end. Let uh, extern C foo bar. This is a uh, uh, static. Foobar U32 and Foobar end. These can be empty types. Uh, maybe X and C won't like the empty. Yeah, we'll just do U8. Doesn't really matter. U8. Then I should be able to print uh, Foobar end as const blah as U size, and then foo bar as const blah as u size. It's the number of bytes. Never used. Yep, because we want to do a subtraction. And extern statics are unsafe. That's fine. You're doing assembly, so you have unsafe blocks. Um, interesting. I think those are getting mangled. Let's just put underscores on them. Mm. Unless those aren't getting turned into symbols, but I don't think that's the case. But yeah, it does look like it's trying to link against those. Oh, those Hi-Fi Man headphones? Yes, they are. Um, back. Hmm. Who bar, who bar end. Uh, yeah, what can I do here? I don't know if it's mangling. No mangle doesn't make sense during not declaring something. Yeah. I feel like I've run into this before where you can't do globals in global assembly for some reason. Because it, like, scopes it in another way. You could, you could, you could extract that information, uh... By doing like foobar end, where you literally move it into like a result register, but that's kind of gross. Um, and you'd need to like LEA those. Actually, you probably would be able to. Can't use more than one symbol in a memory operand. Yeah, that's fair. Anyways, I think this would work where you could move it out, but I don't think there's a good way through the operands right now in Rust. I think there is a way to do it. You can get access to like uh, label locations and jump locations. Last time I tried it, last time I tried basically anything other than register ins and outs to assembly, uh, Rust crashed. So, man, what you're talking about just got me thinking. I've been really sick of a large part of my life, and at the moment, I got accepted into a course that will lead to um, some C sharp. Xamarin work or whatever, but I'm a hobbyist and and uh, in my own opinion and all I do it for is some sort of legitimate uh, paper MCSD um, 
to actually do something, but not sure if it's even worth. Uh, sticking that much time and energy into something uh, like that for a paper, um, next to that, I could do way more stuff that I enjoy in my free time with programming. Uh, I mean, look, I, I don't know your life situations. I don't know your financial situations, what your what your future financials will be, what your current goals are, what your family status is, and all these different things. But um, I would say that you probably will make more money doing something you like if it's in programming, right? Obviously, if you just pursue what you literally like, you're probably fucked um, financially. But if you enjoy programming and you have programming projects that you enjoy working on... Um, there is really not a programming project that wouldn't make you money, right? If that's a web app, you're going to get more job offers. You're going to have a better resume for a web company. If you're writing OSs, systems developers or companies hiring systems developers will gobble you up. If it's writing just random benchmark applications, you could maybe get some interest from optimization folks, compiler teams, um, maybe Intel or like a, a company that works on the actual processors. Uh, maybe you enjoy writing allocators. At that point, maybe you'd get a job at a, a real-time embedded operating system where they're like working on allocators and trying to fit things on some new next-gen chip with new memory constraints or different memory parameters or timing. Um, it's just... Uh, I don't know. I, I feel like if you actually enjoy programming and you can encourage yourself to actually do something based on a passion you have, you're just going to make more money than appealing, I think. And you'll be happier, right? Uh, with some exceptions, game dev, arguably, you know, like if you force yourself to learn C and C++ and you do that such that you can get like a systems developer job, you'll probably make more money than like if you learned whiz-bang language for game development, right? Sorry, at the end of the day... Um, I work on allocators and garbage collection and compilers, et cetera, uh, and work on these professionally. Uh, it's not easy to get those jobs, but it does exist. Absolutely. And I would say you probably can't get into a specialized field like that unless you enjoy it or you, like, unluckily or luckily, whichever way you want to put it, got, like, forced into that role for, like, five or ten years, and you just now have that experience. But do you only use Rust in your OS? Yes, everything in here is Rust. Um, lately, I've been really enjoying testing, code review, and fuzzing, probably even more than actual programming. You should look into uh, doing security research. Do what you enjoy. Being happy will lead to being productive. If you can get enough money by programming or with a job that leaves you uh, firm to do programming, you'll be fine. Yeah, absolutely. I think the bar for programming of, like, you will always make enough money programming if you enjoy what you do. There's a good chance that if you force yourself to like try and learn some skill because you see that someone makes 80K instead of 70K, you're just probably not gonna follow through and you're gonna be a worse developer for it and you're gonna burn out sooner. I think that's really dangerous. I don't know. Game dev pays poorly compared to other fields that require the same amount of expertise, absolutely. A lot of game devs, um, a lot of game devs are there because they like games, right? Their, their motivation is typically not actually developing the games. It's, I mean, that is the goal, right? They want to, like, see something evolve, and they want to see something not exist and become something. Of course, everyone wants to see that. But ultimately, they a lot of people at game dev companies are gamers. And gamers uh, are not a rare breed. And it turns out um, large companies, large gaming companies, EA, Blizzard... Uh, it turns out there's not a fucking shortage of a line of people willing to walk in that door to make well under what they're worth because it's game dev, because they get, you know, that you fuck around for 40 hours a week until crunch time, right? At least that's what I've heard from a lot of game companies from multiple references that it's very common at game dev companies to, like, fuck around and play games all the time, and then at the end you, you, you work fucking 100-hour weeks and you hate, your, you hate yourself. Um... Obviously, there are a lot of, like, engine developers who are truly passionate about actually how the game internals and all that works. But, yeah. 
I read and write every day, but I'm a hobbyist in my opinion. Uh, that's where the dult, doubt also lies. Yeah, it's. I think it's it's tough. I mean, look, I. There are plenty of programmers out there who are who are making money and enjoying what they do, to enough of an extent that it's not like a lot of people's work where they fucking hate their job. So like, programming has a pretty high floor in terms of both pay and enjoyment. Because if you don't like your job, you can just do nothing for 30 hours a week, and you're fine. Like, no one gives a fuck. It's so relaxed. Obviously, certain bosses, certain work environments, yes, it'll matter. But in a lot of situations, whew, it's just lean back, coast, browse Reddit all day, hit up that water cooler, chill and relax. It is, it is the office it's the office, basically, where everyone's just fucking around all day. <clears throat> and I do like that. I get a lot more done if I fuck around for 35 hours a week than if I work for 40 hours a week. Because <laughs> no one can work for 40 hours a week. Or no one can program for 40 hours a week. It's just, it's just not possible. Sorry. It's just not, not a thing. Um, th three develop, uh, okay. I was 100% sure my future would be, uh, will be game dev. Uh, and then I got an internship at a game studio. Uh, just, just a few days was enough to convince me I never want to work in that industry. What were your experiences in there? Three developers on a mass scale sandbox game. So much mess everywhere. People didn't care about anything. Yeah, time to market matters a lot there. Why does your chair make weird noises? My chair doesn't. My mic boom does. Um... Fuck, uh, I'm in a, I'm in a third world country, uh, 45 hours a week, I'm fucked. <laughs> 45 hours a week is, is brutal, um, but for programming, you can, you know, you can fudge it a bit. I'm not saying you should, right, you should work to your fullest capacity for your employer. No one fucking does. <laughs> no one does. <laughs> That, or I have only ever been at companies where it's pretty relaxed. Uh, it's pretty hard to innovate if there is 40 hours a week of work to do, because you can't come up with things to do if you have no time to think. Yeah, no one can code for 45, 45 hours. It's brutal. Um, okay. So, I want to kind of change a little bit about the lock infrastructure that I'm writing. And I kind of enforce this model in exceptions where if your code can get hit, we'll take a look at it. If your code can, if the lock can ever get taken during an exception, then it's required that you actually do a non-blocking lock. Um, now the problem is that basically means that my entire network stack would have to have a uh, try locks on the whole thing and quite frankly if i'm servicing a page fault i'm not going to be able to if i'm servicing a page fault that's network mapped and i can't get access to the network driver i can't return back to execution so i think what i'm probably going to do is uh think about a design here for the locks that opens up that a little bit. I think what I'm going to have is probably a mode that I can set the core into and I can basically say, hey, I'm an interrupt uh, or I'm in an exception handler and if these things don't succeed, panic. So what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to change my, um, I'm going to change this. I'm not going to have a try lock. Maybe I'll keep try lock around just to have it, but I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the lock always just be lock and it will spin for a maximum of like five seconds if and only if you're in an exception if you're outside of an exception uh or you're in a disabled interrupt lock you can attempt to lock that forever right you can attempt to get that lock forever but in an exception i think what i'm gonna do is i'm gonna say um you have five seconds to get access to a lock and if you don't get access to the lock in five seconds uh it's game over panic um and that could be one second, that could be 100 milliseconds. The locks that I implement are fair, and that basically means that anything that you use in an exception handler 
has to not be locked by number of cores times duration, uh, or like time of lock timeout divided by cores times duration, right? And solve for whichever variable you want. But in this case, if we have 100 cores, so let's say 200 cores, actually let's say 300 cores. If we have 300 cores and they all never really hold a lock for more than 100 milliseconds, then I guess that's 30 seconds. That's a long fucking time. 100 millis is a long time to have a lock. Whatever it is, we're probably just going to put a limit on the amount of time that we hold a lock for. Uh, once again, deadlocks are not an issue. They're a debugging issue. Deadlocks are not a feature issue, a functionality issue. They are a displayability and de debuggability issue. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to turn deadlocks or halt states into a panic such that the developer knows more local to the location because a deadlock typically shows up as nothing happens. And nothing happening happens to be very difficult to debug. So uh, since we have fair locks, we have ticket locks in all of this, once you request a lock, you are in the queue. So if within five seconds you don't get your ticket called, panic. Um, and that's only going to be the case in exceptions. So, I think that's what we're going to do. Um, it's just going to it's gonna make this code base a lot cleaner. Um, like, having not doing the try lock and an exception, it's typically fatal anyways. Pretty much all the cases where I had a try lock, I just panicked, right? So, what I want to do is I just want to panic out anyways because that's what I was doing in all the locations I implemented. So, basically, what I did is I implemented a feature for something that I could see myself using. And then I found that I always use it in a different way than I anticipated. So, I'm going to go back and I'm going to change that into the way that I'm currently thinking. Um, so, hell yeah. My experience has been uh, that the devs on pretty big AAA games uh, were about average and uh, we're about average, and the code was full of bugs uh, they had no idea how to fix. Within hours of starting the internship, I found a bug that uh, they already fixed like 10 times, and <laughs> we're sure it was fixed for good. Yeah, that sounds about right. Uh, speaking of locks, I remember seeing someone mention that they found a benchmark that showed that mutexes are faster than your locks. Uh, it was like an hour ago. Um, interesting. Um... Uh, was that mentioned in this chat? Uh, I would I would love to look at that. Keep in mind, I was doing worst case scenarios. They might not have had enough cores to do that test. Um, or they might have done a contrived example. In which case, that's easy. It's easy to make a situation where uh, mutexes are faster than locks. It's, it's whenever someone holds the lock for a significant amount of time. It, it's literally if someone holds the lock for more than like 5 milliseconds, a mutex is better. Because then all the other threads can fuck off, sleep, get rescheduled, do something. Otherwise, you're just eating them. In terms of latency, I would doubt that they can beat it. It wasn't this chat. It was too far up in the history. Um, I found a Rust benchmark for different locks, mutex spin lock, etc. And I tried adding the ticket lock you showed the other day, but it turned out slower. IRC uh, mutexes seem to be the fastest ones under contention. Uh, I don't know if that could be... Uh, related to me being on an i5. The crit section was uh, just an ad. Interesting. Yeah, I would I would be curious about uh, what that environment was. Uh, I would like to reproduce the results. I could try them on, on both my... Uh, uh, on my Coffee Lake, my Sky Lake, and my Xeon Phi to try it on on a couple UArches. Depends what kind of mutex you use. There are different libraries with different implementations. Yeah, I think... The latency should always be better on a spin lock, but the mutex should be better in, in most situations in terms of actual performance, right? So the latency sh will always pretty much be higher. It's possible that for the case of like N is one to four CPUs, that a non-ticket based lock would be faster for latency. Um, but typically a mutex is a spin lock, yep. And then a fallback. So I don't really see how a mutex could outperform the latency of a spin lock. But I do see how you could potentially be halting your cores or, or causing busy work that then causes the lock to be held longer than it's supposed to be held. Um, 
So I think that's a possible case. OG is a webcam. Hell yeah, brains man. Face cam. What's up, censored smile? How are you doing today? Good to see you back. Okay, so we're going to change these locks. So the first thing we're going to do before we do this change, so we want to figure out how much we want to change here. So basically, anywhere that we do try lock, we're going to be changing. And this looks like it's in a very select few places, uh, and we should be able to get rid of all of those pretty quickly. So what we're going to do is we're going to change our implementation of lock. In fact, try lock is going to go away. Why? Because I don't currently have a use for a try lock. If I need a try lock, I will implement one in the future. It reduces some of the complexity of this code. Um, since right now, I'm no longer going to have a need for a try lock. I'm going to remove that code uh, just right now. We can always add it in back later. Um, adding code is a lot easier than removing code. Okay, and let's see. I think I want to inherit this. No, I do not want to inherit that uh, comment. How are these locks different from a mutex? These are spin locks, and a mutex typically refers to a lock that will go to the operating system and sleep um, when they are busy, and that allows the operating system to reschedule those cores and wake them up uh, or cause them to halt, so go into a lower power state. It's more about uh, system efficiency, not perform uh, program efficiency. Uh, spin lock should pretty much always be faster than mutexes, um, with the exception of maybe some contention and cache line thrashing. But uh, mutexes are much better for system performance, not for individual application performance. These locks that we're implementing here are uh, spin locks. Um, they are basically the same as mutex. So when you do a lock cell on a type, it's basically the same as a mutex. And that's kind of the whole design of this, is that it, it, it appears the same as a, as a mutex. We don't call it mutex, though, to differentiate from some of the common behaviors. OK. So owner value. Perfect. We move the value in there. We have the ticket, the release, and the interrupt state phantom data. Now, what we're going to do is if this interrupt disables interrupts, um, if it disables interrupts or we're not in an interrupt, uh, so this is basically detecting whether or not we have instrumented that this lock can be used in an interrupt. If we instrument a lock and say this can be used in an interrupt, we actually will just decrease inter decrement interrupts or disable interrupts for the entire time that that lock is held. And that guarantees that we never deadlock in a situation where a lock is held in both uh, uh, user space or wherever, and that gets interrupted, and then the interrupt handler uses that same lock. It basically prevents that situation from ever happening. Now, we have an exceptional case, which is an exception. And in the case of an exception, previously, we would alert the user and say, you can only use a try lock, a failable lock type, in an exception handler because you need to be able to continue executing if you're in an exception handler. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to change the semantics and that's the goal of this. Um, so what we're going to do is we'll get the core ID. We will disable interrupts if needed. We will no longer have a try lock. We will take a ticket. We will spin. And let's do this. Um, yeah, this is correct. So if this interrupt needs to disable interrupts, or this lock needs to disable interrupts, we will disable interrupts. Then we'll take a ticket that's our unique identifier into the lock. We will then wait until our ticket has been called. And while we're waiting for our ticket to be called, we're going to check on the owner of the lock. And if the owner of the lock is ourselves, then we're going to panic because we know that we cannot release the lock if we already have that lock ourselves. So this is our deadlock detection here. And that will pretty print the location of which the lock was taken the second time that caused the deadlock, which is actually really nice. And this will loop until we have the lock, until our ticket is called. Once our ticket is called, we're going to store the owner of the lock into that, uh, this uh, owner, owner field. There is a race condition here where it's possible that you can take the lock and you cannot update the owner. For example, if you were to take the lock here, you had an interrupt or exception happen at this stage. And then here, you ended up, um, you ended up uh, not detecting that deadlock and then you'll get a true deadlock where it won't panic. Uh, in that situation, it's still 
not breaking the code. And that being said, any except, uh, any lock that you can take during an interrupt um, will not happen here. And there shouldn't be any exceptions occurring between here and here, which means this is actually correct in all cases due to the constraints on the locks. Next, uh, we have shatter. This allows us to forcibly get access to the lock contents, regardless of if uh, the lock is held or not. This is used in some of the teardown states uh, where the system is unstable. For example, in a panic, a lock might have been held when the panic occurred. This allows uh, some of the cleanup code to forcibly get access to the contents of those locks and reinitialize or grab some fields out that they need. All right. Finally, we have lock cell guard. So when we create this lock, we return out this lock cell guard. And that lock cell guard uses Rust drop uh, syntax, which will automatically cause this destructor to get called when the lock is no longer held. That means we don't have to release the lock ourselves. It'll automatically get released uh, when Rust can release it. And to do that, we will uh, set that there's no longer an owner of the lock. We will then release the lock by incrementing the um, the, the release, which is basically the ticket that's being called, will call the next ticket. And if there's no ticket in line, that ticket will be sitting on the counter as the next available ticket. And then we will re-enable interrupts uh, if needed. So we'll, we'll signal that we have finished this lock and we can re-enable interrupts. Um, and that's the design here, which is pretty neat. So... The problem is we actually end up using this in exceptions. And in exceptions, you might not have a choice of whether or not locks are held. Now, previously, we um, we actually detected that situation. We said if you try to get if you try to get access to a lock while in an exception, then you need to use try lock, which is the failable lock. What we're gonna do is we're actually gonna make this internally failable, but only for the uh, trilock case. So to do that, we're gonna have a let mute um, time threshold is OU64. And this is the um, this is the number of attempts to take the lock. What about reentrant and recursive locks? Uh, what do you mean in that situation? In this case, we'll never have the lock held twice. You mean like a lock inside of a lock? That's just fine because they're separate locks. You'll have one lock for the outside and another lock for the inside, and they will they'll be independent. For the shatter thing you mentioned mentioned on panics, um, that's very unsafe, and it's just up to us to manage that correctly. Um, so by the time that we use shatter, we make sure that all other cores on the system have been disabled. Like not, not that they aren't, they don't have the lock held that literally we have sent them a forcible non-maskable interrupt and they have checked in and they have said, I have received your message to stop doing stuff and I have stopped doing stuff. And then they spin forever doing nothing. That guarantees that no other cores are fighting for the resource. The fact that you're in an exception guarantees that no one else is going to fight for that resource unless you have an exception in your exception, in which case um, shit's going to happen. Things are going to go recursive. There's not much you can do in that case. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that answers the question. But yeah, it's, it's up to us to maintain when we can use shatter. And we basically will never use shatter on anything that's always correct. So, for example, when we want to get access to the serial port, it's possible that someone had the lock on it and they were in the middle of sending something that's partially sent or the state of the device is not in the correct state. So we reinitialize the device. So anything that we use, we will reinitialize before we actually uh, re-execute. Um, so... That's kind of how it works right now. So the we use Shatter to get access to like the APIC, which we know that provably is never in a state that is, um, it's never in a temporary state. We know that we're never returning to the old state. So we know that as long as we can get the state of the device into a state which is serviceable, we can shatter the locks on it. Out of the dozen, dozens of uh, targets I've looked at in my life, there's only been one I've failed to find an exploitable bug in. Can you do, uh, talk about what that target was? Yeah, it was a uh, Wi-Fi chipset on an Android phone. It kicked my ass. There was almost no code in it. It hurt. It hurt. Left a scar on my life. 
Um, okay, we're gonna take a ticket. We're gonna have a time threshold of number, number of attempts to take the lock. And what we're gonna do is we'll just have 10,000. And that can just be a U32. Rust will do that for us. And what we can do is um, time threshold minus equals one. And we can say if time threshold is equal to zero. Uh, yeah, we'll see if it's greater than zero, then do this. Else, it's equal to zero, or it's less than or equal to zero. We'll make this unsigned just so we can do that. So if the time threshold is greater than zero, then we'll subtract it. Otherwise, um, so this will be decrement number of attempts. And then this will be, um, we've tried getting access to the lock for a decent enough amount of time that we can affordably uh, use RDTSC now to enforce a um, seconds-based timeout. How do you feel about uh, expressions like 1E4, like scientific notation? I got no problem with them. Um, I actually quite like scientific notation. All right. So we're going to decrement that threshold. When that threshold number of attempts to take the lock, then at this stage, we will do uh, let mute timeout is equal to zero. And we'll say if not... If timeout is zero, then timeout is equal to CPU RDTSC future, uh, time RDTSC future, and we'll say one second. Okay. This is set a timeout for a second in the future. Then, otherwise, if the timeout is not zero, then we know that we can check. Uh, whether we exceeded the timeout. So here we'll do a CPU RDTSC uh, if this is greater than or equal to the timeout, then we'll panic. And here we can say um, uh, timed out when attempting to take lock. Okay, that should be pretty good and that code should work. Now, this is not a sum. This is just the lock cell guard. And now we have a path that will end in a panic. Uh, use crate time. Uh, ooh. Oh, yeah. We don't, oh, we don't have time here. Ooh. We don't have access to time. Shit. Huh. I mean, we can just still do a timeout and it'll just vary by the system. This will be uh, timeout is equal to CPU RDTSC plus this. This is um, uh, one second on a three gigahertz processor, right? So on a three gigahertz processor, that's one second. Unfortunately, I don't have access to the timing information. Uh, I could, you know, I could actually get that. Yeah, we'll do that. Um, we can get that through interrupt state and we can do FN uh, RDTSC frequency U32. By default, it returns, I don't know. We'll do this. We're not we're not really running this in box. Uh, undeclared CPU. Ooh, we might have we might have some cyclical stuff going on here. I don't want to pull in a dependency on CPU. I don't think I need to for RDTSC. It's just kind of unnecessary. We'll just do uh, FN RDTSC and we'll remake RDTSC here because it it's it's, it's zero cost. This is, uh, I got the timestamp counter. 
And this will be core arc. Uh, actually, we'll do assembly here. SP uh, shared CPU source lib RDTSC. We'll just grab this. Technically, there is a Rust function I can call that gets the timestamp counter. However, that is not present. Um, it's, it's not present on both 32 and 64 in the same way. Thus, I would need to, um, I would need to have a conditional compilation on there. So I'll just do the inline assembly. I've got no problem with that. Okay, so now we have issues where things don't have try, uh, try lock, which is good. And then we're gonna wanna come back here and we're gonna wanna make this only happen during exceptions. We want to be able to hold a lock forever unless it's in an exception. So it will only be used in the exception case. Uh, it'll enable this like whole timeout code and structure. Okay. So let's go into, uh, I guess we just have to start fixing all of these things. We're gonna have to do them regardless, so we're, we're just gonna have to go. We're gonna do uh, kernel source print, uh, try lock. Okay, here. Now it's just the same every time. Here we will say, um, get access to the serial port. I will do try. I will do lock. We will then print the message to the serial port, and that's only if it exists. That makes sense. Then this same thing. Delete all this. Go back to here. This is um, this is uh, lock the print arguments. So. Um, Cores don't interleave their print statements. Now that's a good candidate for a try lock because that is one that doesn't really matter. Uh, SP, we got an issue at print. Okay, and what was it before? Serial is lock as mute. Um, here I can do, yeah, lock. That'll give us mutable access. Okay, uh, kernel source panic. Try lock, a lot of these situations. Um, we'll just lock the old serial port. We're gonna replace it anyways. We're gonna try lock. Uh, ooh, that is a situation where a, a try lock actually could be nice. No, doesn't matter in this case. Lock. Lock dot read byte. And this is, I think, read byte. And I think we have to unwrap that because I think it's an option serial. So, yep. That's an option serial, so we'll do as mute, unwrap, rebyte. Okay, then at 310, on um, kernel source interrupts. We only have a couple left. Uh, it's actually easier than I thought it was gonna be. Yeah, there we were panicking anyway, so this is doing the exact same thing, but better, because this one will try a little bit. Um, Okay, 348. This is in kernel source apic. Try lock. Same thing, that one was just panicking anyways. This is literally just made it better, in my opinion. Okay. And, ooh, 348 as mute. All right, cannot borrow as mutable. That's in uh, kernel source print. You know, I thought about that when I wrote it. Mute. All right. 
So that should be building everything, no warnings, no errors, and everything should be functioning as normal. There we go, everything's functioning great. We can see your face, hell yeah, what's up? How's it going, woo! Um, assembly, woo! Yeah, we'll be doing a lot more assembly in the near future. I, I recognize that like two streams ago, someone saw we wrote assembly and got really fucking excited about it. Uh, we'll be doing a lot of assembly, um, probably starting in the next couple days. Stay hydrated, guys. I always forget to drink water, and then my voice gets fucked. <laughs> I love how you always sound so excited and interested in what you do. Inspiring? Hell yeah, that's what I desire. That's what I desire to be. All right. So we want to test this code. We want to make sure that this behaves as it's supposed to. So what we're gonna do is we're going to disable the deadlock detection. Um. And what we're gonna do is we'll go kernel source main and we're gonna cause a deadlock. And we'll do that by getting access to, I don't know, the serial port. Serial one is equal to core dot boot args dot serial dot lock. All right. And here we go. See, it's not working as expected, which is great because that means that we caught something here. So we set the time threshold to 10,000. When the time threshold exceeds, oh, we can't, we can't panic with the serial lock held. Yeah, we need another thing to lock. Um, let mute. Temp is lock cell new five. And then we'll do temp dot lock. The, the, the print lock's a, a unique one in that we can't really panic. Well, we should be able to panic, actually. Never mind. Yeah, we should be able to panic if we have the serial lock held. Let me see. I should be able to panic here. Well, that deadlocks. And then that goes into here. And I'm just gonna panic in in this situation. If, if we didn't immediately get the lock, I might hit that panic in other spots. It's hard to say. Hmm. Interesting. If I do this, we should be fine. I would suspect that what it should be doing. Okay, so that's printing one character and then it's getting stuck. Because we're panicking in there. Okay. Time it. If the time threshold is greater than zero, which it is at the start, then we decrement and that's all we're doing. Once we get to a certain point where that goes to zero, then we do an RDTSC plus three billion. And then, on every subsequent one, we actually check the timeout. And I'm, I'm guessing that it is an issue with not being able to panic in that state, but I disagree with that. Uh, kernel source panic. We should be a little bit more bulletproof than that. And I think the issue is I might need a try lock. So if I get rid of this, I think we're fine. We will see that panic come through. We'll see the timeout. Well, this will just work. Okay, now if I put these back in. Um, good. Oh, that was beautiful. And I'm gonna get rid of taking that lock because I, I don't need to worry about it. All right, but yeah, that worked. One second, one second passes, couldn't get the lock, timed out when attempting to take lock. We still got print messages, even though we locked the serial lock. So that means we were able to recover the serial driver, get control of it again, print a useful panic message, um, and we had that one second delay, which is beautiful. It's a little less than a second on this machine. It's probably like uh, 
uh, three quarters of a second, but it's just meant to be something rooted in wall clock to some extent. That means on my Xeon Phi, it would be uh, three seconds, and on a fast, faster five gigahertz processor, it's it's five seconds, right? It actually makes sense that we do a timeout in cycles rather than in wall clock time, because then we're actually doing a timeout based on the amount of CPU time to do some work, which is uh, pretty interesting there. I do like that. Okay, so now we can add this deadlock detection back in, and deadlock detection is a special case, and this will, um, this will now print deadlock detected immediately. It won't wait because it detects the deadlock right away, and obviously that's a panic. And it tells you conveniently that the deadlock occurred at 8624, and if we look, that is where we caused our deadlock. I don't have a gear specs thing. I, I run a bunch of different stuff here. What are you interested in knowing about? All right. Okay. Do do do. What's your main machine specs? I don't. I don't really have a main machine. Is the is the big issue? So it varies. It varies between three machines. I've got this machine here that has a six core uh, coffee lake at uh, five gigahertz, uh, four point eight gigahertz turbo, and sixty four gigs of RAM on this. I have a workstation which is an eight core, five gigahertz turbo, sixty four gigs of RAM. And I have a laptop, which is a 8-core, 5 gigahertz processor, 64 gigs of RAM. Seems to be a pattern there. All of, them run, all of them run Debian. And this has two GTX 1080s in it, which are now starting to get old, which is so weird. Which is so weird. I'm not, I'm not used to assembly being old, but it is now. Or not assembly being old. Uh, 1080s being old. Uh... How do you know when assembly is the right choice compared to a higher level language? Um, typically, whenever you need to interact directly with hardware, uh, and that's typically interacting with something that is architecture specific, something that only the processor that you're working with implements. Uh, in that case, the high level language has no way of expressing that, uh, unless you're forced. Uh, there may be intrinsics, right? Always look for intrinsics. But at that point, you're, for you're forced to do uh, assembly. Was that domain VM a domain controller? No, it's just a, it's just a domain joined computer. Uh, 1080s getting old. I mean, they are right. Like, I got I got this 1080 a long fucking time ago. I don't know. Uh, probably had this 1080 for three years, four years. Yeah, I think I had it before I moved to. Washington. <laughs> I don't know. When I was a kid, a year was a long time on a GPU. Like, I was getting new GPUs every year. That being said, I was getting shitty GPUs every year. So I was getting the, a new $80 GPU every year. Whereas now I just get the best possible GPU you can get, and it turns out that lasts for a while. <laughs> Have to admit something? All this time I mentioned you being on the heftier side? Nope. I can't really gain weight. I don't know why, but I can't. I probably just don't eat too much. I don't snack, I think is the biggest thing. I don't really snack at all. That's never been a thing. I don't like chips. I don't I don't like really most of the snack items. I don't really like cookies. I don't like many sweets. I will snack on an apple. <laughs> Do you drink sodas? No, I haven't I haven't had a soda in in, in probably fifteen years. <laughs> Um, I think it's because you talked about the rice and pasta all the time. I do love rice and pasta. I do have massive quantities of rice and pasta. I always have like 40 pounds of each on hand. Um, I need to start getting beans. I never, I never cook beans, but I should always have beans on hand. I don't know why I don't. 15 years, God bless. Yeah, I mean, I just, it doesn't do anything for me, man. It just... Caffeine doesn't affect me at all, so I don't need the caffeine. The sugar doesn't really affect me at all. It's Sugar is starting to have more of an effect on me than it 
ever has. So that's kind of new. Um, but, like, the taste is really not that good. Like, I feel like there's really no situation where I would rather have a a soda versus, like, sparkling water and a, and a, a cut up a, a pineapple or a, an apple. <laughs> like, I don't know. It, it's, it, uh, I, I don't know. Okay. So here what we're going to do is we're going to say if... If the I in exception... If we're in an exception, this is 10,000, else it's zero, not zero. So this is, uh, we'll do this syntax. Number of attempts allowed to take, um, uh, number of attempts of taking the lock until we, um, number of attempts of taking the lock until we, uh, use a timestamp counter based countdown until a timeout panic. We only use this timeout during exceptions as all other conditions should either never deadlock due to um, interrupts getting disabled a la a la uh, uh, locks that get held, taken during an interrupt. Um, deadlocks on a single core are easily detected, and thus we can panic on those. This leaves one condition, exceptions. During an exception, it is possible that we need access to a lock. If we cannot get access to a lock uh, in a given amount of time, the exception handler can handler cannot do the correct thing correct thing anyways, and thus we need to bring the system down uh, with a panic. All right. Just bought a pack of Inca Cola. I need to finish that off first. Though I wish I liked tea. Tea doesn't really do anything for me. I, I enjoy tea. I don't mind tea. I'm not really going to make it on my own. M maybe if I'm really in that mood. If I'm really looking to lean back and, and, and sip on a cup of tea. But it's not, something I'll, it's not something I drink nearly weekly. Do you take any vitamins? Yeah, I just take a normal multivitamin. I had my iron drop like relatively low recently, so I started taking uh, started taking vitamins. Alcohol, weed, tobacco? No, I mean I'll have like a glass of wine a day, maybe two glasses of wine a day. Um, tea is the drink of the evil British. We don't do tea. Yeah. Okay. So we basically disable that time threshold effectively. In that case, technically we could do an if statement, but I like the code uh, reduction of code duplication. Having this countdown from all Fs uh, is fine. So if we're in an exception, we'll count down from here. That will then trigger us to cause a timer. Now what we're doing here by using this time threshold before RDTSC, in theory we could do RDTSC set a timer up beforehand. But RDC, RDTSC costs 30 to 80 cycles, depending on your microarchitecture. So what we do is we make sure that we can't get the lock for a significant enough amount of time before we actually use a timeout. Um, this will cause nothing to decrement. It's half a cycle uh, at, at most to decrement that counter. So that means for half a cycle, for 10,000 iterations, we try to get the lock. After that point, we've, we've spun for at least 5,000 cycles. At that point, the RDTSC is no longer going to be a large amount of the cost. Thus, we will do the RDTSC, we'll compute that actual timeout, and then we'll start using the timeout value, which will be uh, which will cause the panic. And this is the timeout 
um, based off of the TSC to determine when to give up on the lock and just panic. Simon, how's it going? Throws Tina Bosnar. Hell yeah. There's quite a few times where I want something more than water, but I don't like uh, tear coffee, so it's basically just soda or liquor. Um, I mean, do you like sparkling water? Do you like uh, plain sparkling water, flavored sparkling waters? If you've never tried like a high-end, um, non-sweetened, fuck sweetened sparkling water, have you ever tried like a, a nice non-sweetened sparkling water? Um, there are definitely some good ones that add plenty of flavor for me. Um, also just like squeeze some, have some fresh limes or lemons around and, and squeeze them into your uh, water or put a pitcher in your fridge and, and cut up some fruit every day and have a uh, different like fruit in there every day. So like cut up some pineapple and, and have some water marinated in that. Uh, do you recommend any brands? Uh, LaCroix is pretty good. LaCroix has a, a Curate line, which is like their, their like nicer, higher class line, uh, which is pretty good. Hot lemon water is pretty good. I don't buy lemons either. Um, pretty much only drink water. Lemons just don't go bad forever. So like just buy some lemons and have them in your fridge. <laughs> They're like... You can you can buy a lemon and and cut it up over the course of a, a probably a few weeks and you're fine. Don't get me started on those sugary flavored sparkling waters, dude. Sugar sugar sparkling waters are just pointless. Just have a soda at that point. <laughs> what do you want? What, like what what's the goal here? And I know what the goal is. I know what the goal is. It's to convince yourself. It's to convince yourself that's that you're drinking water. <laughs> Sweet things are overrated. I disagree with that. I do love sweet things. I'm a sucker for the the fruitiest fucking drinks possible. I, if I go into a bar and they have like a mango infused pineapple kiwi strawberry cocktail, oh, you know I'm fucking, I, I'm, I'm gobbling that shit up. <laughs> love that shit. Not as much as I used to. I'll typically drink uh, uh, vodka tonics, which arguably are soda. So I do, I do drink vodka tonics. I don't at home. That's only if I'm out, so it's relatively rare. But I do drink vodka tonics, which are it's the same as a vodka, uh, a vodka, um, like literally anything. I guess a rum and coke. <laughs> it's about the same as a rum and coke. So that's that's my that's my guilty pleasure. I can have like some sweets every now and then. Can't have sweet stuff a lot. Yeah, I don't know. I, I'll American culture just really promotes sweet things, which is strange. We don't really have any savory things. Like if you go to a restaurant in America and they have only savory desserts, you're like, what the fuck is this place? Where's my where's my chocolate fudge double triple whipped cream brownie? <laughs> Uh, I'm just trying to cut back on sugar in general. Always looking for more stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, cutting out sodas is pretty easy. And in my opinion, uh, cutting out sodas is pretty easy. It's just... It's... I don't know. It, it's just not that good. It just isn't. In, in, in my opinion, it's just not that good. And I feel like the the worse the soda is for you, the worse it is. Kind of like um uh, like Mountain Dew, man. Mountain Dew is just, come on, it's just not good. <laughs> it's just not good. <laughs> like it's just bad. <laughs> Problem is, I use sodas for mixers. Well, given you're not, given you're not an alcoholic, it's fine if you use them for mixers. <laughs> That's fine. If you're an alcoholic, then. Yeah, you might have to start doing your vodka sodas, but if you're an alcoholic, the alcohol is worse than the sodas. So if you're an alcoholic, cut out the alcohol and drink your Coca-Cola, and then once you do that for a year, cut that out and, and don't do either. Are you using AT500s? Yeah, these are AT500s. <laughs> Mr. Pibb's vanilla strawberry flavor at the fancy soda vending machine, so good. I, you know, 
the, the, the ones where you have the touch screen, I remember when this first came out. I remember I would go to Noodles and Company like every fucking day because they had it. Oh my god. Do you know where to try headphones near Seattle? No idea. I just usually YOLO order headphones. I've had these for six or seven years now, so these are relatively old. I actually just got a new pair of headphones, which are coming soon uh, to... I don't want to say replace these because these still have a place. These are what I'll use to listen to music. Um, but I got another pair of headphones coming for streaming. So I also have... Uh, I have DT770s. And these are just fucking perfect. These headphones, you just can't really get better. The sound quality is 98% of the way there to a much more expensive headphone. These are pretty cheap. They're like 100 40 or like maybe 180 or something like that maybe even cheaper maybe 120 they're super fucking light they're really durable I, I like so i got i got the open ear pair of these for streaming because i hate i hate having closed ears when i'm streaming because then i talk really loud these are way too heavy these weigh over a pound for you metric folks these are like half a kilo these are like 0.75 kilos fucking super heavy hurts my head the headband broke so i have a sock on here and it just hurts but yeah dt 770s you can't really get better i have two pair i have a uh, 250 ohm for actually at my computer and then i have the 80 or 32 ohms for my phone which i use when i'm traveling hell yeah okay so this code should work this will no longer this will no longer time out because we're not in an exception in this case if I get rid of the deadlock detection. We're going to get rid of the deadlock detection and then we'll run this code. And this should just halt forever because we're not in an exception, which means the timeout code is not going to run. What are you getting to stream with? It's the open ear uh, version of the DT770s. I forget what they're called. They're not the 770s. They are the... It's the it's the same um, uh, it's the same uh, same brand same uh, whatever they're they're like the I don't know like eight something pros or eight ten pro whatever they are they're they're basically the same so it, it's the same headphone uh, they're super light but they're open ear so apparently it sounds a little bit better but I I think that's true in any case closed ear headphones typically don't sound nearly as good as open ear like these these sound phenomenal these are incredibly nice headphones uh i'll probably actually send these to someone on etsy to have someone custom make like a cool unique but well padded headband because these are very heavy and it does hurt after after enough time okay so now that we've figured out kind of how we want to handle the locks and we've changed that um cargo run uh We'll commit this, git commit am, remove the concept of try locks, git push. Okay, git diff head one. I don't think there are that many changes. Okay, just a bunch of comment changes. Okay, not bad. That's not a big deal. Okay, so now that we have the lock system up and running, the exceptions are now handled with a timeout, which panics. We should be able to panic from any situation. Even the most hostile environment, we should be able to cause a panic, which means that in an exception, in an interrupt, in an exception, in an exception, in an exception, we can panic and print a message to let the user know what happened. Um, think I'd like to try some open back cans next. Um, been using the, the Fostex TH610. I've never tried them out. Yeah. I, I don't I don't know I just can't stand closed ear I think a lot of non like a lot of people who who aren't snooty I don't want to say audiophile because I would not want to classify classify myself as an audiophile but a lot of people love the Beats sort of headphones and they don't like them because of the sound quality they like them because they amplify the bass by like 20 dB that's the secret to any affordable headphone that's like luxury affordable, so like 80 to 200 bucks, which in the uh, like audiophile community is a cheap pair of headphones, 
Typically, they just amplify the fuck out of bass. People put them on. They put them on a, a song, and they're like, holy shit, I can feel the bass through these. And they're like, wow, these headphones are really good. Like, oh, wow. So these HE500s I got because they're pretty much the most flat headphones you can get. That, like, when I bought these, I bought these because I looked at the graphs, where people would literally drive these headphones with known signals. They'd sweep the frequency curve. They'd show the frequency response, and it's flat. That means it doesn't sound good to a lot of people because it's missing a lot of the bass. But the bass wasn't there from the studio. And I, that's, what, that's what I want, right? If you want bass, get IEMs. Yeah, I'm actually thinking. I, I bought a pair of IEMs, uh, uh, like a decent pair of, of Sure IEMs. They don't fit perfectly. I have weird ears. So I think I'm going to get uh, some custom-made IEMs. Um, and I'm going to get those for talking uh, when I'm giving talks at presentations such that I can have feedback. Um, uh, the last talk I gave at Recon, I could hear my voice on like a 50 milli or 100 milli uh, delay. And I basically was stuttering the whole time because I just like there's a website that lets you try that of like having a delay and hearing your own voice. It's very difficult to talk if you hear your own voice. So... Um, if you want help with custom in-ear monitors, what do you do? You just, is it the same as like a, a mouth guard where you like get something that's moldable and you like put it in there and it like settle, it sets after some point? Yeah, that voice jammer effect is brutal, man. You want headphones that can catch the lows, mids, and highs like you explained? Boosting dB, uh, a bass ruins the audio quality. See, my view is I just want neutral headphones and then if I want bass reduced or boosted, I can do it in software. <laughs> but you can't really go the other way around. Uh, like Technically, you could have a perfect frequency response graph, and then you can subtract that out of your headphones to make them neutral. Uh, but it's a lot easier to adjust from neutral than to go from something skewed to neutral. Because you, you don't know what that baseline is. No pun intended. <laughs> OK. Noise. So, what are we going to do here? Um, we got a couple things we want to do. We want to implement a TFTP client. I want to re-implement my... Um, we're going to re-implement the... Uh, memory mapped file thing. I think we're going to do that. You make an impression, go to an audiologist for 50 bucks, make a negative out of agar, put it in UV curable resin, Cure the shell, put it in. Interesting. And, I, and they just sit really well. Are they harder or are they soft? I guess maybe you can pick. Um, hell yeah. I also want to get some um, nice speakers as well. My speakers suck. I just have like the standard uh, Logitech $150 speaker set, like the two plus one setup. Um, I want to get speakers in every corner of my room because when I when I'm on my workstation over there, which you can't see because it's off screen, but when I'm on my workstation, um, I only hear it in one ear and it fucking drives me nuts. So I want to make sure that I flood fill this room with audio such that at any location and any angle of my head sounds good. I I don't like turning my head and the music sounding differently. Got Yamaha HSAs from Logitech. Amazing. So, oh, switched over. Oh, yeah. So I was looking at HS8s. Um, actually, this is exactly what I was planning to buy. Um, I, was, I was about to pull the trigger. I literally had them in my checkout cart at Guitar Center. Um, but yeah, they're, they're just the 8-inch Yamahas, right? So... What I'd probably do is I'd probably set up four of them and then a, a, a woofer. So I'd probably put one in each corner of my office <laughs> up and raised up so it would just flood the whole room. I wouldn't really get a, uh, I wouldn't really get a sensation of left versus right. But if I want that sensation, I could just turn off the two in the back and like, you know, I, I can change it based on where I'm sitting that day. They're rather large. I uh, got a great deal from Guitar Center. I don't really care about the size. I'm going to... I'll install them into the um, 
I'll make like a permanent fixture. Get a, a holder that mounts on the wall. And I don't know. Maybe I would. Uh, maybe I'd have them painted or something if they're if they don't look good. Um, I'm sure they have different colors for the drivers that you can pick. Last on first off when booting shutting down and uh, in what context? Oh, so you don't get like the pops or something. So you don't get like loud, yeah. Yep, I know that trick. <laughs> I know that trick. <laughs> yeah. So I actually have a mixer that I use for all of my audio stuff here. Uh, not for my voice, but uh, well, technically I have another mixer for my voice, but uh, for all my music and games and stuff, so I can have my games on a different audio from my um, music, and then I can like turn games up and down, which is really nice. Holy shit! Holy holy shit, man! Prime! Hell yeah! That's a big ass raid. How's it going? How is your stream? Guy Ross, Saki Lo, Incy Mage, Code Phobia, how's it going? Welcome to the party stream. We're we're writing some OSs. Actually we've just been talking with chat for a while. So we can we can answer questions. Oh, look at those fucking emotes. Oh my god. Oh, this is so good! <laughs> What's up, Ujtua? Ujtua? Is that how you pronounce your name? Hell yeah, Piero Alver Alvarado95. Oh my god, there's so many people here. <laughs> I really need to make some emotes. God damn it. I submitted my partner request uh, like three days ago. They haven't gotten back to me yet. Um, I did... Um, I did accidentally, like, when I clicked, uh, send, I noticed that I did have it set for the gaming category. I hope that they can accommodate the, the error that I made there, and they can see that clearly this isn't a gaming channel, and they won't take that literally. Um, but who knows, if that goes into a big, big machine, maybe I'll get rejected and I have to try it again. Um, but, <laughs> my description didn't say anything about gaming, so I, I hope they would value that over the, some metadata. This is an intense game. This is the game of Rust, and... Oh, fuck, that's actually a game. <laughs> Rust is actually a game. <laughs> okay, okay. I see how it is. We have had people stop by the stream a couple times who are like, is this the game Rust? Are you writing cheats for the game Rust? I'm like, mm, oh, no. Oh, no, you're missing out. Rust is a super fun game too. What is it? Is it open world? I feel like it looks open world, but I, I don't know if it is or not. All right, let's go. Uh, let's go give people some fun stuff. We're gonna go implement uh, network backed files. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna make it possible. We implemented this last stream, but in a test, and we threw all the code away. Um, but what we're gonna do is we're going to make it possible for us in our kernel. So we're writing an operating system here. If you're if, if you're new to the stream, we're writing an operating system here that is all in Rust. You can get the code. It's all on GitHub under this project. Um, but we're at the stage where we have a working UDP stack. We added a memory manager. We have a virtual memory manager. Uh, we added a test hypervisor in one of the branches. Um, and now we're kind of working on some network utilities. The goal is that tomorrow I would like to be running things in VMs. So I'd like to get applications running inside of uh, virtual machines uh, using VTX on, on Intel. And so what I'm trying to do is get everything set up for that point. Now I know that historically I have really liked network mapped files. And what that allows me to do is it allows me to map, uh, literally reserve uh, virtual memory and then when I get page faults on that memory, I will make a UDP request out. A server will send a packet back containing the data for that page. I'll fill in the page and then resume execution. And that means that you can do a, a memory mapping of a 150 gig file. And as long as you're sparsely using it, you'll only use the pieces that you use on a 4K granularity. And I use this to boot uh, operating systems in my virtual machines. So I've historically used this in other kernels I've written, and it allows me to have a like 
let's say 16 gigabyte Windows VM snapshot. And it allows me to boot into that VM instantaneously. And when I say instantaneously, I mean under 200 milliseconds from when my operating system boots, I will launch a VM and I'll be executing Windows instructions in that context. Now, the reason for that is that computers don't use memory typically very quickly. So like a Windows VM will maybe use, uh, like memory accesses are typically logarithmic. The, the more memory you use, the harder it is to use the unique memory that is left in the system. So on something like Windows, you'll maybe use a couple megs in the first few milliseconds, which is basically instant to download. And then after that point, it'll be maybe a, a couple K every second. And then after that, it's, you know, it, it diminishing returns on the memory that's pulled in. Now, we do fuzzing over here. We do security research over here. And um, so effectively, uh, our goal will be to create many, many, many VMs and reset them quickly. And when I say reset a VM quickly, I don't mean like click the go to snapshot and it takes two seconds. I'm talking literally millions of times per second per core. So on a like 100 core machine, we're gonna be pushing like hundreds of millions of VM resets per second on the machine. So that's what we're kind of gearing up to do. We wanna make sure that we only download the parts of the VMs that are actually used because when we're fuzzing something, we might end up running an application for 10 milliseconds. And in that 10 milliseconds, it's not using the 16 gigs of physical memory in the snapshot. It's using maybe, maybe 500K. So that makes sure that we only download the 500K that's actually used uh, by the application or OS. So yeah, that's effectively uh, what we do here, uh, that's kind of the goal. So we're working on the network mapped stuff. We're working on a couple services. Probably gonna write a TFTP client today. Uh, we just kind of changed up how we do the lock infrastructure in our kernel. And then we're gonna switch over. Um, we're probably gonna start with the memory mapped uh, network stuff because it's cool, super fun. Um, but yeah, nice. Do you automate this process with a script? What do you mean by automate the process with a script? What process? Uh, way beyond my IQ. Feel free to ask questions. We, we can always ask questions. Um, we, we've, had, we've had chatters cause many, many, many delays <laughs> before. We've, we've gone on, on four-hour tangents where we write test code to uh, demonstrate things. This, this is not a scheduled stream. We don't do scheduled things. We don't have deadlines. We do whatever the fuck we want here. We have fun. We learn. And we enjoy what we do. Um, uh, do you automate this, uh, booting the snapshots in 300 milli? So that would be based on like me requesting that. So I have a concept of a soft reboot in my kernel. Uh, currently it won't work because we hijacked the network card with our networking stack. But if I get rid of the networking stack, which I can do by, uh, disabling PCI right now, um, I can send a shift Z over serial and it will soft reboot. And that's the reboot, right? That flash, that flicker, that probably barely shows up. I'm hitting shift Z and it reboots. And that's basically how I recover from panics. That's how I put a new kernel in place. It's how I do rapid development on hardware. Um, currently, I think our boot times are, what did we benchmark them to last time? Like days ago in chat, convinced you to implement the UDP checksums, you fuckers. <laughs> Um, what we can do is, um, yeah, I'm going to comment this stuff out and what we're going to do, we'll just halt on all the cores and we'll get to see what our boot time is in our OS. Uh, so let's see. Um, that's the first boot and this is the second boot. So subsequent boots are faster. Our current boot time is, um, uh, 0.3 milliseconds. <laughs> so it's 300 microseconds to boot our OS right now. And that's to bring four cores online in a VM. Uh, I'm pretty happy with that. <laughs> Boop. <laughs> so yeah, very quick boot times. What have you been doing driver uh, for driver support? We we su uh, we support Intel network cards, and that's it. <laughs> that's the only thing I ever plan to support for drivers. Nothing more, nothing less. We have a we have a serial port driver. And we have a network card driver for Intel NICs. It's probably all we're ever going to support. <laughs> I, 
I have no interest in adding more, and I will not accept PRs for more drivers than that. Um, I will accept PRs to widen the Intel NIC support, given that it's done in a generic way, but I will not, well, I probably won't accept those PRs. I probably won't accept any PRs. Fork, fork can do whatever you want if you need. <laughs> um, this OS is used to fuzz to find security bugs. Yep, absolutely. Um, if it's messing around with uh, VMs, is there a whitelist option for IDS and IPS for network admins? Um, uh, I, I don't have any plans for that. What, what, what do you mean? Like for the network-based IES? Um, wouldn't that be something you would manage on your own IDS? I don't, I don't, I don't understand how net admin stuff works. I see, uh, uh, could you do some of the same things? Um, some Firecracker VMs, they have rather fast boot times. Um, I've never used Firecracker VMs. I'm not familiar with them at all. So I don't, I don't know. I don't know what they are. I don't know their performance constraints. I don't know their room for improvement. So sorry about that. All right. Firecracker micro VM. I see. Interesting. Huh. Minimal overhead execution container and workload. Uh, okay. So they use KVM. Uh, so I would say if it uses KVM, it's, it probably can't boot very quickly. Um, I'm sure it's fast, right? I'm sure it's fast, but KVM itself is relatively slow. So you would kind of bottleneck on that. And anything where you do a syscall is just going to be super slow. So that's what we avoid here. We're going to avoid all the syscalls, all the operating system overhead, all the scheduling overhead, uh, all the preemption that can get in the way and kind of cause performance to tank. So, yeah. All right, so we're going to go into our interrupt handlers. Um, we're going to go into kernel source interrupts. And what we're going to do is we're going to make a page fault handler. And we implemented this yesterday, but the code that I wrote was very quick. It was mainly to determine what I would need. Um, now that I know what I need, we changed the lock structure, which was the biggest issue in that architecture. Um, and now we're going to go through and we're just going to, we're just going to re-implement it, but cleanly documented in a nice way. So we're going to say static. Um, Okay, so we're gonna do static. Um, we're gonna do like page fault handler. And we'll do, uh, this is gonna be a lock cell around a vector. And this means we can't page fault in a page fault, but I don't know, is that something I wanna support? I know I needed page faults and page faults in my other kernel, and that was, um, I'm trying to think if I need that in this one, and I, I think since Rust allows me to kind of wrap things better than C did, I think I can actually use Rust to avoid that, where I will only ever page fault one level deep. So I think I'm fine here. This is really cool, not something I've ever thought about before. Hell yeah. Yeah, we do some pretty unique things here. Uh, we stream at random times, doing random stuff, but um, I write a lot of code for myself. Uh, and a lot of this is based on uh, previous research I've done. So this is, this is basically my like fifth or sixth kernel and hypervisor that do these same things. Um, and thus, I have pretty strong ideas of exactly what I want to do, how things historically have failed and not worked. Um, obviously, the goal of this rewrite is A, to entertain y'all, B, to open source it, uh, C, to teach people things, and D, uh, to fix things that were too uh, large of uh, improvements, things that would be harder to fix in the existing infrastructure that I have than to just rewrite the whole kernel. Um, so that's what we're doing. We're doing a whole rewrite. Uh, it's been about two years, maybe a year since I wrote my last kernel in Rust. Actually, it's been like six months, but my last large kernel in Rust has been about two years. 
Um, and I've learned a lot since then, and Rust has changed a lot since then. There are, there are features that are, are cleaner to use. There are ways to make the language look better than before. There are things that no longer need to be on safe and vice versa. Um, so we're kind of using some of the modern semantics that we've learned and improved in our Rust, uh, and we're going to start using those in, in this kernel. So yeah. All right. So we're going to say this is a list of all registered page fault handlers on the system. And that's pretty straightforward. And this is going to be a, uh, we're going to have an arc dyn dispatch, dynamic dispatch of a page fault handler. So basically, this is going to have a list of objects that implement the page fault handler trait. And we'll say this starts out as a lock cell new of a vec new. Okay, so an empty vector, and we just gotta pull some things into the scope. So we'll grab use lock cell, lock cell, use alloc sync arc. Okay, 26, page fault handler not found in the scope, of course not. Um, we have a need for speed here, no noise, no problems, all in the name of find, uh, finding hardware doing undocumented things, absolutely. So someone I think asked what the point of this was, I think. Yeah, this OS is for what? What is this supposed to run? So this OS is designed for fuzzing, which if you're not familiar, fuzzing is the concept of uh, rapidly uh, mutating inputs and creating inputs for applications and then having the application to handle those inputs, whether that's sending random packets at a network service or a client or having a program parse a file that's been corrupted or whatever, the goal is to look for bugs. Specifically, I look for security bugs. I'm looking for things called O days or zero days. Uh, these are bugs that have not been found and are security uh, critical, which typically means that they're exploitable. Meaning that if I find an ODE in a network service that handles a packet incorrectly, um, when I say I found an ODE in it, that typically means I found a mechanism that allows me to get control of the server without the server giving me access to it. Um, that's effectively what we do here is we write tools to find bugs. Uh, so the goal is to have very lightweight virtual machines that allow us to isolate and quickly reset uh, these components under test. Uh, obviously, we'll be fuzzing operating systems and things that panic, and we don't want to have a one-minute reboot time every time a panic occurs. Um, so what we do is we put them in a VM, and we handle the panic, and we reset the VM differentially by restoring only the things that have changed during that fuzz case back to the original state. And that allows us to reset VMs millions of times per second on a single core. So if we end up having something blue screening a million times a second, it doesn't matter because we can handle that. Um, we don't pay the one minute shutdown reboot loop of if you were to do that on real hardware. Second of all, we get determinism because we are the VM. We control everything that that hardware does. We can control everything that the guest sees and observes. We can change all the timers to be deterministic. That means that any bug that ever occurs in the guest, we can find again. And we can, with the same input, every single time, it'll crash in the exact same way. And that means that we can pass that on to a developer or a researcher to then single step through and root cause the bug. Uh, so that's a, a very common uh, technique. Finally, um, we're also gonna use this for CPU research. So we're gonna use this to search for bugs like Spectre and Meltdown. Um, if you haven't heard of Spectre and Meltdown, I, I hazard you should go uh, check them out. They're pretty interesting uh, topics, but effectively, uh, they are bugs in uh, Intel's implementation and AMD's implementation of some microarchitectural things that allows you to leak data on the processor regardless of the operating system that is in place. Um, and the goal is to find more bugs like that because those are pretty interesting bugs. Um, they have pretty high bounties. Um, so yeah, yeah, I think they, they, they're some of the highest bounties right now. Um, so anyways... Not that I can get a bounty from them, so not that it matters. Um, how did you start doing binary exploitation professionally? Um, I I was doing a CTF, uh, Capture the Flag events, which, which are like hacking competitions effectively, if you're not familiar with CTFs. Um, 
and I was just in the IRC channel and I was talking with people and someone asked if I wanted to go get an interview. And so I went and I got an interview and I got a job. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> it, it, it really was a, like a one week process. <laughs> um, let's see. Can't get a bounty due to conflict of interest. Um, like just due to weird agreements. Yeah, kind of. It, it's kind of fucky, but yeah. I, I don't actually technically know the reason why. I do think I should legally be eligible for a con uh, for a bounty. Um, however, I think it's just a, a matter of politics and trying to save face and look good for other companies that you work with and whatever. Um, what do you think about Christopher Domus? I don't really know anything about him. I've, I've heard his name. Um, but yeah, I'm not too familiar with them. All about connections. Yeah, I mean, it really is. It's it's about being passionate and connections. But yeah, connections really, really do run the world. Uh, the author of Mufuskator. Okay, yeah, then I do know his stuff. Um, I, I think it's pretty neat. Uh, I mean, he also did, um, he also did Sansifter, right? If I'm not mistaken. Uh, don't you need to provide like a whole libc and system libs uh, and run uh, to run thing to run an app on your OS? No. So we'll this will be able to run an entire operating system under it. So with this, we'll be able to just run whatever we want. We'll have Windows booted under here, and we'll just be able to run applications in Windows inside of this. So that just allows us to handle that for us. Could it Cantor Dust too? I'm not. I don't think I'm familiar with Cantor Dust. Do you fuzz the NT kernel? I, I've, I've fuzzed the NT kernel a, a fair amount, but it's not... Uh, I mean, technically right now I am doing NT kernel fuzzing. Um, so yes, yes, I do fuzz the NT kernel. So it's more like a hypervisor than an OS. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is, this is not really an OS, it's a hypervisor. But it's a framework for me to build my hypervisor, which is a playground, right? This, this is just a playground for me to experiment uh, with research, right? This is, a, this is a place where I implement things that are new to me. I implement new CPU features, new coverage mechanisms, new virtual ma machine technologies, uh, new architecture support, new weird extensions on processors that I think could maybe make fuzzing better. Um, so yeah, that's absolutely uh, what I'll be doing here. Hell yeah. Dude, it really is. I was looking for a job for an entire year. No, uh, no company would... Even look at me, look twice at my resume. Ended up getting a recommendation for someone in a company. Got hired, and multiple coworkers are shocked I didn't get a job earlier with my knowledge. Yeah, so recommendations are pretty huge. Um, kind of knowing the in group, right? Like I know the security community in the world now, so that's just a thing, which is weird. It's really fucking weird, but it's a thing now. Um, how do you fuzz it? Like, uh, with like AFL or more specific tools? I only use specific tools. I don't use any off the shelf tools when I'm fuzzing. Uh, I've never really used AFL to be honest. Um, I don't think AFL is that good. There's my hot take. Um, I think AFL scales horizontally very well, but it's a, a terrible tool for going deep. Uh, is your employer Microsoft or Amazon? Didn't find her on Twitter. I'm employed at Microsoft right now. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna make a trait for page fault handler and we'll say traits pub traits page fault handler and this is um, and this is uh, implemented for uh, structures which may be registered as page fault handlers. These uh, these handlers can be used to hook page faults and uh, and potentially lazily map in pages when needed. John e EGQ, thank you so much for the Twitch Prime. Hell yeah. Um, let's do uh, function page faults. This will take a virtual address and we'll say a vert adder. I don't think we have in the scope, and then we'll have a boolean of handled. And this is uh, invoked when a page fault occurs with the with 
the contents of uh, CR2, the faulting address. Um, if the fault was handled, this should return true, and thus execution will return back to where the exception originally occurred. And then we'll do unsafe, eh, just to make the user know they understand what they're getting into. And then we have to implement, uh, we have to give a trait on our lock cell, and we have to say, um, God damn it. It's not interrupt state, lock interrupts. I always, I always forget what I call that. Gotten so much better at it though. Uh, he is page fault vert adder. And let's organize these a bit. We'll just go boop, boop. Oh, you know what? Those were organized. Do you have an LSE? I do. Yep. All right. Lock interrupts. We get lock interrupts from use create um, core locals. Lock interrupts. Like for legal reasons? Uh, no, I just have it for my own business, mainly for tax reasons. Um, it's mainly so I can track my uh, business assets and gains and losses uh, separately. Hey, Buff Siegel, I think you're missing some closing brackets on there. <laughs> oh, actually, you're not. Are you? One. Damn it, you're not. Never mind. You got it. You got it. I was about to say it's not as it's not as bad as you made it look. Uh, page fault. Um, yeah, it's not page fault. It's page table. Do you, do you use uh, software for your tax stuff or a CPA? Uh, I use a CPA. I've got a complex enough tax shit to figure out. Quite frankly, I don't want to do it half the time. Um, page fault handler can't be made into an object. That needs to take a self. In fact, that can take, uh, no, it'll take a self. Because we're passing it by an arc. Unless I want to pass it by a box. We might do this by a box so we can give you mute. I think this is just better in every way. Um, I think we had some hacky reasons why we did that yesterday. We'll see if we run into those problems again. I kind of forgot what the problems were of why we wanted to use an arc instead of a box. But I think it was because we were doing a test and we were being lazy. Do you have to pay estimated taxes every quarter? Yes, I do. Um, I mean, it, only when the business is running, um, but yes. So uh, this year, this year I'm gonna have business taxes I need to figure out because I've got expenses and income. Do you have employees other than yourself? Nope, I do not. Um. All right. Uh, here we're gonna go. Now we're, I guess we just implement a page fault handler. Get this working. If you could add a new instruction to the x86 ISA, what would it be? Um, uh, can it be a feature? Does it have to be a single? In like, what's a single instruction? What what a, what is a single instruction? Does it have to be like? Implemented in, uh, does it have to decode directly to UOPS or can it be microcode? Because if it can be microcode, okay, I'll oh, feature. Um, I would, uh, I would completely re-implement the way that uh, XCD6 does uh, um, virtual machines, and I'd have the entire virtual machine state handled by the uh, hardware, such that when you do a context switch, it c switches literally everything that can possibly be observed by the guest, rather than this current state where you switch into a VM and depending on if you set everything up correctly or not, or if a new feature came out on your CPU that you exposed random shit into the guest. That would be the feature I would like. I would like for x86 to have real uh, virtual machines. I really hate how there are these pseudo virtual machines where like, 
the only thing tracked for you are some like MSRs, some CR registers, some debug registers, RSP, RIP, and that's about it. Literally everything else you have to manage yourself, uh, which leaves a lot of room for mistakes. It also means that you can't really atomically switch uh, from guest to guest, and it also means the isolation uh, is very, very, very weak. Um, you can't basically have the uh, hypervisor not be aware of it. So yeah, I would make a stronger, stronger VMs. Basically, an atomic, an atomic context which is the all processor state that is observable, such that it is impossible to observe anything different uh, based on changing memory in the hypervisor. Like the hypervisor doesn't have a say in that shit. That's how I feel it should be. For the register state and stuff. It's it's starting to get there where you just like X save and you store all the GPRs, but you still need to manage some of the like CPU ID stuff yourself. I, I really don't like it. I think it's a really dangerous model and it's vulnerable to a lot of attacks and and mistakes and flaws and implementation weaknesses and developer pains. Um, do you see a benefit to using Rust outside of low-level system style programming, uh, like single tenant web applications running at most in a single thread versus something more purpose-built for that type of work? Uh, I, yeah, I don't see a reason to use Rust in that context. Quite frankly, I don't know why Rust exists other than to please me. Um, I, I don't, I don't understand why Rust is like the most popular language on Stack Overflow because 95% of the users would be better suited by Go or better suited by insert whatever high level language here. Um, that's my view. I love it. I'm happy it exists. I'd be very sad if it stopped existing or something like it stopped existing. Uh, but quite frankly, everyone's using it to make fucking web apps. <laughs> There, there are people using it for systems devs, but it's uh, the language. There's a lot of investment in this language for the amount of people who use it, um, and that's just because it became a hype language for kind of no reason, uh, other than it's just kind of hip. Going is fantastic for infrastructure tooling. Yeah, just use Go instead of Node.js. I mean, Node.js is just trash, right? Node.js is how you turn a uh, $50,000 a year web developer into an $80,000 a year back-end developer without paying them more money. Um, surely it's better to use Rust than JS, though? I mean, look, I'm never going to write Go because I see no use for Go in anything that I ever do, including if I'm writing a web app, I'm going to do it in Rust. Sorry. I have no I have no interest in other languages at this point. Um but that's because I am willing to spend the time and the effort and the uh, engineering to make it work in Rust because I know that the end result in Rust will likely be better than the end result in anything else performance-wise. And that's all I care about. Um, web app and Rust need to grow out that neck beard. I don't do web app dev, so I'm kind of the opposite. <laughs> I'm saying if I were to do that, and I'm, I probably have a gun pointed to my head if that's happening. Um, that's what all the people who say you don't need Rust are saying. Uh, all languages have their place. Yeah, I agree. Time and place for every tool. JavaScript is perfectly fine in the browser. <laughs> Literally anything else is better outside the browser. I mean, JavaScript is trash in the browser too. JavaScript is just uh, an absolute garbage language in general. Um... There's no alternative, so you can't not use JavaScript, but it's a fucking trash language. So bad. Um, <laughs> WebAssembly FTW. How so? Is that referring to JavaScript being bad? Um, the language has... Uh, it, First of all, the language is like way too reliant on the environment. If you don't have a DOM, you like JavaScript kind of goes out the window. Obviously, you have like the Node environment, but Node isn't isn't JavaScript, right? I'm talking about JavaScript as a language doesn't do shit. 
Uh, it has really bad uh, operators for almost everything. It has no way of dealing with uh, integers. You can't deal with unsigns unless you do the uh, triple shift by zero. Uh, comparisons are really fucked up. Um, there are no types on any of the variables, so everything gets really confusing. It's really hard to optimize for without type systems. Uh, it doesn't have the concept of mutability or immutability, so it's really hard to optimize in that regard as well. Um, all in all, it's just, it's just a shitty language to architect anything in. Uh, I would compare it to basically Python, where like it's great if you're writing 100 lines of it, uh, and it sucks if you're writing anything more. It's pretty much impossible to ever... If you go and read someone else's uh, JavaScript code, it's pretty much impossible to know what they did. Same thing with Python. If you go read someone's code, you have a function that takes eight arguments. You have no idea what those arguments are. They could be ints, they could be dictionaries, they could be lists, they could be sockets. You have no fucking idea. So if the developer didn't document it, and they didn't because they're a Python or JavaScript developer, no offense, um, you have no idea what the fuck the code did. So then you just end up building shit on top of shit that kind of works, and then you get this whole ecosystem where everyone pulls in a million packages to do every basic thing because no one knows what the fuck anything actually does at the end of the day. So they use the tool that kind of works and the library that, like, maybe kind of works, and then they build on top of that, and then someone pulls in that library, and at the end of the day, you have a thousand node dependencies for something that printell a world to a fucking website. <laughs> like... That's my view. Doesn't mean it doesn't have a place. <laughs> I'm just saying this is a trash language. People like trash languages. Python and JavaScript exist for a reason. It's because they're easy to fucking write. It means it costs less to hire developers. It makes it's less time to train people. It takes less time to develop websites. No one cares about performance. So at the end of the day, of course it should exist, right? It's what people want. I don't want it because it hurts performance. It makes my computer that is now a hundred times more powerful than the computer that I had 15 years ago just as slow, if not slower, at loading web pages because everything goes through 50 fucking redirects and 20 domains have to be queried on every website because they have a different dependency for every single function that they include in their JavaScript. It's just, it's just laziness, really. Like, sh surely you can write comments and document all your JavaScript in a way that it's readable and you type it with commenting what the fuck it's supposed to do. Um, but JavaScript, like, here, here's the, here's the catch-22 with, with languages that don't have types. Languages that don't have types exist for one fucking reason, and that is speed of development and ease of use. Now, what's interesting is that those languages are very unreadable because you don't have types, which means they rely on comments to understand what's going on. Now, the problem is, the reason the language exists, which is speed of dev, whatever I just said before, kind of directly conflicts with the concept of commenting and documenting what the fuck your code does. <laughs> so you get this environment that promotes rapidly churning out code, but at the same time in a language that has no way of interpreting things unless you're very thorough with what you did. With, with what you did. So, obviously you can write good code in any language if you put the effort and time into it. I just don't think that people should be allowed to be lazy to that extent. I think people should be at least forced to do types. I'm sorry. <laughs> people shouldn't get that fucking pass. It's not fair. It's not fair to people who need to manage that code. Security in JavaScript is very hard to uh, achieve. Prototype pollution. I'm not familiar too much with the job, uh, JavaScript security. Can't really speak to that. I can speak to the security side on a browser and that it's literally going to be impossible to ever write a JavaScript engine that doesn't have fuck tons of bugs. You have like Blink and WebKit that are just full of infinite bugs and you can just go get whatever bug you want, whatever time to get execution in someone's browser because it's just way too complex. It's way too complex and way too loose. And when things are loose, uh, it's very hard to represent loose things in C++ unless you just willy-nilly take locks, release locks, uh, assume things are initialized and not initialized and free things whenever they go out of scope. And now you have things uh, like use after freeze all over the place. But yeah, to me, type systems that do dynamic typing are also weak type systems. Um, 
even if there's no type pruning. Uh, so I actually consider Python weakly typed. Oh yeah, Python is weakly typed in my opinion. Like Python, everything's a dictionary in Python. I, I would consider that uh, to be, uh, I consider that to be a, a weakly typed or un I actually consider Python to be an untyped language to be honest. Um, it's just dictionaries with strings representing what they hold. Like, I don't think that's a type. Different methods, arguably, on different things. Um, what were you into before Rust arrived? ANSI C, that's about it. So I basically only wrote ANSI C code. Um, yes, developer still understand floats, and that's just the start. I mean, the whole concept of languages where floats are interchangeable uh, is really gross to me. So like C, C++, pretty much, pretty much every fucking language other than Rust, where you can interchange floats with ints. I really don't like that at all. Python's default type is any. Yeah, well, Python's default type is uh, uh, mutex any. <laughs> this may sound rude, but don't take this the wrong way. Did you go to college? No, I did not. All right. I guess, actually, the default type in Python is not mutex any because that would imply that the lock would be per variable and not a global lock. <laughs> so it's really a uh, static uh, lock cell uh, hash map variable name paren scope into the variable. <laughs> That's, that's that's basically fucking the gill. <laughs> yeah, fuck the gill. <laughs> uh, well, dude, I have to say, you know, more than a lot of people that did go there. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, it's it's strange, but my my passion guides me, right? And it turns out you learn a lot. You learn a lot when you have a, a very strong passion for things. Which is awesome. I wish I wish everyone could have the same feeling about their work as I do about my work. I think it's unfair that I get that. It's not. It's kind of fucked up. But I got it. So fuck you guys. <laughs> How do you feel about unikernel? I don't like unikernels. I think microkernels are the correct architecture. In fact, I don't think kernels should really do anything other than spin up VMs. Uh, kernel should be like 5,000 lines of code that's capable of making the architecture specific virtual machine and everything should be done in virtual machines separately. That is my view, which is kind of the cubes model, but a little bit more aggressive than cubes. You're a Firecracker fan? Uh, someone brought that up earlier. I'm not familiar with Firecracker. Firecracker is based on KVM, so I would say no, because KVM is a piece of shit. Um, and it's based on Linux, which Linux is a piece of shit. I'm a Linux user. I'm not talking about that these things are not actually good and valuable pieces of software. I'm talking about whether or not they could be better. And the answer is yes, they're pretty bad at the end of the day. Uh, Linux and KVM are very, very, very hacky. Um, and they will basically continually have bugs until they disappear. Do you think SE Linux is a piece of shit? Um, I think SE Linux is designed in a very convoluted way, but I think the goals of it are really good. <laughs> I think the like whole concept of the like uh, groups and policies being some arbitrary binary format that varies from system to system, and when you're on like different phones or devices, every time it's a different fucking binary encoding, so you have no way to determine what it is except for consulting the kernel, what the permissions of things are. Um, yeah, it's a little fucking weird. Arch success, right? I actually used to be a big Arch user way back in the day. But yeah, when I say Linux is shit, I don't actually mean Linux is shit. I mean that Linux is um, uh, very bad in the realm of OS design with modern takes and, and designs. Um, but it exists because it's legacy. Sorry, Linux is the new Windows. It exists because it's legacy. BSD, I love BSD. I love FreeBSD. FreeBSD is uh, FreeBSD is probably my favorite uh, OS. In fact, I really like OpenBSD, but I I think um, FreeBSD is just a, a smidge better. That being said, FreeBSD is is worse code. OpenBSD is some of the best um, 
OpenBSD is some of the best code out there, best C code out there, um, to the limits of what C allows, which is typically uh, an exploitable bug every couple thousand lines of code. Um, so, still, pretty fucked. Um, but, the C code in OpenBSD is phenomenal. The documentation for both, free, both FreeBSD and OpenBSD are incredible. Uh, I love the FreeBSD community. I've always been a big fan. I like BSD over GPL. I don't like GPL at all. I'm pretty strongly against GPL. Um, I don't know. Those are my those are my hot takes. Been using Arch for like ten years now. Getting tempted to switch to something else. Just switch switch over to Debian stable, dude. Come over come over to where software was three years ago. It's great. It's great. I dual boot uh, Monaro and uh, Win 10. I've never actually used Monaro, if that's how you pronounce it. I uh, use one until it pisses me off and switch to the other until it pisses me off. I do that. I switch between my uh, operating systems pretty frequently. I blow them away pretty often. It's how I keep the, how I keep the disk gross, growth from uh, going cancerous. All right. So we're going to say handle NMIs. Handled is false. Draining UIs. Um, um, yeah, we'll do an exception handler as a special case after EOIs. No. We're going to do it here. Um, handle uh, page faults. If number is equal to uh, OXE, then it's a page fault. Then we're going to... Uh, for handler in uh, page fault handlers dot lock dot iter handler dot page fault and we're gonna say if the page fault handler was handled for the virtual address found at the um, faulting address which is in read cr2 then return, and this is uh, uh, invoke all page fault handlers. Oops. And then this is uh, if the page fault was handled, return um, back to execution. Oh, damn it, not first try. Uh, lock intermute. All right, Stallman is a quack. I mean, I think I think Stallman is a pretty good representation of of a lot of um, highly contributing developers. What's wrong with GPL? I don't like that it. Uh, um, I don't like that it forces. Uh, uh, open source on people. I would say that's not free, in my opinion, uh, to force uh, open sourcing of things onto people. It, it basically pollutes the ecosystem, and it really discourages open source development. Um, that being said, someone on the GPL side will say the opposite. They'll say that it does promote that. I would use a counterpoint in that uh, FreeBSD used the uh, GCC compiler and OpenBSD. We're forced to use the G GCC compiler from 2006. Because that's when they changed from GPL three or GPL two to GPL three. So those very open, very openly developed, publicly developed, publicly funded uh, projects no longer could use a, a modern GCC compiler, because GCC has decided that OpenBSD, uh, the fact that OpenBSD is open source and then allows people to take that source and then modify it without releasing that open source is not open source enough, uh, and thus fuck them, and they don't get access to GCC, and they're not able to use that tool. Um, yeah, I would say that's not very constructive to the open source community. You could argue that, yeah, if you had, uh, like, someone could theoretically take OpenBSD and modify it, and then sell it as their own kernel. Who fucking cares? If they make it better, and there's a market for it, cool. There's still a free version. If they end up making it better in, in this corporate, like, and sell it as a product, 
just implement the feature and then their competition doesn't exist. Or if the feature is sufficiently complex to implement, then there you go, that's why it costs money. <laughs> would Linux have been successful in terms of driver support without the GPL? Um, I would say they would actually be uh, more successful without the GPL. I think the GPL has basically uh, forced the companies who make drivers to basically do all or none um, for kernel drivers, and that basically means a lot of people pick the none option instead of the eh, kind of open. Um, I think it's I uh, yeah I I really don't think it it helps there. I don't know. FreeBSD supports pretty much everything that Linux does. The only thing that Linux has an advantage over BSD on is basically uh, proprietary drivers, which at that point have nothing to do with GPL. Like, nowadays with code signing, I don't really mind binary blobs too much. Um, I mean, I just don't get the whole concept of just everything needs to be free code. <laughs> Look, I'm I'm totally down for it when you're willing to contribute your stuff for free. But you you can't just have everything be free code. That's just not how that's just not how society works. If if you want to advocate for GPL, you shouldn't be advocating for GPL. You should be advocating for a completely different type of society. Because society, whether you like it or not. Society is fundamentally built around making money and working. So until you can change that construct, software is never going to be free. <laughs> it's just not. So, like, fighting for GPL is, is really just fighting for something in a system that fundamentally doesn't allow it to exist, right? So, like, I, I don't know. I think a lot of I think a lot of GPL is to make you make you feel good about yourself, right? It's to make you feel good like you're forcing everything to be open source. You're you're fighting the system. You're you're pushing it on to other people to open source things and and build and grow and expand on the community. When you're shitting on people like FreeBSD and OpenBSD for decades and you don't give a fuck. Clearly clearly you don't care about the open source community. You care about feeling like you're caring about the open source community. So, I don't know. It's, it's and I and I'm I'm totally open to counterpoints. I, I can totally recognize that people can be concerned about things getting stole stolen or repatented or all these things. But uh, ultimately, if you look at the contributions of BSD um, to the open source community versus the contributions of GPL to the open source community, I would say the BSDs beat it. Because they're more open, they're more free. People can adapt and use OpenBSD things, and OpenBSD and FreeBSD, or BSD licensed things, uh, don't require those things to be open source, which means they're more flexible. Linux can take things from FreeBSD and OpenBSD, but they can't go the other way around. Well, technically they can't because they box themselves in with GPL, but they technically are like, it, it's just more strict. It's a more strict license, in my, in my opinion, for freedom. But Stallman's version of freedom is not freedom of the developer, it's the freedom of the software. And that's where the different view is. BSD is open source because you want to do it, yeah. GPL is open source or else. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty fair. Um, okay, so that's running. Uh, kernel source net, net mapping.rs, okay. So we'll make a net map mapping project here, or module, and we'll go into kernel source net.rs. I don't know, but I, t I totally can understand why you want that, like, everything should be open source view. I just think you need to consider um, whether it's actually having the effect you intend it to have. Because I would, I would hazard the answer is no. It, it does not. Um... Okay, kernel source net. I'd also hazard that Linux is is effectively not an open source kernel. Uh, I mean, it's open source, uh, not a like community created kernel. It's it's corporations, right? We need to like we need to get over this like fake feeling of like Linux is some 
free range colonel that's just a bunch of neckbeards working in their basement. It's fucking large companies. It's Red Hat and Intel and AMD and every network driver, like all fighting over it to implement whatever they want for their features. And that's what you get. So like Intel comes in there and they're like, ah, you know what, we could, we could change this up a little bit to make our processor a little faster in this case and they fuck everyone else. They don't give a shit. What about Ubuntu then? I mean, I would say Ubuntu is, is actually one of the worst um, openness versions of uh, Linux because uh, it does allow uh, non-free things into the, um, into the code base. And it kind of relies on that environment and ecosystem. So, and Ubuntu is, is very, very much so a corporate company. And Torvalds screaming at all of them for being dumb. Yeah, I mean, Torvalds is, Torvalds is a Stallman, is a, a Theodore Rod, right? Had a checkbox for non-free. Um, I think by default, uh, Ubuntu does ship with some non-free things. Um... Or at least some, maybe not non-free, but maybe some uh, uh, proprietary drivers or something. Theodore Rod called me an asshole when I was 17. I was so proud. Yeah. I don't know. I actually, I, I don't know. I think I think a lot of these like top minds in a lot of computing, Theodore Rod, Linus, all these people, they're just they're just incapable of, of, of socially communicating ideas uh, without defaulting to odd behaviors um and that's fine there's there's like i don't want to say there's nothing wrong with that um in terms of they they should be able to just run off and be fuckwads to everyone um but it's understandable right i don't i don't think they're actively making those decisions um okay so net we're gonna pull in pub mod net mapping and we'll swing over to here and now we can start implementing a network mapping structure and this will be net mapping and this is a uh, a network backed yeah and what do I want the type to be here um, I gonna have that be a, a vector of bytes can I safely do that I I think I'll just do U8s. I think I'll only do U8s. Network backed uh, mapping of U8s, uh, which will be faulted in, which will be faulted in during reads, um, which will be faulted in upon access uh, per page. Okay, so we're going to have the base. This is going to be the virtual address of the network mapping, where we actually put it. This is the base address of the mapping. And then we'll do use page table for adder. Okay. Now we're going to do impl net mapping. And on net mapping, we're going to implement a... A new, I think, pub fn new size. This will give us the number of bytes. Actually, I think we'll just query that from the network. What do you think about whistle? I think whistle is amazing. I think whistle is just just the correct thing to do. Super good. Um, this is gonna return a self, and this is um create a network mapped view of I think we'll want to do handles so I can use strings yeah a network mapped view of file name and in this case file name is just a stir and this is going to have to query our server so what this is going to do is this is going to get access to a net device and so this will have a device net device uh, we'll just call this network. Um, and I think that's an arc. And this is the uh, a network device which we can use to send and receive 
packets to fulfill. Is it two L's or one L? Two L's. Fulfill the uh, network requests. All right, that's pretty obvious, but it's a good comment. Use um, create net net device. All right, so this returns a self. Currently, it does not net mapping. Um, we'll just have this return nothing while we figure out what we want to do. Then we're going to in here. We're going to do um, uh, let mapping is equal to net mapping, and we'll do this only on core zero, just so we um, can kind of filter how much we actually see a spew. Use net net mapping net mapping, and this net mapping new of foobar dot fin okay private structure perfect we can fix that done all right do you think the linux kernel is with us to stay or will it become legacy software i think it's kind of already legacy software um but i do think it's with us for a while but i i would say i would see like i would say software becomes legacy software once it becomes with us for a while if that makes sense like, that's kind of uh, that's kind of my view there. I think when, once you have wide scale adoption, that you're required to keep something down, uh, keep something around for a long enough time. At that stage, you've kind of, in my opinion, um, it's kind of legacy at that point because you have to you have to keep up with some standards. Um, and I think Linux has done a very bad job. Linux and um, GNU have done very bad jobs at not extending the um, kernel and libc, which means that unlike uh, OpenBSD, where basically the kernel can change whenever, but the open the libc stays the same, uh, kind of isn't the case because the libc is pretty dynamic in glibc, and a lot of the features that are used in the compilers are pretty dynamic. Um, so you end up in the system where everything's kind of rotating, and that's why I think compatibility is pretty bad on Linux. That's why it's so hard to ship a binary on Linux, because it's just so poorly handled. There's too much churn, and there's not much uh, standardization, which is pretty crazy, given it's an uh, open source thing based on Unix. Do you think Microsoft will ever redo their Windows kernel? Um, I, I, uh, yes. I think the answer is yes, because I think uh, the NT kernel is dying. So I think the NT kernel is is on its last few legs. So is Linux, by the way. Um, how's Linux not with us to stay? Uh, it's the dominant system for servers, embedded devices, etc. It's not going anywhere, because um, it's just it's old. It's it's not great. What's gonna replace them? Who knows. <laughs> probably, probably, um, probably a virtual machine, probably a uh, safe language written virtual machine that then runs Windows or Linux or whatever the fuck you want. Um, but the like core of the system, it will just be the the virtual machine. That's that's what it should be for security at this stage. Obviously, if you do everything in one VM, you just have the security of that, but you can't compromise the whole system. Um, so, and that's that's the direction everyone's starting to head. Um, almost every device is starting to support virtualization, so I think that's where we're going to head, with the exception of embedded stuff. But embedded stuff is probably going to switch to new RTOSs anyways. Like, embedded devices... Uh, Linux is usually a little bit heavy for embedded devices at this stage. Let's talk desktop stuff. I think it'll be replaced. Um, I think it'll be, I, I think it'll be replaced within 10 years to, uh, to an extent without a user knowing that it changed because I think everything will get wrapped up into a hypervisor and then slowly but surely functionality will be plumbed through a hypervisor. So like modern apps, when you run them in your windows container inside of your VM will automatically create a new VM to run just that app. So it's isolated. Um, that already exists, right? already exists right these are already things that that microsoft's working on and 
and is pushed out and are things. True sandboxing, yes. Because for software that is still being compiled and maintained to this day, you can just have those things kind of work in that environment where you still use Linux or you still use, yeah, Linux or Windows or whatever, and applications that are newly compiled, in the case of Linux will be almost everything, can run in their own isolated environments. And then uh, for legacy things, you can still run them in a like NT kernel somewhere else, and you can kind of get that support. If that became mainstream, I'd be very happy. I think we're going to be forced to do that. So we're just going to we're going to be forced to head that direction. Uh, we just don't we don't have really any other options other than other than saying that we don't care about computer security anymore and just turning in the keys to the kingdom. So we're we're kind of we're kind of forced to move in that direction. Um. I don't know, security, security is just so broken right now. It's just, everything's so, so fucking insecure. Um, and we're not going to be able to re rewrite all the code, so we're going to have to, like, sandbox it for a while. While we write new code. I would say it's probably, like, two decades before we have a sufficiently developed enough kernel to replace something like NT that's been rewritten. We already have that today. It's called a browser. Well, a browser is just a portal into your computer. It's just it's just completely insecure, and we it's the same issue, right? And as a kid, I figured uh, by twenty by the time twenty ten rolled around, they'd have fixed the whole hacking thing. Yeah, unfortunately, no one cares, so we're not doing anything to go really in the right direction other than mitigations, because uh, everyone's basically said they're not willing to actually. Uh, think about or architect or make sacrifices. So instead, it's up to the operating systems to protect the uh, software developers from their own mistakes. So, which is arguably less financial cost and less financial burden on the system, uh, but I would still say it's wrong. Um, okay, so we're going to go into... We're going to start working on a server, I guess. So we're going to go... And yeah, we'll just open another terminal. Okay. Um, do, do, do. Put our authentication codes. Yeah, they don't do too much. I mean, it's a it's a good it's a good mitigation, but yeah. Yeah. Band-Aids. Lots of Band-Aids. Lots of Band-Aids. Okay, we'll go into chocolate milk. Cargo new bin server. We're just, we're just, you, you can't, you can't really mitigate your way out of a lot of these security bugs. Because a lot of them are just unmitigatable. You can mitigate a lot of them. You can make it painful. You can you can make it so like you can you can basically 10x probably probably 50x reduction on the number of bugs. So you can go to like 2% of the number of exploitable bugs of what we have now. But I still don't think that's very acceptable. Um No one is secure against an APT. Yeah, I mean, I I would say that you don't like the concept of an APT is is kind of misleading. I would say like no one is secure from basically one percent of the world. <laughs> like that's what we've decided. We've decided that basically one percent of the world can have access to anything they want, and and, and we we have deemed that acceptable. So, if, if you're, if you're, you know, when you get on a subway and you see 100 people on the subway, we say, it's A-OK -okay that one person on that subway can get access to every phone in the world. That's currently what we think is fine for security. Every time you walk past 100 per people, there's, there's one person there who can get access to every phone in the world. I, I find that fucking bizarre that that is like, wow, security is really hard right now. It's a lot harder and a lot better than it used to be, but it's it's disappointing. It really is. 
Okay. Reminds me of Person of Interest. What is that? Machine. Uh, is that a movie? Um. Okay. So we'll do a use standard net socket UDP socket. Um. Talking like you're typing now. Yeah. I don't know, man. But no one, no one really has been impacted by security yet, so no one cares. So it's gonna, it's gonna be a while before someone actually gets hit with something that's that causes some security issues. Um, but until then, no one's gonna care. At which point, it's 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 not really feasible to do security because if you're doing security, your competitor won't do security and they'll beat your costs, which means they'll be cheaper, which means you'll get swept under the rug on the uh, open marketplace. So we basically require doing no security right now. Like, I don't know. There, there are very few things right now that I think would actually be impacted by security. Um, and it would, it would have a greater than 5% effect on their market cap. And even that is unlikely. This will return an IO result, such that we can capture the results and use question mark syntax in here. And we're gonna just start writing a network server. So we'll do a bind. And we already have most of this code in this test serve. And we're just gonna yoink it out of here, just so we can have that going. Okay. Now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna implement a very basic network protocol. And this is gonna map a, um, it's gonna map a U64, which is a file ID to the contents of the file. Um, and I think what we'll do is we'll have the client will request that. So the client's gonna make a ArcNet device. So we're gonna do use Use um, alloc sync arc, and we'll wrap up an arc net device, and then here we'll be able to get that net device. And I think we go into um, net device new. Is that what I called it? Net device get. Ah, oh, that makes more sense. Good. Net dev is equal to net device get uh, dot expect. Ah. Uh, Option, start out with this for now. None, okay. So I'll get access to a net device. So get access to a network device. And then we're going to send a, uh, we're gonna bind. I guess we need to allocate a port if we wanna do this. So we'll probably do, um, hmm. Well, the IPs will be different for all of them. Uh, things will be routed by Mac. So yeah, we can have the the UDP ephemeral ports be allocated by the net device. So we'll add that kernel source net. Um, fan net, uh, impl net device. Thanks for all the follows, y'all. Hell yeah. We're, we're becoming big streamers now, which is really weird. Likely going to get Twitch partner unless they don't like the fact that I got banned once. But I think other than that, we should be uh, good to go. Hi, Gamoza. This is a really cool stream. I used to do lower level stuff back in the day. Uh, things like TSRs and DOS. Some demo scene stuff on Atari ST and my old uh, 3D6 SX. Uh, then I ended up getting away from the low level stuff, mostly do C sharp and web apps and API stuff now, uh, with a little machine learning now. Uh, but I've always wanted to get back into it. I'm so glad. I'm glad you're hanging out, having fun. Um, yeah, I fucking love low level stuff. I, I can't get enough of it. It's, I'm addicted to it. It's so, it's so fucking fun. It's an absolute blast. I'm so happy other people enjoy it. I'm, I'm really surprised. I'm really surprised that I can sit here and just literally do what I would be doing otherwise. And I, all I do is I just turn on a fucking camera and I just talk through my problems 
and people find it interesting. It's fascinating because I think that shows um, the interest in in low level stuff, and I, I think I think it's cool. I think I think that deep down inside, a lot of programmers would love to do low level stuff. I think a lot of people haven't gotten the opportunities to do them. A lot of people haven't had the freedom from their employers, from their bosses, from their universities, from their training, whatever it is, to get access to that. I'm gonna change this to uh, this stylization. Um, EDP bind. Why is running things in hypervisors uh, more secure than containers? Are you talking about like a Docker container? Because Docker is not a security boundary at all. Um, Docker doesn't really provide any like actual isolation because you share the kernel. So you're able to just exploit the kernel and, and get control of that. That being said, um, things like hypervisors, of course, can also be exploited, but it's less surface to secure. So ultimately, the goal of running things in a hypervisor is to reduce the amount of things that you could get wrong from millions of lines of code of a kernel to thousands of lines of code for a hypervisor. And then if you write it in a safe language like Rust, and you minimize your unsafe code, and you use really good practices, and you audit the shit out of your unsafe code, it's very likely... Like, someone could probably write a hypervisor that has no security bugs in probably six months, right? And have it be, like, shippable to the point that it supports Linux and Windows. Um, why did you get banned? I did a MapleStory hacking stream about a year ago before I really did streaming or had a public figure at all. So I just was like, fuck it, I'll just stream some MapleStory hacks. And it turns out they don't like making cheats on streams. <laughs> so we'll, we'll avoid making cheats on streams. Um, as, fun, as fun as it is. So on NetDevice, uh, we're going to figure out the ephemeral range. Um, and if you're not familiar with uh, UDP ephemeral, it's basically the, the ports that are allocated. TCP does it as well. It's the... Many Linux kernels use this range. Oh, you can do whatever the fuck you want. IANA recommends this for dynamic or this. Ah, well, you know what? We're going to go with IANA. Because, uh, you know, they're kind of the internet network authority, so we'll respect them. How come you make your tr uh, camera transparent? It's, it's because I... Uh, there's... I'll often have stuff like right now, ephemeral port is up here. If I if you didn't say that and my camera was uh, not transparent right now, you wouldn't be able to read this. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, I'm reading through this right now, referencing this, and you wouldn't be able to see what I'm doing. So that's effectively why. So, yeah, I'd, I'd love to have a, a better camera setup, but I can't really organize the screen in a way. I could squish the whole screen, and then I could have a banner where I would have my face, but then the readability goes down. So I don't, I don't really care about my face. I care about the readability and the results of the code. If VMs replace processes in the future, wouldn't they have to IPC? Wouldn't they? Wouldn't there have to be IPC mechanisms between the VMs? Uh, and that could be exploited similar to syscalls. Um, kind of, right? So like, if you have them. If you have them on different level kernels, where there are multiple kernels and they have different uh, access to them, you just control the routing they have to those kernels. So you would have like your banking browser in one VM that has access to a uh, to one NT kernel, and then you have your gaming VM, which has a completely separate kernel because you wouldn't share the kernel between uh, security domains. So you duplicate the kernel basically in those cases. Do you have any more paper reviews coming anytime soon? Um, I don't know. There haven't really been any papers that have uh, come by my eye and really uh, offended me enough to want to paper review them. Milagente, how are you doing this morning? Okay, net device. This is going to be the um, net device. We're using self on these. Yeah. Um... Woo, Cam, hell yeah, what's up? Woo. Uh, we're going to do um, next 
dynamic port. Uh, dynamic, yeah, next dynamic port. Dynamic port, yeah, we'll just call it this. Uh, this is an atomic U size. And this is the um, next dynamic uh, port to give out uh, for use as an ephemeral port. Um, Okay, and this value will just increment from zero. Thus, the user should add uh, 49152 to the base and mod to um, cap the range to uh, 65535. Um, this is the recommended range by IANA to use for dynamically allocated ports. Cool, I think that's a good description. And atomic use size, we don't have that. I'm pretty surprised. Use core sync, atomic, atomic use size and ordering. Uh, technically, we can just do an atomic U16 here. Nah, uh, we, we'll do an atomic U size. Ah, uh, atomic U32 is faster. It doesn't. It doesn't matter that much. It tech. It technically matters. Add then mod. I. I'm just assuming that the reader understands what that means. Should add that to the base and mod to cap the range to that. Uh, that's why I say and and then not like then. But yeah, you should you should mod to that. I don't know. Is that unclear? I actually kind of thought a little bit in my head that that was unclear. Um, pub fn um, allocate port. This will take a self. This will return a u16. And this will allocate a new unused private port. And then we'll do um, loop. Let port is equal to self dot dynamic port dot fetch add one ordering sequentially consistent and then we're going to add we're gonna mod that by six five five three five minus four nine one five two plus one plus one Correct. One minus zero plus one plus four nine one five two. Uh, create uh, get a unique port number in the range of four nine one five two and uh, six five five three five inclusive. Okay, and now what we can do is we can say um, we want to lock EDP binds. Yeah. If let sum UDP binds is equal to self.udpbinds.lock. If EDP binds dot contains key, if it does not contain the port return uh, port as U16. Um, check in the uh, get access to the UDP binds. Uh, check if someone has already bound on this port. And I think this will just um, bind UDP port. This will just return that for you. UDP bind sum um, and this is self.bind UDP port dot. Uh, we just give it the port. If it doesn't contain that key, then return that. Uh, I think there's a deadlock there because I have that UDP binds. So we're going to have to do uh, core mem drop UDP binds to guarantee that that has been dropped. Okay, port um, as U16. All right.
right. Bind UDP net device, missing dynamic ports here. Uh, dynamic port is an atomic U32. New zero. Whoops. Yeah, and we'll clean this up a bit. EDP binds 214. Um, should be able to do that. Uh, 23. Oh, that's net mapping. And then net. EDP binds. Oh yeah, that isn't a get. Okay. Um, let UDP binds is equal to this. Honestly, we can one-liner this. We can do self dot UDP binds dot lock. If someone has not bound this port, then we will bind to that port and return that out. Um, there's technically a race condition there, but it's pretty negligible. So I'm, I'm fine with that. But yeah, technically, if you were to overflow the U32 space <laughs> while this one's blocking, but I'm, I'm just not too worried about it. Uh, expected U16. Yeah, we'll just cast this whole thing to U16. And then this doesn't need that. Famous last words. It's fine. We'd have to mod the 32-bit space while one of them is still between this and this. It's it's just it's just it's just not gonna happen. Oh, that returns none in that case. So we can do this. Um we can do if let sum uh, bind is equal to this, return bind. Okay, now there's no race condition. You guys happy now? <laughs> None. Now that could still infinitely loop if we bind to every port. So we got to fix that as well. Um, we'll just do this. Uh, for this in zero dot dot uh, six five five three six minus four nine one five two, we'll only loop through once before giving up. Okay, our port undeclared lifetime. Yeah, we got a a uh, b outlives a, and then this is an a, and then this is explicit b. Noise. Now we got some stuff in DHCP we got to fix up. That's no problem whatsoever. We're going to go into uh, kernel source DHC, kernel source net DHCP. And where this binds to UDP, this is now bind UDP port. And we have solved that problem. Okay, then 23. Bind to our port. Um. Yeah, bind UDP, and that will just um, bind to a random UDP port on this network device. Currently number two in programming with 123. What's number one doing? I'm guessing they're doing game dev, right? Pretty sure it's all about the personality. The, oh, the, oh, the personality. I see. I see. Um, I respect that. I got no problem with that. Everyone can produce their own creative content in their own different ways. Uh, oh, this is bind UDP now. Is it game dev though? I've noticed that the top programming streams that I've been checking in on are pretty much always game dev. I don't even have the programming tag on this stream. How the fuck do I set a tag? Oh my god, edit stream info, tags, programming, suggestions, programming, software development, educational, 
Engineering? You get, give me engineering for this one. Vi oh, ooh, another suggestion is visual ASMR. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say that I'm not visual ASMR, but I updated the tags. So there we go. Number one is a Brazilian stream doing MongoDB in JavaScript. Oh, interesting. All right, let's see. Nice. Okay, now all the tags have updated. So now, now all of those programmers and engineers are going to be flooding in here because they're going to be like, holy shit, there's a programming stream. Yeah, okay. All the engineers out there watching Twitch. <laughs> Visual ASMR. I didn't add that, did I? No, I didn't. Okay. I've got IRL, programming, software development, educational, creative. I will, I will say this is creative. Uh, we currently have networking disabled by via this. Bam. Let's go. Let's go. Fuck yeah. Get that DHCP lease. Where is it at? There we go. Did I time out the DHCP lease? Did I not get a DHCP lease? Yeah, it, it did get a lease. I'm just not printing the lease. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm not pre printing lease information. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to bind to a random port on this network device. And then, wow, that was a nice API. I'm glad we added that. Let's make sure it's correct. Go through all of these, and I'll do this. Same thing here. Uh, we're going to mod by that. Then we're going to add that base. And that'll give us a U16. Um, mod will always be minus one from the range, so that's fine. That one overflow we can get six five five three six or six five five three five, and then we get access to the binds. If honestly, we can just do this because uh, that's failable. Bind UDP port. Attempt to bind to the uh, UDP port. And I don't think there's a better way to write that, which is kind of weird. But attempt to bind on the UDP port. We bind to the UDP port. That does this. If it is already present in the binds, then we will return none, in which case this will be none, which means we'll go to the next loop iteration. If we've gone through the entire space, technically one could have come free, but we're going to give up at that point and we'll return none. Now you have me saying honestly. Honestly, you're one of the funnier channels to watch. Like I said, it's all about the personality. Damn. Uh, <laughs> yeah, me saying honestly, I may have watched, may have been watching your stream too much. Hey, I I have noticed that the the time it takes for me to get um a new like phrase rubbed off on me, so fucking fast, man. I started watching. I don't know if you guys watch uh any car people but i started watching cletus mcfarland on youtube i love his stuff um and <laughs> it's just got me saying all the like dumbest fucking like racing terms and they're just all god now i'm like blanking on all of them but I, but i've definitely started like saying them in my vocabulary i love cletus oh my god his stuff is so good um i don't know like i i I would say um, he, he probably not anymore, but he he was my favorite YouTuber for like last month. Like I go through phases. I'm not saying he has changed something. Um, I just go through phases very quickly. But when I found the Ruby series, I fucking yeah, he's the guy who bought the Speedway in Florida. Yeah, yeah, the the Freedom Factory. Um, no, I don't know. I just I just love his I love his stuff, man. Uh, I love how energetic he is and i love how respectful he is of his of his friends and coworkers, whatever you want to call him the the fact that like he he's just so excited to congratulate them when they do something well or when they when they do something at all and it's just so fucking cool yo that speedway is literally 15 minutes away from my old high school i am probably gonna go to a freedom 500 um i've got i've got my parents who live in naples well they sometimes live in Naples. They have a vacation home there. So I'm probably going to try and sneak up there um, and catch a Freedom 500. I think that'd be really fun. You sit on your ass so good. I need a boss like that. 
All right, so we bound to UDP port. Simple. Now, we're going to send a packet. Now, the way we send packets is a little bit convoluted, um, but I like it. And I like it because it's verbose as fuck. Um, so first thing, we're going to resolve the target. And we need to actually know, you know, we probably need to have this take more than a file name. We need a, a server. Um, and this will be a stir. Mm -hmm. That'll be an into... Oh my god, we did traits, I think, correctly. I should go see for a tiny meetup? Hell yeah. Um, I was actually uh, um, thinking about doing like a, a conference or something, like a virtual conference. But now it's kind of a, kind of a thing that people do because of corona, so now it's not like hip anymore. But for a while there, it was hip. So... And that's what I was, I was thinking about doing something, leveraging my Twitch fame, <laughs> which honestly, I shouldn't say Twitch fame. I, I will say having 120 people watching me right now is pretty fucking awesome. So cheers. I'm into cars. I have a 700 wheel horsepower Mustang, five pound uh, coyote, uh, Whipple supercharged. Fuck yeah, dude. That sounds sick. You know, until uh, Cletus, I actually didn't really appreciate American cars. Or, um, or, um, drag racing. I just, like, never, never really thought about drag racing as something I would do. And, I, honestly, it looks pretty fucking fun. So, I'm, I'm probably gonna build a drag car. I think that's, that's probably gonna be something I'm gonna do. Um... Apparently, Microsoft thinks uh, hypervisor is a niche, too. I've detected that for the last 30 days. This issue didn't have much project team activity um, and a very small amount of new votes on comments. Based on this, blah, blah, blah. Oh, is that the WHVP documentation? No offline help. Yeah. Just got a Toyota, a Toyota 86, but at least it's standard transmission. Hell, yeah. I fucking love that, like, shift. That being said, I think I'm going to uh, put a sequential in my car. Uh, probably a straight cut sequential, because I just, I just want that, like, fast-ass shift. Um, but I'm probably going to buy another car before I turn this into too serious of a car. I mean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have two of the same car, <laughs> effectively. One's, one's going to be, like, super, super, super hard to drive, and the other one's going to be, like, kind of hard to drive <laughs> so hell yeah love the feel of g-force yeah i've i've never um i don't know i i've never had like a very straight line car i i have cornering cars i've always been into more track based things is that vim or emacs it's vim Okay, so we are going to take a server, and a server takes a UDP address resolve, and resolve is in resolve. Mine's a sleeper, all stock, except for the rear wing. Hell yeah, I would definitely do a sleeper. I'm all, I'm all about fucking sleepers, man. I don't know, there's just, there's, there's something, there's something I fucking love about sleepers. That being said... I do think I'm probably gonna get a um, an aerial atom sometime soon here, and then I'll uh, if it's not the K21, I'll probably K20 swap it and turbo it to like 450, probably 400 to 500. Want to build a sleeper PC? Oh fuck yeah, dude! Beige case from the 90s. <laughs> that actually would be pretty sick. <laughs> I'd love to get an atom. Yeah, I I was just looking at one. Yeah, I don't know. There, are... I will probably have one within two years, cause I just I don't have the self control to not get one. Um, quite frankly, one of the reasons why I almost did not buy the servers that I that I'm planning on buying, um, was because I was gonna buy an Adam instead. <laughs> uh. And the Atom I probably wouldn't lose money on, so... Um, the Atom I'd probably actually make money on pretty easily. Probably make, like, uh, five grand every five years. Probably a grand a year on the Atom. So, you're just, you're just making money on that, to be honest. Uh, resolve. 
This takes a dest, which is a stir. That resolves the UDP port into UDP address. That makes sense that it needs that. Okay. Um, I actually had one super hilarious. Yeah, your sleeper PC. I, I had a shitty beige PC for a while, um, but it was arguably shitty the whole time I had it. When I, you know, it was my build when I was a kid. So it was like, it was bleeding edge $50 stuff. And Adam, and Adam is an aerial Adam, uh, which is referring to a, um, it, it's basically a go-kart. <laughs> it's a very, very light, looks like a, looks like a, it's a track car. Uh, it is street legal, but it's like exposed chassis, exposed uh, like wheel struts and joints and axles and everything. Uh, it's very naked. There's no windshield. There's no roof. There's no doors, windows. It's, it's just like, it's wireframe, right? Um, but it's super, super light for that reason. Okay. Um, server should be the uh, IP port for the um, uh, server. How do you earn money on that? Uh, it doesn't depreciate because it's a rare enough car. You'd be able to sell it for more than you buy it for. Um, not actual income, just appreciation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Sorry if that was misleading. Net uh, UDP address. Here we go. Just an aphid, gotta head out, gotta get some, gotta get some sleep, have some exciting web stuff tomorrow, see you around, uh, yeah, we'll be, we'll be streaming probably, uh, tomorrow will be a long, today's gonna be a short stream, like, once we finish this up, I'm probably gonna call it, I did get up at 4am today, so my sleep schedule is kinda rotating, um, so I want to kind of maintain this, but tomorrow and the rest of the weekend will probably be relatively long streams because I have some significant development that I would like to get done. So yeah, feel free to stop on by. Make sure you're followed if you're not followed. Um, well, theoretically, you could make money with uh, producing YouTube content. It'd be difficult to do that. Uh, I actually think I could uh, produce YouTube content out of my garage. Um, but... I don't know. I I actually want to do like physics stuff. If I do physical things, I think when I I, I probably will stream um, when I build my engine because um, I do think people will enjoy that. It'll be a completely different audience, but I do think people will enjoy that. Um, when I when I fucking get around to that, but yeah, I'm pretty sure I could have that engine built and put in in one stream. So it'd be kind of fun to see that like fire up for the first time. And then go for a drive around the neighborhood. Um, net mapping, no R port. Yo, we gotta get the port from the UDP address, and that's pub. So, um, we gotta get it off the UDP bind, which is the port. So, this is gonna be um, pub fn port self return to U16 uh, gets the port number this uh, EDP bind is bound to, and then we'll return self.port. That was an easy one. So now we can say, um, let UDP is equal to this. And then here we can say UDP.port, and then we'll connect to that server. That's going to send an ARP to request that server. Um, and then here we can say, uh, expect failed. Eh, we can just do this. If we failed to bind to UDP port, then we failed to do the mapping. 32. Hello, how are you doing, Roscoe 4000? How's your day going? Message, not found in the scope. Yep, that's because we don't have a message yet. All right. All right. So I think we're going to create our protocol, and we're going to implement our protocol in a... Serialize, deserialize. We're going to manually implement serialize and deserialize uh, just because, in this case, it's going to be such a simple protocol that it won't really be worth um, doing anything more complex. So we're going to do an enum. 
uh, uh, this is gonna be a server message. And I do have a serialization library, but I'm not gonna use it in this case. I just wanna keep this super simple. I don't wanna pull in that complex macro. Maybe I should. Maybe I should pull a noodle. Oh. I think I will re regret if I don't. Like, I don't want to do it now, but I think that's because I'm being lazy. But I don't think I will regret it if I do it. Okay. When that happens, that means I should do it and not be lazy. All right. Let's not be lazy. Uh, let's go look at um, Vim mount storage. Uh, we can look at it here. Uh, mount storage. TKO fuzz Francia shared noodle source lib. Oh yeah, I made this lib core, didn't I? Fuck yeah. God, I fucking love past self. I knew that I would end up using this in a fucking OS. So I designed it in a way that it didn't use standard. You see a couple things standard here, but those I can remove very quickly. Oh, fuck yeah. Fuck yeah, um, copy, mount storage, TKO fuzz, Franzia, sh shared, noodle, and we'll put that into shared, that should give us noodle, fim source noodle, and we developed noodle on stream, um, shared noodle source, let me check, make sure all this stuff's good, edition 2018, shared noodle source, Right, dude. Why is my music so quiet? I like barely can hear it. I'm been struggling here. There we go. Now we're now we're bopping. Um, I wish I could conv convince myself to not be lazy that easily. I uh, eventually you just have to, man. Standard, standard goes away. Anything that's standard, gone. Is that it? No, there's hash map. Yoink. Dude, I fucking love my code, man. Ah! Fuck yeah. Um, and let's see, this should have tests for everything. I can do enums. Oh, yeah. Fuck yeah, dude. Oh, this code is so good. No procedural macro here, too. i uh, find you a partner. <laughs> find, find you a partner who looks at you the way Kamoza looks at his code. My code is my partner. So... I did officially put in a quote for a server. So um, I'm waiting for a response from Intel and Supermicro, but I will likely be buying a new server. So we'll be having an unboxing pretty soon here. Uh, currently the processor's out of stock, but I'm pretty sure that they'll be able to find stock for me. I think I'll probably have a new server next week, but I, I haven't gotten the quote yet. So I'm like jumping the gun, but I'm hoping I'm hoping that I can have a new a new server by next week. So yeah, we'll be uh, it'll be my uh, most powerful server I've I've ever bought. I'm super excited for that. Uh, it's my most powerful, absolutely, which is easy, and also relatively compared to like relative to the current market, like what is available and what's not. So, <laughs> Rip Kitchen. Um, I mean, I. I, I've, I've found some, I found some budget. <laughs> I've found some budget. The kitchen will still happen. <laughs> uh, what do you do with those servers? I run this, uh, I run this, the kernel that we're writing here to find bugs in software. So, but yeah, I'm super stoked, man. New hardware is always nice. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I got a really good opportunity. 
Aren't you in Wash uh, aren't you in California? Isn't jumping the gun super restricted there? Nope, we're in Washington, and I live like five miles from two different gun stores. Rootin' tootin'. <laughs> Hell yeah. I've never been a crazy gun person, but I do appreciate guns. Um, I, I appreciate the engineering of guns. It's always been a, a fascination to me. Fascin fascination of mine. Expected two arguments to net mapping. Well, yes, of course, uh, Sir E. Bob. We're going to say... I'm going to do a 192.168. I think 101.1. And we need a port number, guys. We need to figure out a port number. Pick me up an AR-15 and a Glock 19. I'm a, I'm a 1911 person. Still need to go to a range at some point? Yeah. I got a, I got a silence 1911 that I really like. It's fucking gorgeous. It's super, super heavy. It's a 45 19. Uh, leet, leet, it, I use too much, so I can't do leet, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I love the 1911. I love how bulletproof it is. I love how you can disassemble it with itself. Um, not that that fucking matters, right? <laughs> but, um, I like it as a, like, uh, uh, an engineering, like, fidgeting toy. So I, I typically, like, disassemble... Uh, lube and reassemble it just as a like fidgeting thing which is a weird thing to do but um it's never loaded it literally it, it literally is never within 10 feet of ammo so <laughs> i'm not i'm not too worried about it and i live alone so <laughs> 1911 it's just gorgeous man it's gorgeous and i have like the threaded barrel and everything for the silencer um which I love. I, I think uh, uh, I don't do it for like stealth or some other reason. It's it's just purely um, purely for being quieter. Um, it's just nicer to shoot. 14, 1911. We we can do that. We can do that. It's not that's not too aggro for me. I try not to go like too crazy into gun stuff. I'm not a crazy gun person. I appreciate the engineering of it. I like the heavy mechanical mass of it, um, but I wouldn't really go out of my way uh, to keep one if if a situation were to arise where there's like buybacks or something. Um. Okay, so that'll connect into that server. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Speaking of heavy, heavy mechanical mask, have you ever fired a deagle? I have not. I have not. I feel like I'd probably enjoy that. I do. I do have like relatively small hands, so I do sometimes worry about like the size of a gun, like firing out of my hands, but. I've got really strong uh, finger strength, so I'm not too worried about it. I got those climbing hands. Th that death grip <laughs> can do pull-ups on my fingertips. <laughs> Listen to the hum humble brag. Oh, yeah, my fingers are strong. That's my fucking humble brag. <laughs> I have strong fingers. <laughs> Starlight Network's multimedia protocol? What do you, what do you think we're going to call our, our protocol? <laughs> Chadly powerful fingers. I, d I don't think uh, I don't think people appreciate a strong finger. It's more about a gentle touch. You gotta you gotta be you gotta be delicate with your significant other, unless unless they request differently. <laughs> then it's on you. <laughs> then 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 you can negotiate that yourselves. <laughs> There's there's no limit to what you can do if you can uh you know figure that out between amongst yourselves. <laughs> uh let's go check out the uh, we got noodle pulled into shared <laughs> tenacious D oh my god tenacious D is so fucking good man you know what Kyle Gas and Jack Black have such an a, a beautiful 
interactive presence. It's just, it's just, like, god damn, like, it's, it's so obvious they're good friends, right? It's just crazy. They just seem to do things to make each other happy. It's, it's pretty surreal. The bestest of friends and it rocks. <laughs> Hell yeah. Um, all right, let's grab Noodle, and I think uh, we haven't used Noodle in a while, so we'll have to remember how we Noodle things up in here. Um, let's pull this in. We want to kernel source cargo, uh, kernel cargo.toml, and we're going to go and grab, we're going to convert the lock cell into a, into a Noodle. Fuck. I did not want to G that. Ooh. God, this song's so fucking good. Dude, the new Haley Williams singles. So fucking good. Oh my god. Unreal, man. Um. Noodle. Friendship is surreal in 2020. Agree. I, I don't know. I just... I just... I just love it. I and that's one of the reasons I really like Cletus, to be honest, um, because I see a lot of his interactions with his friends in a similar manner. Um, oh my God, her new stuff is phenomenal. Oh my God, yeah, go uh, go throw on Simmer, man. Ah, oh, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna put that on too. Just so fucking good, man. Yeah, it's her uh, EP, Pedals, Pedals for Armor. All of them are really good. Her music videos are really good. Uh, her uh, performances have been really good because she's done, like, a couple, like, in-home coronavirus concerts. Unfucking real um, Love her work. Always have. Paramore has always been right there next to my heart. Always been emotional for me. Always been good. I don't know. What do, what do y'all listen to? What, what, what kind of music do y'all like? Um. I listen to Norwegian throat screaming. Are you talking about metal? <laughs> You're talking about like are you are you memeing like literally Norwegian throat screaming or are you talking about some some good old like black metal? Cuz I fucking love me some Norwegian metal. <laughs> Literal screaming, power metal, blind guardian, and the like. Fuck yeah! I almost did the "I love you," the the classic sin. <laughs> metalcore, fuck yeah! I love metalcore, man. Ah, oh, metalcore is fantastic. Get me some breakdowns. Get me some whiny emo shit. Oh, I think my favorite playlist on Spotify is angsty teenage girl playlist because that is basically. My emotional level of development. <laughs> nice Tesseract, yeah. In Flames, oh my god, In Flames is good. Uh, I have a couple In Flames things on albums. At the Gates, I don't think I've listened to that. German Industrial, not too familiar, is that... I guess I, I know Industrial, but I don't know specifically German Industrial. K-pop when I'm in a guilty pleasure mood. Anyone, anyone got that guilty pleasure for um, baby metal? <laughs> German industrial includes Ramstein. Okay. Oh shit. All right. Was not expecting that. Um. Why did I end up using writer? Like that. Uh. Baby shark metal. No baby metal. It's like I don't know if it's still a thing, but it was a thing for like a couple of years. Daniel Tompkins, uh, Twitch has been really good. Baby Metal is off awesome, hell yeah. Occupy the Prog Metal, Vaporwave, J-Pop, Jazz Space. Ooh. What's your Prog Metal picks? I was really into, uh, Cynic, Catatonia. Catatonia is fucking phenomenal, and they have so much work that's good. Cynic is fantastic as well, but there's just not too many works. Um, 
love, 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 love their stuff. Baby metal, like, give me chocolate. Hell yeah, hell yeah. I had a, I had a guilty pleasure phase there. This is gonna be, um, um, writes, bites, uh, yeah, read a writer, what did I, into self using a writer. How do I use this? I think I impl writer automatically for a couple things. Um, maybe I don't. That takes a writer. Do I have to implement that myself? Cynic is great, totally. Pretty much everything, yeah. I have an uncomfortable amount of love for corn. Never got into them, but I do respect their stuff. Tr uh, Cynic's remaster of Trace and Air, um, the um, the the one with the the tan cover, the um, where where they're more symphonic, that are like more uh, acoustic. I forget what they call it, like wrapped in air. They it's like very similar. Oh, it's just called Traced, isn't it? Pretty sure it's just called Traced. I think I've touched pretty much most parts of metal at some point. Hell yeah. Yeah, I think I, I was really into uh, Epica, Nightwish, um, Corpaclani, Opeth, Cynic. Um, what else? Uh, Amon Amarth. Uh, Catatonia, if I didn't already say that one. Um, Dimu Borgir. Oh, yeah. Sounds like high school? Fuck it. Retraced. Yeah. The actual re uh, the remaster of it? Oh, I I think I maybe I've listened to that. Tool Chevelle and Under Oath. Tool and Chevelle, fantastic. Chevelle, fucking love. Demo Borgir, hell yeah. Yeah, I really liked uh, Stormblast. L080, yep. L080, hell yeah. <laughs> oh my god, man. Mostly because of Simone for Epica, so I yeah I saw I saw um, Epica live, and the Agonist actually opened for them, and that was fantastic. The Agonist was unbelievably good. See you around night nightshade. Get some good sleep. Um, listen to Cellar, darling. Nope, never heard of it. This is a. Uh, God, I thought I implemented this on shit, but I I, I guess I don't. Oh, I use, um, oh, I use, uh, ConstFN in here, don't I? Yeah, I do! Oh, <laughs> yes! So I can serialize any arbitrary-sized array. She was from LO80? Oh, interesting. Haven't been to a metal show in so fucking long. I think the last metal concert I saw was, um, uh, Catatonia. Mm. I technically saw Me Metallica, <laughs> but I don't really count Metallica as metal. <laughs> hey, computerphobic, how you doing? Good morning. This is going to be, um, it's a lot of writing in the self, but I, I swear I implemented that on things. Let me check where I do that in uh, TKO fuzz. Oh, I impled it for things that implement right. Oh, okay, so I do have to implement this. I think I show, uh, saw Mashuga like uh, when Obzin came out. Yeah, Mashuga, I never got too into them. I really liked um, uh, Machine, was Machine Mashuga? Oh, uh, I also like Born of Cyrus quite a bit. Um. Fuck yeah. All right, we gotta, we gotta write some code. This is going to be, um, uh, write the contents of buff into self, uh, used, used to allow custom adapters for writing to serial buffers, uh, serialized, uh, custom adapters for writing during serialization. 
And this is uh, read the contents of read the contents of self into uh, buff and uh, used to allow for custom adapters uh, during uh, serialization. Uh, return uh, error if the entire uh, if buff cannot fully be uh, filled and uh, return error if buff cannot be fully serialized. Hell yeah. Haven't seen Periphery yet. Misha is M Misha like that lead. God damn, man. All right. So we're going to make that serialization and then we're going to implement in net between the buried and me. Ooh, not familiar. Now net mapping, we're going to use noodle to noodle a server message. Yay, metalheads. <laughs> What's up, meta construct? Uh, noodle. Cannot fly. I need the extern. <laughs> God damn, lots of metalheads here. Holy shit. I was expecting, uh, I was not expecting this to go down the metalhead path. Uh, I'm, I can't say I'm too surprised. I think I need to. Macro use extern create noodle. That should get me access to noodle. Ooh, I need to mark this no standard. Fuck yeah. Use alloc box box. Uh. Cannot find trait serialize. Um, I guess we'll use noodle star. I think that's my intended use. Let's just pull everything in. Okay, so this is going to make serialize and deserialize on an enum. Beyond the Buried and Me. I've been recently uh, really into... I had a Chevelle phase for a while. Um, Bring Me the Horizon was really good. Semp Eternal is just a fucking phenomenal, phenomenal album. The, the whole thing from start to finish is really fucking good. Unbelievably good. Um, honestly, there are, ver there are very few albums that I would put in that category. I think, like, uh, actually, what what albums can you say are, like, the whole album is good? I would say Kanye West gra Graduation. Really fucking good. Whole album. Really good. Um, Bring Me the Horizon, Semp Eternal. Really fucking good. The Pixies, Do a Little. Oh, hell yeah. Anything by Frank Ocean. Yeah, you're totally right there. Weird Al running with scissors. Oh my god, dude. Weird Al? I, I, I remember like first hearing his stuff, and he just completely blew up. I think he's still making stuff, too. Language by The Contortionist. Actually, my favorite album ever. Holy shit. It's all about the Peniums, baby. <laughs> yup. Altered State by Tesseract, very good, yeah. God damn. All right, we're gonna have an open. Um, yeah, I, I fucking love Flyleaf, but I recognize it's not like objectively that good. Uh, but I fucking love it. Um, open string. Open response. Such good music taste in this chat. Hell yeah. This is, the, this, is good, this is the good chat. We're gonna get some good emotes and shit for you guys when we get partner. 
I'm gonna have to buy Flyleaf records. Forgot about them. Um, I really like. Um, there is some stuff that leaked from them that never went public and uh, or well <laughs> wasn't supposed to go public. So there are a couple of really good songs. Uh, Sleepwalker and uh, and uh, Whispering Fingertips are really good. Really shitty audio because they're leaks, right? The audio quality is fucking trash. Sounds really good. I I love those. Um, also. Uh, Flyleaf, before they were Flyleaf, was called Passerby. And um, honestly, really like some of their old versions. The, they, they redid a couple songs. Um, one of their latest, their like last album actually had one of the songs that was on uh, Passerby, and they kind of changed it up. But I, I like the uh, original one a lot more. All Around Me is so good. The story behind it is sad, though. Yeah, the story behind, like... Um, yeah, if you, if you want, if you want that sad shit, I would say like, um, God, uh, let me find it. Flyleaf is where I typically go to get emotional. Um, let's see. Um, but yeah, Whispering Fingertips is really good. Yeah, 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 yeah. You want you want that deep cuts? You go you go with uh, much like falling. This song, fucking brutal, man. Fucking brutal. But like, I don't know. She 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 uh. I don't know. I I saw her in concert and it was a fucking experience. It was a fantastic concert. But yeah, this song is is really fucking sad kind of goes a little bit into her past which if you if you don't know she has a she had a rough high school experience as how she became religious I'm not religious at all but I still respect the the like feels okay so open response is going to give us a an option u64 It goes for all of you. <laughs> it's an assignment. This is going to be um, uh, messages sent to and from the server uh, for network mapped files. Google a bordello. I'm not familiar with it. Start wearing purple, Gypsy Punk. Hell yeah! I I <sighs> didn't Twitch like make it easier to like stream music and stuff now. Uh, we're gonna open. This is a request to open a file uh, with a given file name, and this is a response response from an open file request. <laughs> oh, we gotta cow that, I think, to get this to work then. I think, I think I did this. I think I added support for this. I think they still mute VODs as much as they used to. Okay, cool. Then I don't want to put music up. You guys use cow ever? Cow is so fucking cool. Um, it's what I use for my serialization stuff. But it allows me to serialize. I, I can create a server message with a reference to a string. And then I can deserialize it into an actual string. Really fucking cool. Um, God damn, man. Flyleaf is so fucking good. All right, let me, let me. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put on some deep tracks. Uh, music VLC star. Ah. Oh yeah. 
Just so fucking good, man. Across the board. Oh, you guys aren't getting the music. <laughs> you guys aren't getting the music. Sorry. I would love to. I would love to. But uh, too many people watch the VODs. So it really, it really hurts the viewability of the VODs, unfortunately. I mean, this stream, we're not really doing dev. But we're doing some pretty light dev here. Um... So, request to open a file with a given file name. That's going to, uh, response from an open file request, contains a, this contains a um, uh, file ID, which can be used, uh, which, which must be used for subsequent reads. We're not going to support writes. Uh, I mean, honestly, we could support writes pretty easily. Uh, no, we can't. This is just reads. Um, we're going to read from a U64. Uh, we can do this. Fuck yeah. I love Rust, man. This language is so goddamn good. Um, file ID, U64. This is the file identifier from a successful open request and then we're gonna take a I think we'll just take an offset uh, offset in bytes into the uh, file to request to read and then we'll have a we're literally implementing a fucking network protocol <laughs> There was once this streamer that set up a separate service that you could open in another window that streamed their music. Oh, shit. I should do that. And then we could have people suggest things. I will try and get something like that figured out. Probably won't happen this weekend because this w weekend's going to be crunch. Um, honestly, can I do that with Spotify VLC? Um, does Spotify have, like, syncs playing? It has to. No, I guess they don't. Group sessions. It allows you to sync up your songs with friends. It's called group sessions. All you need is another user's unique code. Create a cue and you listen. They can add a song, play, pause, rewind, and it plays through phone, laptop, or another listening device. Huh. Festify is a, a very similar third-party app. They're invited to vote songs up. Let me see Festify. Huh. That actually sounds pretty dope. Oh, we could do a Discord bot, to be honest. Discord bot would probably be easiest. Uh, do you ever write web apps or web APIs? Uh, I do not. I think I'll probably set up like a Discord uh, thing, and then I can just stream that there. Just mute my mic and then stream my like PC audio. Stream, be stream beats by Harris Heller is free. One of them problem with uh, VODs. Okay, cool. All right, so we've got the file ID, the offset, and then the size um, uh, in bytes to request. And we're going to have size, U64. All U64s, all day. Success. Full. Okay. Uh... Request a read of an open file. I guess it's not... We're, mm, I don't actually want that concept of open and close. Um, this is going to be like... Uh, uh, get file ID. And this will um, request a file ID. 
uh, for a file name on the server. This will cause the file to get loaded into memory on the server and persisted with the same ID. Uh, okay, so then we're going to, this is gonna be um, file ID, uh, returns the file ID of the requested uh, file name from a get file ID. If uh, successful, if the file exists on the server. Um, oh, and it also includes the length. So, uh, file ID and length. Hell yeah, that looks good. And then we'll have read file, and that way it's not like open close, because we're not actually gonna close these files uh, on the server. Uh, trait bound deserialized not implemented for U64 tuples. Okay, that's a limitation of my Huh. Yeah, uh, that's fine because we're going to clean it up anyways. We'll do noodle serialize, deserialize on uh, struct um, file ID response. Honestly, we can just do this. Um, file ID is an option. I don't think I can do this. Foo. I think this is going to complain in the same way. Going to support reads of things other than files? Mm, not really, but maybe. I mean, this will be pretty extensible, so we'll be able to make it pretty generic. Uh, put a comma in there. Put a comma after this. Okay, so this will return the um, um, file ID U64 file size. Um, size of the file in bytes. This is the file I file ID, and we'll just wrap both in options. Probably right now says for each line of code. Is that a Rust feature? Hell yeah! It's called writing good code. We're gonna use the same code on both the client and the server, which is gonna be pretty dope. Okay, so this means I will um, let, you know, how good is my performance on Noodle? I think it just copies. Um, read. Um, yeah, I think we can make this work in a pretty good way. <laughs> well commented code saves souls from eternal damnation. Hell yeah. Uh, allocate a packet. Then we're going to craft. Do I just want to implement writer on... Huh. All right, so we're gonna make a new server message. Um, server message open file name, uh, get file ID. Get file ID that, let x is equal to this. Okay, and then that needs to be, uh, you gotta convert that into a cow. And I think that into will do it fine, but we'll do car cow borrowed. Just to be explicit. I think it's cap B. Alright. So we'll borrow the file name. And then um we gotta serialize that. And honestly, I can serialize that directly into a UDP packet, question mark. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure I can just serialize that in directly into a 
EDP packet to reduce the amount of copies. Because so far, we haven't really copied anything except for a, a pointer. Um, so I think what we'll do is we will impl for packet. Really? Um, uh, no. No. So what I want to do... So I want to serialize this, so I want to make a UDP packet, but I don't know the length of it. Ah, that's going to be tough. I don't know the length of it ahead of time. I could just serialize it to a vector. Like, that. that is in play. Especially for this stage where the perf doesn't matter too much. I could make a vector and I could serialize into there. But I'm not going to want to serialize when I do read requests. So I will need a solution to this. Maybe I'll make like a create UDP where you get a UDP builder and then you can write to the UDP builder. You can like push bytes to it. I think that would be pretty cool. Um, and then we could impl on UDP builder. Now, it doesn't know the length. We don't, uh, I guess, for a UDP builder, we would have to go back. We can construct everything, then we'd go back, and we'd reconstruct the message length, or the IP size, and recompute the checksum. Yeah, let's do it. Let's make a UDP builder. Um, this is going to return a... This is on packet. So this is going to return a reference to a UDP builder. And that's off of the packet, so that's a ref from the packet. I think this is going to be really cool. Um, of course, we don't have any of these lengths. So this is like copying the length, which we won't do. Compute the checksum, which we won't do. Comment that out. And no checksum for the UDP header, because it's not required, which means we won't do it. <laughs> Fuck that. OK, so we'll do struct. Uh, pub struct UDP builder. And this just has a um, builder for creating UDP packets in place. Uh, when this is dropped, the um, when this is dropped, the packets lengths and checksums will be recomputed. Will be computed. Uh, populated and computed. Computed and populated. There we go. This is going to have uh, an A ref for sure. Packets, a mute packets, and this is a reference to the packet we are building in. And then um, UDP payload. Uh, use size, uh, number of bytes currently in the UDP payload. Dude, this is going to be so fucking good. We're going to do one copy. We're going to serialize directly into the packet that we give directly to the NIC. I'm like, fuck yeah, dude. This is going to be sick. Actually going to be nuts. Um, 707. Return where to populate the message payload. Okay, correct. This is going to be a UDP builder. Uh, packet self. And what else did we call it? 
UDP payload. Zero. So it starts off with no payload and a reference to the packet. And we're going to... Well, we got problems with here. 308 problems in DHCP. Ah, uh, yes. I'm going to close this for now and this. Cargo run. Okay. Expected net ref UDP builder. This is actually a UDP builder. Okay. DHCP, 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 DHCP. Okay, so we have to make UDP builder work in the way that we design. So this is going to be A, um, A, B, uh, outlives A. This is a B. All right. So now we have stronger lifetimes on that that are more correct. What's up, Leap Pleb? How are you doing? Good morning to you. Okay. Impl. And we got noodle open. Right. Yeah, we're going to impl a writer for UDP builder A. Impl A writer for UDP builder A. FN write. Mute self. Buff. U8. Returns a result. Okay, uh, error. We got a builder and we got a UDP reader. Uh, we got a reader and then read exact from mute into mute buff result that that. Um, technically, I can just use writer only. We'll probably end up writing reader. How do you send data to other threads or networks? Um, we're implementing that right now. We're actually, we serialize uh, raw bytes. Uh, I have a serialization library that allows me to serialize and deserialize things uh, from enums and structures. So that's what we're working on right now. So we're making a protocol here and here are the messages that we serialize. Um, and that's literally what it'll look like on the wires. This will have two U64s. This will have three U64s, of course, the enum identifier as well. So that's basically how that's going to look. Okay. So we're going to say if self.udp payload plus buff.len exceeds, what is, the, what is the maximum size for a UDP payload? Um, it's... Uh, 1500 minus um, 20 for the IP header and then 8 for the UDP header. Is it 1472? That sounds right. Um, make sure this fits within the packet. Uh, return none or er, error. Written something like protocol buffers? Yeah, this is pretty similar to that. Yeah. Okay. And then what we'll do is self.packet.rawmute, self.udp payload, self.udp payload plus buff.len, copy from slice buff that's not gonna build i think i need to move some of those fields out and then we got to pull in noodle as well uh use noodle writer 
Um... Someone to message length. That's not placed in. Time for surrender. Okay. Seven twenty. Set the length of the packet. Wanna we'll, we'll wanna do that at the end. But other than that, that's pretty close. Um, okay, right. I feel like the lifetimes are not going to be okay on that, but uh, whatever. So we're going to call right on that to write stuff into there as needed. Sending me in this getting scared. Okay. Uh, this is copy, oops, copy the buffer into the packet and then uh, return success. Success. So if the payload plus the length exceeds that, then we have problems. And then here, copy that into there, self.udp payload plus equals buff.len. And this is uh, update the length of the UDP payload. So it starts off as zero. We copy into there. We then bump that up. We return success. Okay. So we need to change DHCP to use this new um, model. Net DHCP, which kind of sucks because it's not really done yet. I don't know exactly how I want to do this. Um, so that gets the offset, and then we slice it up. And then we copy, we unsafe that stuff directly in place. Maybe I should change this. This is creating a DHP packet. So let mute um, packet is equal to this. Create a new DHCP packet. Okay, and then I'll comment out all this stuff for now. I just want this working. All right. So that'll create a UDP packet there, and it's building. Wow. So that means we can just implement this serialization stuff then. Uh, get access to the header portion. Cast the header to a DHCP header. Um, Yeah, that's nice. I don't have a way to express that. I kind of would like a way that I could directly write into the packet. Or I could say like dot reserve. Let me see if I can do that. Uh, impl a UDP builder a fn a pub fn reserve. Mute self. Um, size, u size, returns a mutable reference to bytes. And this is uh, reserve size bytes in the. Oh, just got a new shielding advance. Nice. Okay, reserve size bytes in the uh, EDP payload. Return these uh, a mutable slice to the bytes of the payload, and this will be in a result to kind of follow suit with the others. In fact, we're just gonna do options. We're gonna convert kind of all these things to use options. 
Um... Okay, and that means we also need to change that in here. Percent s results this, this with an option, this, go. Uh, uh, okay. Okay. G. Um. Try into ah, uh, yeah, we don't want that on all of them. Uh, dot star read. <sighs> Fuck it, we'll just fix these ones up. Sixty three. 
we are creating the packet from scratch. We know that we're not going to exceed the bounds of the packet. So we don't have to worry about that at all. Okay, uh, 3.11 on DHCP. Noise, 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 noise. Uh, 3.08, offset not found in the scope. Um, that's copying in the options. Um, so we cast that. That's fine. Papa bless. Uh, okay. So here it's kind of tough. I need to copy in the, uh, packet, the, the DHCP header, uh, size of header, size of header plus options.len. Yeah. So we slice that up. I'm so scared we're going to have lifetime problems. I'm so scared. Turn none. Uh, mute U8. Expected option found that in reserve. Question mark. Oh. Okay. Uh, no, it's not okay. Check dead returns a none. Okay. Oh, oh, we have a semicolon. Woof, woof the whole time. Uh, four sixty-seven mismatch types. Um, yep, this just needs to be a sum. Okay, and then 308, can't add that to that. Uh, 308, yep, that means I'm missing parens on both of these. Okay. Fuck yeah. Mismatch types. One of those things in Noodle is returning an... Uh, result. This is at found a result. Uh, okay. Some. None. Turn none. Fuck yeah! Dude, that's so good! Holy shit! Now, what we need to do is we need to change this. We need to change the um, UDP builder to have a drop. Impl a drop for UDP builder a fn drop mute self. So at this stage, the packet, the UDP builder is being dropped. So we'll update the lengths now that everything's been filled in. So we can write incrementally to packets. And then it'll just know the length uh, at the end. And then when you drop it, it'll update the lengths and compute the checksums. Uh, this is going to be a really cool networking stack. I'm super excited for this functionality. Um, so what we need to do is we need to fill in the length of these things. So uh, create EDP. We're going to yoink. We're going to yoink this whole thing, and then we're going to delete a lot of stuff. Um, okay, we're gonna paste it in here, poist it in here. We're gonna poist this in here. Get the IP header, which is self.packet.raw. We'll do raw mute. That's copying 
honestly, I could just lazily make the whole DHCP pa uh, the UDP packet, right? Why the fuck not? Then these are more sequential accesses. Uh, Prefetching has a better chance of working. So this is literally going to do nothing. This will just return a UDP builder to self and that, which is really interesting. 517, this is packet. Set up the IP header, set up the UDP header. Oops. 498, IP size, not found. Oh, I, I, I'm just gonna undo like all this shit so I can get it back in its original state before I commented stuff out. Um, paste. Hell yeah. Oh my god, dude, this is so good. Uh, self.udp payload. Instead of message line. I'm so fucking stoked. I'm so stoked. Uh, packet raw. Packet raw. Packet raw. Should be one more length, too. Oh, yeah. We probably should have the checksum and that copied in. And is that it? Uh, that's not self. That's on packet. Um, adder. Ooh, that would make sense. Uh, create UDP. We're gonna pass in the address. Uh, yeah, we, that can be a ref. I don't give a shit. That was for B. I mean, that just has to live for A. Doesn't have to live for B. Um, okay, so then what we're gonna do is we're gonna come in here and then we're gonna have adder UDP address. This is the um, address to send the packet to, or address, yeah. Address to uh, construct the packet with. Um, 537, self, 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 uh, IP size, 5 on 9, IP size, what was that, get diff, Grab IP size. Okay. IP size is equal to this, which is self dot UDP payload. Set len five fifty uh, packet. Uh. Hmm. Uh. Really? I mean, that makes sense, I guess, because we create a temporary. It will use it later there. 
Um, if I do Azraf, then I could create it. Because mm. if I do Azraf, that would move it into here, but then I'd have to store it, I think. Um... I don't want to have to clone the UDP address. I think I just change it in this one instance in DHCP. Let adder is equal to this. Okay, and then I can do uh, ref adder. Holy shit. Holy shit. And that, we could send that? Um. Is this just gonna work? Do I need this macro use? That's just net mapping stuff. Holy shit. Did we do that? It might just work. Nope. We got an out of bounds. Two forty-eight out of range of slice zero. Oh, raw mute. We don't want to use raw mute in this case. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know what this is. Uh, 1428. Th these are correct. These are correct. We want to... Um, what do we call it? Payload? Raw. It's just raw. It's raw! Raw... And then we want to do 14 plus 20 plus 8. 14 plus 20 plus 8. That's going to find the index into the, um, the actual packet. Okay. 1428 UDP payload, 1428 UDP payload. We got to do the same thing down here or up here. This is raw on the packet. I think we'll do the same syntax here because it's going to get a little wild. 14 plus 20 plus 8 plus this. 14 plus 20 plus 8 plus this minus size to that. Uh, didn't crash, and it maybe is getting a lease. It works. Oh my fucking god, it works. You get lease. Print lease from this. ND.dsp lease. Just double check. Maybe it's returning none. Dude, that's so cool. That API is amazing. Yes! Fucking easy, man. What do you have? A VLAN tag? I, I don't. <laughs> so that's. Um, do build times eventually become a problem with Rust projects? Kind of, really depends what how you structure it. What's uh, what's uh, mark A? Um, that is when you have a reference to something. You're basically telling it how long that reference must exist for. So in this situation, I am saying that I have two lifetimes in this function. These are pointers, right? If, you, if I just have to assume you're familiar with pointers, what we're saying is that. 
This takes a pointer to self, and the pointer to self lives for B. It's just a marker. It lives for B. It, self is an object that is valid for B. And what we're saying is we have a new lifetime A, and B outlives A. So what we're saying is that A, th this reference, the reference to this, this structure contains references in it. And the references inside of that structure will live for a shorter amount of time than the B object lives for. And that means that you can give a reference to something in that B object because you have guaranteed at compile time that it is impossible that this pointer could get freed or that object can go away while there's a reference to it because we know that this lives for longer than this does. Yeah, that's the lifetime stuff. It's the good stuff. Okay, so now this means I can serialize directly to a packet. Fuck yeah. Um, dot serialize, and I think serialize, what does serialize do? How do I do this? You take a mutable writer. Oh my god. Let mute packet is equal to packet.create UDP for the address of the server. <laughs> so we make a packet. We then create this UDP on it. Uh, and let's inline that one. It's simple enough that we can inline it. That returns a builder. It starts out with no payload and the packet uninitialized. Then we initialize the packet contents. That'll update the lengths and all of that stuff so it actually knows how big the lengths of these things are. And then when we drop the UDP builder, that'll actually construct the ethernet header, the IP header, calculate the checksums, the UDP header, and then the, set the length of the packet. And we know that the payload has already been copied into the place of that packet. And that means that um, we want to do an unwrap on this because serialization can fail if we run out of room or something. And now we can do netdev.send packet true. This is now going to send a packet uh, to that device. Move out a packet occurs here. Um, that's in the borrow, so we can just do this. We can just explicitly lifetime that stuff. That'll cause us to create that packet in that place and return that out. Oh my fucking god, yeah. Now that's going to send a packet to um, chocolate milk server, vim source, bind in 1911, and then print got payload 02x, which is a buffer that's been trimmed down to the amount of bytes that were received from the network. Okay, cargo run release. Uh, we'll just do, uh, ooh, chocolate milk server, cargo run. No hash map, yep, we don't have that yet. Uh, okay. Uh, curly. Okay, IO results, uh, use standard IO. Noise. Reset. Got a packet. And that is the serialized message. And there you can see the string. So here's the length of the string. It is 10 bytes. This is the enum type. And this is the payload. So... What we're going to be able to do, oh my god, we're sending like, oh, oh, we're sending like real shit from our kernel. Oh my god, it's so fucking cool. Oh my god. Holy shit. Um, we got to put this in a uh, shared library and, uh, well, we'll do this for now. Um, uh, allow unused, 
macro use extern create noodle. Use noodle star cargo run vim shared uh, vim cargo .toml. We're gonna set a dependency on noodle, which is found in a path, which is back to shared in noodle cargo run. Nice. Now we have noodle support, and what we'll do is we're gonna make another shared library. Shared uh, cargo new lib, and this is um, uh, we're gonna call this Falk TP, uh, Falk transfer protocol that has some legacy, some heritage. Uh, I've used Falk TP historically, so we're gonna we're gonna keep that terminology around. Then we're gonna go into server. Thank you for the follows, everyone. Falk toilet paper. Yup, it's very rare right now. Now, we're gonna pull in, we'll just do that over here. We'll grab, um, hell yeah, follow train, whoop whoop. This is sort, uh, is Noodle a simple uh, serialite crate? Yes, it is. Noodle is my serialization and deserialization library. Um. Okay, so, what up, Quaid? How's it going? Hell yeah. So fucking sweet. Dude, I hope I get this quote for the server tomorrow, too. God, I, I, we're on the up and up, man. I can't, I can't wait to get this server. We're gonna we're gonna have a lot of fun when that server comes in. We're gonna see how fast our Risk Five and our um, we're gonna see how fast our Risk Five and our Six Five Zero Two emulators are. I, I'm guessing we're gonna be in like the twenties of terahertz for our Six Five Zero Two emulator. <laughs> It'll just be so stupid, man. Oh, I can't wait. Risk Five emulation, hell yeah. It's weird because, like, I feel like I did that stuff so recently, but I, I used to only get, like, 30 to 50 viewers, which is awesome. I'm not saying only, but I have a lot of new viewers with this project, and a lot of people I haven't worked with my old projects, which are extremely high-performance emulators, which are very fun in their own regard. So we'll, uh, we'll be talking about those, too, at some point. All right, we're going to split shared... Um, Falk TP source, and this is really just gonna. This we're gonna pull in. This is net mapping, so this is actually going to come from Falk TP. Okay, and this is the um, Falk transfer protocol. <laughs> All right, uh, and this is a uh, network, networm, network mapped uh, files, uh, network mapped memory. I need your SIMD emulator. Uh, I've, oh, I read your SIMD uh, emulator post multiple times. Still breaks my brain that it works. Yeah, it's still confusing to me as well. <laughs> I mean, I, I understand it pretty thoroughly, but I, I do like to joke that I don't. Um, Folk TP, um, kernel cargo.toml, uh, Folk TP, yikes, uh, noodle Folk TP, G, Y, Y, X, cargo run. Uh, spcargo.toml, paste. Okay, now they're using the same definitions for those messages. Can't find noodle in that crate. Yeah, we gotta, we'll whack that in over here. Um, shared. Um, bulk TP store, uh, cargo. And this has a dependency on noodle, which can be found at noodle path equals 
Cargo run. Uh, shared Falk TP source. Uh, ex uh, use noodle star. Um, yes, we use cow in here. Use alloc borrow cow. And this is a uh, no standard. Okay, um, extern create alloc. Oh, fuck yeah. Uh, server message 40. That comes from FolkDP star. And we gotta reload that and we'll close it here. Um, oh, pub. Yes. Yes. Okay, so now I can do a um, use folk TP star. And then I can say, uh, er, I can, I don't have to do that. Uh, server message. Uh, this will be server message. Beautiful. Beautiful. And now we can do, um, server message deserialize from amount. Uh, buff amount. Uh, unwrap. All right, expect failed to deserialize a uh, server message. Okay, and I can't quite do that yet. Um. It expects a reader, and I think we'll want to implement a reader on that. So let's see what we can do for Noodle. To we got to implement reader and writer. Um, so we'll impl writer for mute ref u8. Uh, we'll do reader. Impl reader for a mutable reference to a reference to a slice. FN read exact. Mute self buff. Mute U8. Can I do that? Uh, option this. I can, and that's a mutable reference to a, a reference, because it's a mute of this. Okay, so that means we can do, to read from that, we can do a buff, uh, buff copy from slice, um, self dot dot buff dot len dot get to make it failable. And then copy from slice. Oh my fucking god, yeah. Uh, wow, wow. Um, then we can do a buff uh, self, deref self is equal to self buff.len. Uh, okay. So that'll update that reference. And then we'd return some. Okay, and this is a basic uh, reader implementation for, um, can we do document comments on an impl? Yes, we can. Basic reader implementation for, um, uh, slices of bytes. 
So we can copy from Slice. We get that from Self. If that succeeded, then we'll copy into there, and then we'll update the pointer. And that means this. Um, let's mute pointer is equal to buff amount. And now I can do mute pointer. Okay, okay, okay. Let message is equal to this, print message. Dude, this is gonna be sick. Uh, drive debug. Done. Build, server's running, reset. Get file ID foobard up bin. Oh my god, that's sick. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. Read a raw packet, uh, read a EDP packet from the network. Now we're gonna do, um, Deserialize the message, match message, server message, uh, get file ID, uh, file name. Fuck yeah, that's so cool, man. So fucking cool. Um, X at this, panic unhandled uh, packets this, X. Um, ah, comma. Okay, and then here we can say, um, now we can try and open that file. So we can do path, new, file name. Uh, let file name is equal to this. Might have to ref that. Uh, use standard path, path. Damn it, dude. This is gonna be so fucking good. Um, yeah, we can just ref that. Uh, ooh, just borrow. Technically, we can do this. Okay, so that'll get the file name into a path. And then um, we want the current directory in Rust. Oh, we're booking it now. Uh, Rust. Uh, cur, current dir, cur, cur dir. Current dir, here we go. Um, bind to all network devices on UDP port 1911. Here we're going to uh, let cur dir is equal to this. Get the current directory. Here we're gonna path buff. Oops. Okay, good energy, good stuff. Hell yeah, man. Glad you're enjoying the energy. I'm glad that we're doing this correctly. Um, deserialize the message. And this is a um, implementation of the Falk TP transfer protocol. It's a really, it's a really good protocol. A plus. Um... Get a file ID. This is going to get the file name. That's going to turn it into a path. And then we want to 
uh, path off. We want to turn that into a... We want to canonicalize a path to FS canonicalize. Uh, yeah, so this will resolve all symbolic links. Canonical absolute form of path with all intermediate components normalized and symbolic links resolved. So we want to do that on both this, which I don't know if it is or not, but I'm just going to do it just in case it's not. And then here, we're going to canonicalize the file name as well. And this will uh, uh, normalize the file name. So at this point, I can now print the file name that was requested. Reset. And this, uh, oh, no such file or directory. Does that have to exist? Does that file have to exist? Um, I think it does. Um, I think I might change this protocol. Uh, file ID error. Um, okay, this will be um, if getting the file ID fa failed, uh, this will be sent back by the server. Okay, so we're gonna say um, if let some file name is equal to this, then we have the file name here. Otherwise, uh, normalize the file name. Oops. Print file name. Otherwise, uh, print. File not found. 32. I think that's an okay. Fuck yeah. Okay, now we can do a um, socket send to. Um, this will be like, uh, let mute, uh, send buff is vec new. This is the, uh, buffer for sending packets, uh, reused, uh, to, uh, prevent, uh, allocations. Okay. So when I want to send something, I'll do send buff dot clear, then we'll do, server message um, file ID error dot serialize into mute send buff and then we can do socket send to this takes a reference to the send buff and it'll take the source. So this will send a packet. So um, send the uh, file error response. Forty one mute send buff. Uh, writer's not implemented for that. Let's implement writer for vector. Basic uh, writer implementation for vectors of bytes. Uh, impl writer for vec u8 fn write mute self buff ref u8 option. This returns sum always, and then this is simple self dot extend from slice of buff done done. Okay, not done. Uh, none error, not implemented for that. Unwrap if the serialization fails. So that's gonna send a response back. So now we're gonna get a file ID error and we'll go and we'll send it back. 
So on this side, um, it is going to wait for a packet. So UDP.receive. Um, we're going to get the packet and the UDP payload. And here you can loop. And eh, while this is none, while that's none, then we can do this. Print got UDP 02x UDP. Okay, I uh, expected an option. Um, we'll just return none. That'll cause it to get filtered out. Um, it doesn't know the type for that, so we'll just say an empty. Uh, shit. Some... Okay, that'll filter for our port. We'll only get packets for our port. And we got our response back, and here's the payload. It's a one, so let's deserialize the payload. Fuck yeah, dude. Um, server message, deserialize, UDP payload, I think. just dot payload deserialize the payload got to ref that expected mute oh yeah uh, let's mute pointer is equal to UDP dot payload mute pointer uh, expect failed to deserialize um, file ID response print this will give a file ID. Uh, this is the message. Print the message. Return sum. And here we go. So we are going to send a message to open a file. And it sends a file ID error back. So if, while that is none, um, so, uh, deserialize the message. Now, we're going to say if the pointer, or if the message is, uh, match message, server message, file ID error, we're going to return a sum False, indicating we had an error. Server message uh, file ID. In this case, I'll be some none. This will return a file I file ID and file size. This we can return a sum file ID file size. Okay. Uh, everything else is unreachable in this state, so they should never happen, and that handles the packets. That'll cause the while loop to break. Um, and I think we'll do... Uh, oops, server message. Okay. All right. Uh, expected tuple found option. Yep. Uh, we want to do a sum sum. Sum sum. Why Rust? Because um, it's a safe language that has high level constructs and the performance of C and C++. Are the main reasons. And it's easily used for operating system development. Alright. While that, then that returns none. And I want this to... 
Um, I can do a loop. I don't know if that's the best syntax, but um, message uh, file ID is equal to um, loop EDP receive if let sum is equal to this break x god damn we're good god damn we're good that returned a none okay let's make a file touch what file is it requesting Just could lie. Uh, DDIF is dev, you random, OF is, and I forgot the name, uh, foo bar dot bin, count, uh, block size is 4096, count is eight, so eight pages to that file. Now, if we run the server, we should not get a none back. Uh, yeah, that prints that message and it doesn't send a response. Perfect. So what we want to do here, um, um, I'm trying to figure out how I want to do that. Uh, I wonder which is the worst OS dev in JavaScript or Go. Uh, I would say JavaScript. Go, Go, you can actually do OS dev in relatively easily. It's not perfect, but you can. Um, Okay, so that parses out the message. Hmm. Go isn't bad, but it's on the other end of the spectrum in terms of high level. Yeah, it's pretty high level. It's pretty is pretty brutal for the, for uh, OS Dev. It it works, but it's not. It's not ideal. Ah, oh, fuck. Uh, I'm trying to think if I want to make a helper for this, and I think I do. Um, I think I want to make a receive timeout. We're going to implement this same shape so many fucking times. I think it's time we make a receive timeout that we implement on UDP. Um, pub fn receive t... F self funk F yields option T uh, Y P receive timeout that returns an option T that allows us to filter then we flatten attempt um let timeout is equal to time future uh timeout timeout u64 and this is um attempts to read uh, attempts to receive a UDP packet on the bound port um, in a loop for a given timeout in microseconds. If 
Okay. So then what we can do is we can loop. We're going to receive if let sum sum val is equal to this val return val return sum val uh use crates time 128 so we're going to get access to this We call this function that returns that returns an option T. We have an option T. We then unwrap that. If Ooh, that's an FN once. Uh, where FN implements copy. I can't I can't change that into a fuck. I can't I guess I can do a f mute but then I have to promote all of these which makes me a sad panda. Well, that can be a fun once. I think 128 uh, receive UDP from mute. One nineteen. I don't think it breaks anything to do this. Cannot borrow as mutable, of course. It actually only matters on receive UDP in this case, I think. One twenty eight. Moved. But am I being stupid? Does this want to be that? Yes, it does. It do, it do. It's an immutable reference to an F. Oh, fuck, we're good. Receive timeout. Set a timeout. If CPU RDTSC exceeds the timeout, return none. Um, compute the timeout, the RDTSC, uh, the TSC value at the timeout. This is a uh, check if we have timed out. Um, attempt to receive a packet. Uh, packet successfully received. Uh, return it out. Fuck yes. Now in DHCP timeout, this shit goes away. This shit goes away. Response is equal to... Oh, fuck yeah. Resp. What is it supposed to be? That's on some other shit. Um, we receive... Oh, and we save everything in the closure. Receive timeout. 
One second. Uh, DSP timeout. So then we invoke this closure and oh, oh that's so nice and that just indicates that we handled it oh my god same thing here bind receive timeout uh, DSP timeout Fuck yeah. Easy. DHP no longer needs time. Fuck yes. Let's go, boys. It got the request. Oh, that means the DHP lease stuff worked. Oh my god. That is a nice cleanup there. I'm allergic to chocolate. I had to manually change it to uh, <laughs> change the name of the project. We'll just call it milk <laughs> for you. Oh my god, receive with a timeout. If it exceeds the timeout, return none. Otherwise, only return some val if we successfully got the value. In which case, we return a T, which is given by the user. They can filter packets. Oh. Beautiful. 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 Let message is equal to UDP.receive timeouts one second then we have a closure we have a packet here god this is so fucking nice man I don't think my DHP stuff is actually checking for the timeout I need to add that question mark expect Failed to parse. Uh, no response. Ah, we'll just question mark it. We return a none here. That will return out. And we won't print file ID. And here we'll print... Uh, print mapping state. This. And this will be the bool. Mapping is sum. So we'll see if that succeeds. You gotta fix up a bunch of shit here that I didn't do rightly. Um, wow, that actually was here. File eighty fifty nine. Okay. Okay, file ID not found at 59. That's fair. And then here we'll print uh, print the message. Some none, some that. All right. One second. Mapping state false because it timed out. Hell yeah. Now in DHCP, we got to make sure that we're actually using this timeout value. We'll put a question mark after that and a question mark after that. And that guarantees that we're checking that value. How long have you been doing programming? 15 years. Um, you look 20 though. I'm 26. Fuck yeah, that's nice. Fuck yeah. 
Oh my god, if we don't get the response, we return the nun. And then if we request an invalid one, foobaffer. None. That printed none? I'm gonna double question mark that shit. Hmm? That's like, hmm? -hmm. Now, on a file ID error, that'll return out. And this will only work. So on a file ID error, it'll just return out early. We won't see the none print. So this is um, wait for the um, response packet. Dude, this is so clean. What a great networking stack. God damn it, this is nice. All right, uh, we're going to go to... Um, now, in this case, we want to send... We want to load that file. You know what? We're going to make a database. Uh, let mute file db is equal to a hash map new, and this is going to contain a hash map u64 to evacuate. And this is a uh, map from file IDs to the contents. We will latch this in before sending a response. Um... Okay. So, what we want to do is if file name starts with curder, I literally called it dir, curder, if it does not start with this, send the error response. I don't like that code duplication, but I don't think we're gonna beat that. Hash map. Use standard collections. Hash map. Curter, ref that. Um, jail the file name to the current directory. Uh, serialize the message, and then we send, we send the error. In this case, there's no error, okay. So this way, if I do path escaping, it'll yell at me. So now it's secure. Technically, I should jailed in some other direct, uh, directory, but we'll hash. What? Um, probably do fault hasher and, um, new hash that and then finish it. And that gives us a pretty sure U64 on a finish. It does. So we're going to do, we're going to pull in hasher. Okay, we'll pull in both of these. Okay. Uh, it's gonna be the file ID. What is what a zinger? Let's file. Uh, let me. Hasher is equal to 
default hasher new um and then file name dot hash mute hasher can't hash on that tooster tooster on wrap Okay, uh, let file ID is equal to uh, hasher dot finish. Um, compute the file ID by hashing the file name or the file path in this case, because it's the whole path. Um, Okay, we hash, we finish, and then we will load that. Um, if file, if the file database does not contain the key related to this file ID, then file db dot insert file ID uh, standard fs read uh, file name. This is load the file uh, into the database. Uh, actually, here we're going to do entry. Um, dot or insert this. And then let file. Oops, file is equal to this um, if it ha uh, updates the file database. Uh, insert. insert into the file database if needed. Okay, beautiful. So that will insert it by reading it from the disk. Now that means it's fixed in the disk and we won't reload it, which means we have the same version every time. Um, what have you used to wrap your head around the headphones? Uh, uh, it's a sock. <laughs> it's nice. It's, it's fancy. It was the easiest uh, padding mechanism I had. Um, okay, now we send, send the file ID response. And this will be a file ID and file ID is equal to file ID and the file len size, length, size, file size, ID and len. And this is equal to file.len as u64. Then we're going to serialize that, and then we'll send the response back. Um, and we're going to change that to id length. OK, and this, on this side, on the net mapping, we just have the id and this, the len. I called it size, didn't I? It's size. Fuck yeah. Never returns, of course not. Okay, send the response packet. ID size. Size. One liner now? Oh, hell yeah. Oh, that's clean. 
Okay, so here we go. Fuck. Um. Send. Oh, oh, oh! We have a we have a fucked uh, uh file name. We fucked our name intentionally. Fubar up bin. It's about to say. This is definitely gonna work. Here we go. There is the file ID and the length. The length of the file. Uh, Fubar is three two seven six eight. Woo! Woo! Fucking easy, guys. Um. Uh. Sound like Ric Flair now. I don't know who Ric Flair is. Is that something I want to strive for or not? <laughs> I, I don't I don't do I don't do sports, man. I just code. Are we grim? Holy shit! Thank you so much for the raid. Woo! How was your stream, man? How was your stream? Oh, holy shit! All those Twitch raid bombs. Those are dope. Good, good. How are you? Pretty good. Been banging out some code. We uh, we've got a. Uh, we're trying to set up some, we're trying to set up a basic file server, and we just got it responding, so I can now request a file name, and now next, I want it, well, it tells me the size, so I actually know from this, um, file ID and size, and I can cache that information into here. Uh, file ID of the open file on the server. And... <laughs> Cash Money Millionaire. Net mapping. Base, vert, adder, zero. We haven't picked a base yet. Net is the... Net device, which is net dev. And the file ID um, I think that's literally file ID and then I guess we'll give the size of the file as size and this is the um, size u64 uh, size of the file in bytes Okay, 65. Now return to net mapping. Move out of net dev happens at UDP at 35. Core mem drop UDP. That releases my UDP bind. I kind of don't want to do that. I would like to move UDP into here, but I don't think I can. There's like no, there's no good way of representing that because I want to, UDP has a reference to um, NetDev and it would not be aware that that is borrowed out of NetDev, which sucks. Um, and why is that borrowed on a NetDev? Why, we could arc that. We could throw an arc on our UDP. The bind UDP. Because that's not an operation to do frequently, so it's not that big of a deal. And that would allow us... That would allow us to get rid of the... Um, that arc requirement. We're always going to have an arc. Yeah, we're going to do that. We're going to have UDP bind is going to be an arc on the net device. And that means this will get rid of these uh, lifetimes. And this will still drop. They'll still unbind from the device. And then we can get rid of all these lifetimes. In fact, this actually... Um, 
Oh, shit. I don't know if I can do a... Uh... So this will return a UDP bind, but I have no way of having an arc of myself because this will fail. I can't. I don't think uh, 249. I don't think I am allowed to do that in Rust because that has to take in an arc. That's an associated function, but I think I turned this into an object. Yeah. Net device. Right? I implement device for net device. Maybe I'm fine. Because I already have this. Yeah. And new. Okay, so I'll take an arc self. It'll return a UDP bind. And this will be on uh, cur. Cur. Uh, this will be self bind UDP port uh, cur port. Same thing here. Cur arc self. Um, 250. Cur UDP binds. I think that's it though. associated function, and then self. This is cur, so we'll move the device into there. And DHCP, let's see if we can fix this, 321. This is now net device, bind EDP port. Ah, fuck. I just don't want to have to make arcs everywhere. Um. Because then get lease would need to take an arc. I mean, arcs are pretty cheap, right? They're not that expensive. I think it's... Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I think it is best for the, um, uh, device that clone, uh, 68. So bind to this UDP port, no arc for this, use alloc sync arc. Okay, 26 in net. Yep, and then this will take, wrap the net device in an arc. Oh, that's fucking weird. Then I can't set the DHP lease. Well, that's annoying. I don't want to put that behind a lock either. Hmm. Ah. <sighs> And I can't turn a reference into an arc. That one requires an arc due to the bind. Really, anywhere that we bind EDP, 
Means we're passing around a lot of arcs now. Um, which works. I mean, that, that works 100%. But, uh... I don't want to put that DTP lease in a lock cell, but I think I'm going to have to. That's really annoying. I mean... I really need to make a set once structure so I'm not using locks on these things um, where things like block on until they're initialized. And then net mapping, let's comment out this whole thing for now. Well. Impl net mapping, net device get, we can just bind EDP because we're only ever going to use the EDP on here. Yeah, I think this is still worth it. And this will be a net device. Okay, I suspected this was going to happen. 207 doesn't need to be mutable, of course not. 219 can assign, 231. Borrow of mute value cur. Um... Yes. That wasn't too bad. And then this one, move out of that. EDP binds. Um, core mem drop EDP binds. See you around, Meta Construct. Thanks for stopping by. Hope you had fun. Uh, release the lock on the EDP binds. Okay, 39 on net mapping. Okay, that's fine. Net mapping, we'll just clone this. Ref that net dev. Uh, cannot assign. Yep, that's the only problem at this stage. So we're gonna have to, unfortunately, DHP lease will be locked. And lock interrupts. Just a single. And this will be a uh, lock cell new. DHP lease. Fuck. Yeah, maybe I should make a. Maybe I should make a, a like an init once or something like that. Mm. Dot lock. Deref that. Store it there. Sixty-three in net. DHP lease. Lock. Uh, here we can do. Let lease is equal to this. Let you DHP lease is equal to DHP uh, ND dot DHP lease dot lock. DHP lease is lease. Um. Sign the lease. 
Here we can say if the DHP lease is some. Okay, 290. <sighs> Fuck. I guess we can. Yeah, we want to Azref that. ARP. Kernel source net ARP. DHP lease. Lock. Lock. Those are moved out. 222. Two, two. Borrow of ND happens here. Move out occurs here. You can just rescope that. Kind of wasn't expecting that. Uh, 117, we never use receive. Yeah, we only use receive timeout. Uh, allow unused. Okay, so now we can return, instead of a net device, this is the UDP. UDP. This is now just a UDP, and this is um, a UDP port, which uh, we are bound to and capable and able to receive and send uh, from. Receive to and send from. Receive from and send to. Okay, net, pull in UDP here. Then this, instead of net, we'll just have UDP. The net dev can get dropped. And now we have access to that. Uh, it's not actually called UDP, it's UDP bind. Sixty-eight. Expected arc found UDP bind. Oh yeah, it's just a UDP bind that includes the arc. Yeah, buddy. Uh, 67, drop UDP. Fuck yeah. Okay, we did it. So now, while that mapping exists, we have that port bound on the NIC, and that can't get unbound. Now, that means that we can, we can start, holy shit, guys, we're like really close. Uh, don't need noodle net mapping. We do need okay. So now we're gonna impl impl deref for uh net mapping type target is equal to a slice. So this will allow us to deref this, and we will do fn deref self return ref self target. And this will be unsafe. Um, I can just make that ref. This is the backing memory for the uh, mapping. And this will literally just be a slice that'll live for as long as this lives for, which is as long as the caller gives it. Uh, comment all this shit out. But that should be valid. Uh, impl a, a, okay. And this will return a self. Fuck yeah. So now we need to reserve virtual memory, kernel source um, mm, and alloc vert 4k. So we're going to allocate, will this assert that it's 4k aligned? It will. So we will align up the size. Let's um, 
let vert adder is equal to mm alloc vert adder 4k size plus oh and we'll say if size is less than or equal to zero return none um nothing to map then here we'll do size plus ox fff we can do check dad so we're going to check dad fffff and not ox fff that's going to page line up the size so allocate uh, virtual memory capable of holding the file. So check that FFF, and then we and it down to 4K align that size. All right, so now that we're at that stage, that's pretty good. Now we can return an unsafe, and this is actually mute. We're going to return unsafe core slice from raw parts mute. And this will be vert uh, vert adder dot zero as mute u8 for size. and specifically for the size of the file. Yes! Oh my god. Uh, unused, A mute. I typed an oot. An oot. Somewhere. MM trade. Um, oh, no comma. Uh, size. Try into... Fuck yeah. Use core, convert, try into... Oh, yeah, 74, try into, okay. Noise. Um, okay, so now, uh, DRF, that's core ops. Use core ops, DRF, DRF, mute. Bam. This is not unsafe anymore. This is just self dot uh, base. And this will be self dot base as well. This is a mute. Mute self, DRF mute. No target, DRF mute. Uh. Got to give these lifetimes. So that reference lives as long as the structure does, which is true. T is not found in the scope. Yep, this is actually uh, U8. Fuck yeah, vert adder not used. Okay, so this means I now get a net mapping, and I can do... Um, Expect uh, failed to net map file. And I can do mapping print mapping. And this should page fault. Um, we'll just do mapping zero. Uh, mapping five. Doesn't matter. So this should page fault. So we'll get an exception handler. Uh, oh, non preemptible lock on interrupts 326. Let's take a look at where we are. Kernel source interrupts. 326. Yeah, we're going to have to start. Oh, page fault handlers. This is a lock no preempt. Yep, 
Nice, page fault. And we're trying to access CR2, which is that value. So now I need to register and interrupt uh, page fault handler. So, um, why are you so transparent? So the, yeah, the codes weren't easily seen. Cares about the content being seen more than himself. It's, tr it's true. It's true. It's what y'all are here for. It's the content. I'm a content creator. <laughs> um, we're gonna do a uh, pub fn register. Um, How am I gonna do this? How am I gonna do this? I need a way to register this page fault handler, but I also need a way to have the page fault handler get removed. Uh, and to do that, I have a vector of these guys. I will return a, I can't return an index to the vector because it's not always in that same location. So that kind of makes that difficult there. I need to hydrate, holy shit. Okay. So, how do I remove a page fault handler from here? I guess I will box the the. So I have a net mapping. I want to implement page fault handler on this. No, we'll actually make another. The page fault handler that we make will be different. Then. How do I lease out something in that structure? See, I won't know which one to remove from the vector. I could put it in an arc, and then when I remove a handler, ha. I want I want something that when it gets dropped it'll remove the the page fault handler but I don't buck I can register a box that's easy Something that implements page fault handler. Ah. God damn. I don't have a great way of doing that. Gotta manage my Tibby characters. Hmm. What's going to be the trick here? I like a couple different ways I could go about doing this. Um, but I, I, I don't know.
Well, I know the reference of the thing that I'm removing. I could potentially, I could use arcs and then when the arc strong count goes to zero, I would know that I can remove that arc. But that seems a little hacky, so I don't like it. Um, I don't know. I'm going to hit the head. I'll be right back. Right. Um. Ah, this is still rough, man. So ba basically, the problem is I want to be able to register a fault handler, and then I want that fault handler to get automatically unregistered when I'm done with it. Um. But I don't know what handler I installed. Uh, I can go by the pointer of the box. I can save the pointer of the box. And I can use that to unregister a fault handler. Let's try that. Um, so we're going to have, we have to implement another structure, pub struct uh, netmap handler. And this is a um, structure to handle uh, network net mapping uh, page faults. So this is going to have, quite frankly, net mapping doesn't need access to that. Don't need the size of the file and bytes either, because that's encoded in the in the base. Well, I guess we'll put it up there, and then here we can do vert adder. Um, virtual address of the 
uh, base of the mapping. What is this language? This is Rust. Um, use page table net mapping. Oops. Whoops. Page table vert address. Get my get my thoughts all mixed up now. 83. Okay, that doesn't exist. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna create that virtual address. Let's netmap handler is equal to netmap handler. Uh, create a um, fault handler entry. And here. Okay, I think I think I have it figured out. Um, we're gonna create a fault handler. Uh, uh, they call it base. Ver vatter. Probably call it vatter. That's what I always do, I think. Yes, sir. File ID, UDP size. Uh, if I have one of them like that, I like doing all of them like that. Just for consistency. I don't always do it like that, but uh, I've been trying to recently and I like it a lot more. And then net mapping. This will just be a, a tuple struct. And that'll contain that. Uh, that's definitely unsafe still. Okay, net mapping, that's now unhappy. And this is the contents of the mapped file. And then this is self.0, and this is self.0. Okay. Now. What I want to do is I want to impl uh, pub pub fn register uh, fault handler. This will take in uh, handler. This will be a box that implements the dyn page fault handler. So any type that implements a page fault handler can be used as an argument. We will then return a um, fault registration. Um, register a page fault handler. And here we'll do page fault handlers dot lock dot push handler let handler is equal to uh, handler uh, I kind of want it into raw but I don't want to I want to get the address into raw that consumes it um Handler, I can't, I can't do that because it doesn't know the type, does it? As you size, as, as a const dyn page fault handler as you size. Yeah, that's a thick pointer. Okay. Unsafe box into raw of the handler. Um, and then this will be a box from raw handler. That just gets me access to the pointer. Then we'll do a uh, pub struct fault reg 
This is a uh, uh, fault handler registration. Uh, allows the fault handler to be removed when the fault reg goes out of when the fault reg is dropped. Uh, dropped. Okay. So the fault reg. This literally just has a mute dine page fault handler. Pretty sure. That's what it's going to have, because this is going to be the return value from this, which will be a uh, fault reg handler. God damn right. Uh, impl drop for fault reg. Fn drop mute self. Uh, let fault handlers is equal to page fault handlers dot lock and then mute and then here we can say um uh, fault handlers dot uh what is it filter is it filter there's drain filter retain that's what I want retain only that's uh, are specified by the predicate. So here we'll say only retain things where the following is true. And the following is that box into raw of x. Yeah, I want the I want the pointer from there and I can't do that. How the fuck do I get the pointer to that box? How did I get that box? That address from the box. That curly brace is living on the edge. This one? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. Um... Leak. Consumes and leaks the box. Mm. Let me try it. Uh, Play.rust lang.org struct uh, struct foo um, uh, fn main print uh, let foo is box new foo um, trait baz Impl baz for foo. This box takes a dine to foo. We're going to print the pointer for the foo. I don't know if I can do this. Empty trait. Not a trait. Yep, baz is the trait. Is that actually the pointer to foo? E32. Foo 5. Okay. And that should be equal to box into raw of foo. And put some new lines on these biatches. <laughs> Backspace. <laughs> or 
Okay, so then foo, I will do, I wanna print x, and in this case, I wanna do as const dine baz. Uh, can I do that? Yeah, okay. I don't know why I wasn't doing that. Um, that means I don't need the unsafe here as well. So fault reg is going to be this. Okay, so we got handler. Um, let pointer is equal to this handler as mute dine page fault handler. Or we can do const, it doesn't matter in this case. Fault reg, pointer, register that fault handler, 40. Okay, then we're going to retain const. Um, so anything that, that has that boxed up and then we're going to retain things which are not at that location, which will be, at this point, x is a um, reference to a box of a dying page fault handler. If I'm not mistaken, I will strongly type that. Just so it's very fucking clear what we're doing. Okay, then we're gonna say, if DRF, DRF, X, ref, uh, let handler, uh, const dine page fault handler is equal to DRF, DRF, X. That should be good. Okay, now we're gonna say if handler is not equal to uh, if self.0 is not equal to the handler, then we want to retain it. So um, lock access to the fault handlers, and then this is um, drop, uh, drop any fault handler, which uses the same uh, uh, pointer, should only ever be one. Okay, technically not on safe code. So that'll cause the fault handler to get dropped. Here we register it, and then that gives us a fault reg. So now we can go into net mapping. Um, doop, doop, doop. So now in net mapping, we can pull in uh, use crates interrupts. And we'll do interrupts down here. When we make a net mapping, this is going to have, I'll uh, we'll pull in self. Eh, fuck it. We'll pull in. Register fault handler and fault reg. Okay, so now this is going to have a fault reg and then we'll register. When we create our net mapping, we will register a fault handler for handler. box new, so I'll create the fault handler entry, and then use alloc box box. 90 doesn't implement page fault handler. Okay, impl page fault handler for net map handler. Uh, unsafe fn page fault uh, fault address is equal to the vert adder 
return a bool if it's handled. If it's not handled, we return false. So this should uh, expects a mute self. Got it. This should page fault. Beautiful. But we should be able to see this uh, panic. Uh, page fault at x fault address dot zero. So this is going to say that we had a page fault at this address, which means that that hook is in place. Fuck yeah. So now what we can do is um, let end is equal to self dot vatter dot zero plus self dot size. Um, Um, in this case, size. We'll do let size align is equal to this. And then this will be size align. So that will uh, 4K line up the size. And then size will be size align here. So 30. Okay, then we can do uh, end is equal to this size minus one. Uh, compute the ending virtual address for our mapping. And then we can say if self dot, if the fault address is greater than or equal to the, um, our own virtual address. And I think I have partial eek on that. Let's see if we do, or partial org. Beautiful. Okay, if the fault address is less than that, and then we can do vert adder here. And uh, we can say if the faulting address is less than that, or eh, it doesn't fucking matter. We'll do, we'll do this. Um, if the faulting address is greater than or equal to the base, and the faulting address is less than the less than or equal to the end, then um, this fault occurred in our uh, region, in our mapping. Else, it did not, in which case we return false. So at this stage, panic um, belongs to us. And I'm just going to pretty print these quick, self.vatter.0 and end. And those should be sane. Um n.0 okay so this will hopefully tell me the bounds perfect and that looks correct that's 32k right there so the faults occurred in our mapping in this case then what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to map in this memory tldr we're gonna we're gonna want to map in this memory. So uh, to do that, let's take a look at how we do that here. Page table, get access to the page table, map some shit, get pmem. Here we go. So we're gonna get access to physical memory, and then. The virtual address will be dot zero and not OXFFF to 4K align it. So when we have a page fault, and then this maps, uh, map raw actually, that's what we want. What's up, uh, what's up Supercuber? We're gonna map raw virtual address. Um, page type 4K. Then, the physical address, we'll just map in null. Page NX, page write, page present. Expect, expect, failed to map in, uh, not Rick mapped memory. Okay, so 
So from page table, we'll pull in page NX, page right, and page present. And what's this one for? That's fizzcontig. Perfect. Just wanted to make sure. 45, a virtual address. This should be self vatter zero and not that to run it down to the nearest page boundary. We're going to pull in mm physical memory. Use create mm physical memory. Get us access to physical memory. Page type coming from here. Okay. And what do we got here? 42. Unwrap. All right, expected a bool. At this stage, we mapped it in and it succeeded. So this should now print the result. Uh, attempted to take, uh, that's a net mapping 41. The page table lock is not preemptible. Okay, bootloader source main net mapping um <laughs> what's up desu how's it going fuck uh bootloader bootloader uh page table um do 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 one second here Okay, uh, page table, colon. Isn't this where it's set up? Uh, what? That's, uh, good args. They're set up. Oh, um, uh, shared boot arg source. I do them here. So, page table. We have to be able to uh, use that in an interrupt. 255. So that's, that's the contents at that memory. We haven't, we haven't mapped anything valid in yet. So we're gonna allocate a page. Uh, page is equal to pmem.alloc fizz, right? Alloc fizz. This takes a layout from size align 4K and 4K. Um, that's on the layout, and then we'll do another one here. Expect uh, failed to get free page for um, uh, network mapped memory. So we're going to allocate a page. Allocate a page. Okay, alloc fizz not found on that. Yep, we can pull a lot of this shit in. We're going to want um, fizz mem. And we want layouts use core alec layout no alec fizz found for pmem oh page table fizz mem my bad Page table fizz mem. Just went over. Use page table colon colon this. <laughs> Good news, everyone. I, uh, yesterday I slept for 17 hours. After skipping one night, hell yeah. Good news, everyone. After finally, I finally updated a button in the website's header. All it took is five pull requests in three different repositories. Congratulations, that's a, that's a big deal right there. 
Alec Fizz. Expect. Uh, that panics if we're oom. So we're going to allocate a page. Now we have a page. Then we're going to use that page as the physical address for this mapping. And then we're going to initialize that page with um, the contents of our, uh, of our request. So we're going to do... Holy shit, it's happening, guys. Uh, Self.udp. Um, we're going to do a create UDP uh, targeted at the server. Am I saving the server? Nope, but I will need to be. So this is a request the uh, uh, file of contents at this offset, in which case we will create UDP for that server. And then we just want to whack a server in here, which is a UDP address. Um, address of the server we are communicating with. Fuck yeah. 124 missing server, server colon server. 43, no packet in this scope. Yep, we gotta allocate a packet off the network device. Um, and I think we'll have to make an accessor in kernel source net. Oops. Kernel source net to get us access to the net device, the raw device on the UDP bind. I can just make that pub because it's not mutable. And you'll never have a... I guess you could replace that device. Um, okay, uh, pub pub fn device self returns access to the ref device. Uh, that's a net device, and that's a yeah, it's actually a net device. Okay, get access to the network the net device that this UDP um, is bound to, that this UDP bind is bound to, and then this will be self.device, and we'll just ref it. Okay, so now that means I can do self.udp.device allocate packet 44 server, this is on self. Holy shit. Now, we're making a request to read. I want to read memory. And uh, I want to read at file ID. This is self.file ID. Offset is the... Uh, uh, this is the fault adder dot zero and not OFFF minus fault adder dot zero. And finally, we have the size, which is a fixed 4K. We're going to serialize that packet, and then we're going to send that request. And we're going to flush on that request. So we're going to say, I need that response. 50 net dev. Correct. This is on UDP device send. Self.udp device send. This should build. Um, move out a packet occurs here. Yep, we just have to scope the creation of the packet, but that'll create that, that'll serialize that in place. Um, okay, um, Intel Nick uh, 657. So all of these locks that we make, um, 
SP kernel source net intel nic lock cell. Basically, every lock cell that we create in here, RX state, TX state, these are no preempt, which will disable, disable interrupts while we have these locks held and packets as well. Preempt. Okay, that should fix up those errors. <gasps> Unhandled packet read! Woo Woo now we just have to send that shit back. Name of this theme, it's just the default Vim theme. Holy shit, guys. May I get back? All right. Um, so now we have to implement that in the server. So we'll do a uh, server message read ID offset size. And so the question is, do I want to pad on my side of things? So it's not always 4K, right? If the file is not exactly 4K aligned, uh, the question is, do I want to pad on my side? And I think the answer is no. What I'm going to do is on a read request, uh, I will send... Here's the response. And, ooh, I really don't want that to create a vector. Um, if I just have it fixed size, uh, What am I gonna do here? Uh, this is on folk TP. Our read response is just gonna be an option. U8 for what's the largest? 1472. Uh, so we'll do 1472 minus some overhead. Um, Actually, what's 4,096 divided by 3? 1,365. So, 1,366. Um, read, uh, read response from the server. This will be padded out to this will be padded out to uh padded out with zeros until the size of the request is filled unless i don't want to use this and i don't want to do the read response and i just want to Hmm. Yeah, I want to read those bytes directly into that physical memory. Really fucking bad. And to do that... I think I might have a server. Um, uh, 
Okay. I think this is going to be, um... Read okay. Uh, indicates that the read is valid. And there are, um... There are UDP frames following this... There are UDP frames following this packet containing containing um, the raw bytes for the size requested. Indicates that the read is valid and there are UDP frames following. And that way we don't encapsulate them um, and we can just use the full UDP frame. Uh, that'll r allow us to reduce the number of frames we send uh, to a maximal amount. And then read error um, indicates that reading f uh, the file failed. Okay, so now read OK, read error. Now on a read, we're going to say, I'm just going to say a read error. And we're just going to serialize that shit out. Okay, so that means on this side of things, I'm going to pull for a packet. And that is simple. We just do uh, self.edp.receive timeouts one second. Um, receive timeout. Okay, and we have a the packet and the UDP message. And what we're going to want to do here is we want to parse that server message deserialize UDP. Um, question mark. Uh, let response is equal to this. And then I'm just going to print the response. to see what we get here uh, and how do we do that down here UDP.payload oh yeah we got to make it into a pointer and then we can deserialize it so oops deserialize mute pointer And then here we'll say, match deserialize, question mark. Uh, we'll just do let message is equal to this for now. Uh, panic message. Okay, and doesn't know the type on that. But we'll do some, just so it knows. What's up, Lord Dankenton? How's it going? Boo. Uh, preemptible lock on net 322. UDP binds, okay. New, no preempt. Uh, MM273. That is free list, which is in kernel source corex. Free list. No preempt on that one. Okay. Net 298. It's like all this shit. I was suspecting this was going to happen. Uh, no preempt. So this is why we 
kind of redid locks earlier because I knew we were going to have to change a bunch of these. All right, read error. So we got a read error back from the server, uh, which is great because that's what we send it. So what we'll do is if let sum sliced is equal to, um, what are lock improvements did we do? We got rid of uh, the concept of try locks and requiring that if you're in an exception that you have to do a try lock. Um, and now what happens is if you are in an exception and only in an exception, we will attempt to take the lock for about a second. And if we cannot get the lock within a second, then we panic. Uh, cause we know that we can panic at any point in this kernel. Like a panic is the safest thing that we can do. Um, so that's, uh, basically what we do now because the, the try, the try stuff was just going to mean we're going to implement our own loops where we try and get the lock anyways. So, yes, it's a DOS keyboard uh, with Cherry MX Blues. Okay, so we're going to read uh, that, and then we're going to slice down the payload. Uh, and this is also based on the ID. So we're going to let... Um, I, I want to chain all these things together. Yeah. Let, um, let slice is equal to... Um, file db dot get id dot and then x dot get offset dot dot offset plus size. So this will get us access to the file for that id. Um, so attempt attempt to get access to the uh, file contents at the requested location and then if we fail of course we won't have that be true and this will be sliced is equal to sliced else read error and in the other case we will send a read okay um 80 uh offsets as you size I think I try into those. I think I think I already handle that stuff. So ID, this is U size, U size, U size. I serialize based on U64s and then I try into to convert it back. Okay, net mapping, uh, 133, vert adder, size align in this case as U64, so we up promote it there. 48 offset as U size. 140 expected U64. Yeah, that's fine. That'll take a U size. Perfect. Uh, 37. Oh boy. Oh boy. Oh boy. Um, that one's at 37. They're... All right, so now this is going to uh, 66 file len. Tempted to add with overflow at 80. Cool. Something's fucked. Um, offset. Oh, wait. Yes, we do that backwards. Fault address minus the page line fault address, and that is the offset into our allocation. Oh, not fault address. Oh my god, what what am I doing? I do want that. I want the offset into that minus the self.vatter. So subtract off the faulting address, rounded down to the nearest page, and then we get that offset. So that Subtracted with overflow makes sense. 
This should not fail in that way anymore. And we get a read OK. That means we were able to successfully read those. Now we're not sending the bytes. So what we're going to do now is we're going to do a uh, for chunk in sliced dot chunks. Uh, 1472, maximum size of a UDP packet. Um, Sockets.send to chunk source, and this is uh, send the contents. And I think chunks will return, the last one will be uh, a partial, which is good. So then here we're going to expect failed to get. Um, uh, I guess if it times out, we could uh, request it again, because that could be a packet drop case. So I think what we'll do is uh, for blank in 0 0.20. Right, that's the number of attempts we're going to make to request this. I don't know, fuck it, 100. We're, we're going to go down hard if we fail here. So request the file contents at this offset. So we send the packet. Then this is a wait for a success. Um, and then here we can match this directly. And we can say server message. Uh, I'm just I'm using a match here, and if let actually works here just fine, but I'm using a match just for the um, the uh, clarity here. Okay, so this is a read OK, and on a read OK, we're gonna return sum, indicating success. On a server message read error, we're gonna panic could not satisfy network mapping. Uh, could not satisfy sat is satisfy network uh, mapping read. Everything else is unreachable. Okay. So if we had an explicit error, then we return sum. Or if we had read OK, we returned sum. If we have a read error, then we couldn't satisfy the read, um, and we panic, because that's a hard error. The server is actively responding, fuck off. Um, otherwise, unreachable for everything else. And then unwrap. That'll tell us if we, could, uh, if we got the packets. This is um, if this is some break. And this is uh, got a read OK. All right. Perfect. Yes, that got a read OK. So if it is some, that panics there. Send that request. So we're going to try 100 times. Got to read. Well, um, actually, we're going to do if none, uh, retry, continue. So that will resend. That'll retransmit that allocate. Uh, retransmit the request. Man, this looks like shit. I need to. Uh, um. Let offset is equal to this. Um. Compute. Check if this. Uh, faults happened in our mapping range, and then this is going to be compute 
the offset into the uh, physical, uh, the offset into the mapping that this fault represents and page align it. Then here we'll pass offset. Oh, that looks so much better. It's like a load off my shoulders. Uh, create UDP, send a read request for 4,096 bytes. And then we wait for success. If we get a success, if we don't get a success, then we uh, do a retransmit. Um, then, uh, now we just want the raw data. So we want to allocate a page here. So let, let page is equal to this. And then, can deserialize get malformed data? Uh, yes, it can get malformed data. I mean, it'll it'll just return none. the uh, the serial The deserialization will fail, so we'll hit the question, which will then cause us to return none from the receive, which will basically throw the packet in the trash, which means we'll hit the timeout. Technically, I should just fail right away on that rather than uh, timing out. Okay, uh, get access to physical memory. And this is allocate the backing, allocate the backing page for the um, uh, mapping. Okay. 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 Do do do. Setting on my tibia characters. Sorry if we had server server reset. Okay. So um, get access to physical memory, allocate a page. Um Okay, that gives us access to a page. And this should succeed just fine. Uh, page.0, oh, yep. One line? Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah, it's one line. Bam. Reset. Okay, so that'll print zero. We allocate fizz. So now, now we want to receive the bytes. Um, and we expect. Now we expect three packets containing. I guess the size here is not always 4,096. The size is the 
the uh the the smaller between the core compare min between uh and yeah we'll say like uh let mute to receive is equal to core compare min the smaller of the two 4096 and then the self dot size minus offset correct if the offset is and the offset always has to be in bounds so self size is the size of the file in bytes offset is the offset into that location okay so we should be fine here uh, compute the number of bytes we expect to receive and then to receive on this so we say we want to receive that many bytes okay then while to receive is greater than zero We want to receive messages. Uh, if self.edp receive timeout one second containing a UDP, um, if this is none, uh, continue retry. Retry. All right, so if that's none, okay, so in this case, we are expecting, expecting is equal to core compare min between 4096 and to receive. Assert that edp.len is equal to expecting. And then to receive minus equals. Um, edp.len. Okay, and here I can print got this edp.len. Uh, some at that stage. Um, Uh, Pren. Ho ho, face cam today. Hell yeah, what's up? How's it going? Uh, payload. 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 All right, so. It's not equal to expecting, so we'll just print this then. Oh yeah 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 um uh 1472 uh, There we go Deadlock detected net mapping 88 uh It's just the print is hurting us That means it succeeded. Um, so, to receive, let me receive offset is equal to zero while receive offset is less than to receive make that non mute now we'll go the other way we'll do uh, receive offset plus equals the payload length we're going to assert that it's equal to what we expect and this is uh unexpected packet size i guess why would i care why wouldn't i just let it send whatever whatever chunk size if it wants to do one byte at a time fuck it um, 
Receive offset. And plus equals that. We know that that is targeted at us. Okay, so I think we'll do like loops. Loop. Let me retries is zero. Retries plus equals one. If retries is greater than a hundred, panic. Uh, failed to download. Uh, failed to download. Um, backing page. So if the retries is greater than a hundred, and now what we can do is. Once that gets to zero here, break. Uh, at this stage, uh, received everything. And this is receive the raw payload. So while the receive offset is less than to receive, add that. Um, Assert that UDP payload len is less than or equal to to receive minus receive offset. Um, whoa, uh, large unexpect unexpectedly. Larger packet than expected. <laughs> uh, assert that the payload length is less than what we're planning to receive. <laughs> Nailed it. Okay, so at that point, we know uh, print got everything. That might deadlock. Yeah, it will. MC 1500, yeah, in this case. Just because it's the default for everything. it I, I've used jumbo frames before, and it's nice because you use only one packet, but it's really fucking annoying, man, because you need to program your server, you need to configure Linux to do that. Um, yeah. Receive packets packets until receive packets until and do we have any locks right now I don't think so good yeah we don't have any locks perfect uh, receive packets until uh, we got everything we expected get access to virtual memory. Okay, and then we map that in. Now, what we wanna do is we want to, um, the receive offset, we want to write into physical memory at that location. This is all unsafe, okay. Um, core uh, slice from raw parts Mute, and we're gonna pull in the kernel source mm. We're gonna pull in the uh, fizz window base. Actually, read fizz. I think I'm gonna make these. Um, price slice fizz pub unsafe fn. It's, it's basically the same code, but this is uh, slice fizz mute. And this is going to be um, gets mutable access to a slice 
of physical memory. And that has the physical address and the size. That's going to return a ref u8. Then here we're going to say end is equal to uh, size. I guess we use u64s for these. Size checks of 1. And then that checked add the physical address base. Make sure it's inside the bounds. And if it is, then we'll return core slice from raw parts mute at this uh, u8 for size bytes. And we're just going to say that. So check sub 1 from the size. If, that, if the size is 0, we're going to panic. Uh, and then check to add the physical address base. Make sure that doesn't overflow. If it doesn't, make sure that is below the window size. If the end is less than the window size. Checks up that plus that physical window size. Oh yeah, that's the physical address. And then. Uh, return out a slice to this physical memory as mutable. Okay, then 98. Um, so up here, uh, allocated page, unsafe. Oh, we're so fucking close, guys. Um, uh, let's new page is equal to mm uh, slice physical mute at page for 4096. This is get a mutable slice to the physical memory backing the page. Uh, what's going on here? Something down here. It's unfinished, right? 97. Oh, yeah. Uh, so here, we're going to... New page... New page, the offset is the receive offset until the receive offset plus edp.payload.len dot copy from slice edp payload len uh, edp payload. This is uh, copy the payload into the uh, page and then to receive is this. Compute the number of bytes we expect to receive. Um, zero out the remainder in the page uh, to pad it with zeros. So we're going to say new page from 4096 minus to receive. No. To receive until the end is. Do I just allocate that? Do I just zero out that fucking allocation? The whole thing. Yeah, iter mute for each x, x is zero. So for everything after what we're anticipating to receive, we will zero out. MM will bring in self. 105 cannot borrow as mutable. Mute. 
mutes. Okay. So, zero out the remainder of the page. So, we're expecting to receive 4K or the size minus the offset into the, uh, the file. We then zero out the remainder of the page with zeros. We then receive the raw payload and we put those contents into the page. Only once we've received everything will we actually break out, at which point we will um, we'll lock the memory and we'll map that page in. I'm pretty sure this is done now. So I should be able to print. Um, if I hex print this mapping, uh, uh, just do this to cause the deref. This will print the contents. We don't want to do that. Uh, let's do this. This will print the contents of that file. Ah, oh, fuck. Not if, not if I shut it down. Come on. Filter map and mapped. Network map memory 127. Okay. It was doing stuff. Why? Uh, have you heard of Dow right? He's another streamer that's working on building a next-gen firewall on Python. He's a big security buff. I don't think I have. Um, shit. Okay, what is causing that mappage to fail? Let's uh let's do the what would cause that He's raided you several times. Oof. I mean, I'm not familiar with his stuff. Okay, but he's uh Uh, huh. How long has he been streaming? I mean, he's he's probably not streaming right now. But like, how how long has he been streaming like the Python dev stuff? Oh, sweet. That's awesome. Well, we're almost wrapped up. Fuck. I don't know why that map would fail. Uh, that's wrong. What am I doing? What am I doing? Um, this is the faulting address. That was double mapping the memory. It should work, actually. That's the contents of the file. Uh, XXDI FUBAR. Yep, there's the 87, the OF, all the shit. Fuck yeah. And let's DDIF. Dev, you random, OF is foobar, block size is one, count is one through 37. Okay. So this should correctly be able to handle that. Uh, okay, could not satisfy mapping read, 88. That means I am requesting too much. Uh, offset should be zero. To receive should be 
the smaller of the two, 4096, or the size minus the offset. And the offset is our fault address rounded down. So zero minus that zero. So that would be size minus that. Um, um, and that's a hard error. We got a hard error from the server. Well, let's see what the server. We'll just print some print some debug shit. See what it's requesting. See if it looks bunk. ID offset size. Reset. He got railed on Reddit by his Python next gen firewall. Why is that? Are people just questioning like the perf of it? Oh, size. Um, size. I don't want this to be size line. I want this to be the true size. Now, at some point, I did want that to be the size align. And I think. Yes, it was for this. Um, well, the fault should only occur in that range. Let's try this. Butte. Keeps requesting it. Uh, deadlock and ARP. Really? Oh, we got an ARP. We got an ARP. Uh, kernel source ARP. Yeah, that's getting the, that's deadlocking because it's trying to send us something. We're, we're responding to the ARP, but we end up uh, grabbing the lock on the DHP lease. Um... Intentionally avoiding the shorthand for for which. Okay. And what do we send here? Chunks, print, sending this chunk dot len. Sending leet. Okay. Um, to receive. To receive is self that has minus offset. That'll be leet. Oops. Um, print, uh, or mapping zero is five. Make that mute. Okay, so now I can print in here to kind of debug some of this stuff to see what I'm getting. Um, print UDP rec v. This is udp.payload.len. We're not getting any receives. Print ready to rec B.
we get there and we time out. Uh, to receive is zero then. No, it's not. While the receive off is less than that, we try to receive and we get nothing. And we send this. Means we're getting that. Why are we not getting this packet? Why are we not getting that packet? Let's go into net, uh, receive, timeouts, uh, receive UDP. Print got a packet. Uh, payload. Ah, uh, raw. X. Ref that. Ah, oh, we fucked something up here. Accidentally deleted that. That's all right. So we'll go to uh, receive. Okay. Okay, x6d foobar, that's probably the file contents. No, what is this? What What is this? Um, oh, that, that might be uninitialized stuff. Uh, let me do packet.raw and do this. That'll slice it down to the actual size of the packet rather than being the full 2K uh, buffer. That, that's probably the buffer for these. 52, 54, right? No. Oh, that's the, that's the Mac. Mac, this. All right, we can wire shark this. Or we're doing something stupid. I just want to get it figured out. Uh, Verber 2. Destination unreachable. Okay, reset. Okay. Um. So what's going on here? We send a request, it sends this, and then it sends leet. And that is destined to my ephemeral. Uh, 
Um, to length, don't fragment, ID. I don't think we use any of those. And I don't think we're dropping those. That's so weird. Got to pack it. Okay, so we'll go to receive UDP. Here we can say uh, print got UDP. I think I can pre-print that. We'll see if this hits. So we're only getting those packets. So we're missing we're missing the actual data packets. Okay. FN UDP. Get the IP header. Um, the length is less than eight or that. Hmm. Get the UDP header. Check that information. Validate the length. Do I never check the packet type? If you pay look get. I feel like I'm not actually checking the that this is a UDP packet. Yeah, I'm not. I'm totally not. I don't think that's the issue, though. But uh, let's see. Um, I'm going to print uh, length. See what we get here. Twelve. Why would this not be working for? Why would it work for the four K? That's what I don't understand. Because this is working for. When we do a full 4K, uh, we send a UDP packet out. Let's print. And here we'll say if if IP dot proto is not equal to IP proto UDP, doop UDP return none. I don't know how I didn't have that before. Protocol. If it's not UDP, then boop, bye bye. I just, I don't, I don't get where those packets are going. Got EDP. And this is just going to be the packet.raw. It's not actually EDP in this case. We're going to hex print it. And I feel like we're seeing the packet, but we're filtering it for some reason. 9102. 
Does this end in 9102? It does. So we are seeing that packet. We're just not parsing it as UDP for some reason. Okay, cool. Uh, UDP, FN, IP. So ETH, easy. This, if it's not IPv4. Okay, get the header. We only support those. Then get the total length, get the flags. Oh, is that one of these bits? Nope. Time to live, fragment offset. This is a checksum thing? Maybe we're doing our checksum wrong. That would make sense. Um, Packet raw. Yeah, I feel like that wouldn't make sense though. Uh, this is self raw, I think. See if we're making it here with those packets. For some reason, I'm filtering those packets out. Null doesn't exist on Rust? Yep, null does not exist on Rust. Correct. Noise. Okay, so we're not seeing that at that stage. So let's print it early. We should be seeing it here. Uh, probably should run the server. Okay, we're seeing the packets. Are we seeing them after the checksum? We are. So it's passing the checksum. Okay. Are we not passing the UDP checksum? Okay, we're getting there. Length is U size greater than that. Checksum's not passing. But we but we did the we did the math on that. That's not equal to zero. IP payload. Source IP dest IP. Those we get from there. I mean, we can just, we can ignore the checksum and see if everything works. Quite frankly, I'm fine with ignoring the checksum because it's pretty much pointless. I mean, it, it is pointless on UDP. Okay, UDP receive leet. I swore we tried every possible combination of those checksums. You know what? That, we'll put that back in. This is the first one we've had that has a an extra byte. Everything has been even numbered, I think. And these packets are odd numbered in the UDP payload size. So, the problem is probably in this. If bytes len mod two is not zero, you're wrapping add.
that. Get the last byte shifted in with zeros. Okay, let me try a shift zero and see if see if this works. I'm Yeah. Why is that shift zero though? So the last byte is unaligned. I feel like that's not, I mean, clearly it's right, but I don't know how that's the case. We read the last byte, which is unaligned. We then pad it with a zero. Well, it works, so I think we're we're gonna ship it. All right, so print UDP receive gone. All right, so this will print. Well, it doesn't print anything. Go back to the print. This will print the contents of the file. And this is for a leet size file. Beautiful. And then if I will set it to one byte, you should be able to do this. Yep. That's the XXD foobar BC. Nice. So let's up this size then. One meg count is 4096. We'll see how long it takes to do uh, four gigs. It's probably going to be relatively slow because this is meant for random access. This is not designed for sequential. Um, come on. Current release. Reset. See, it's it's requesting, it's downloading it uh, 4K at a time. We had a deadlock when we had to handle an ARP, so we need to fix that. Kernel source, oops, kernel source ARP. Kernel source net ARP. This is at uh, 104. That's getting the DHCP lease lock, and that happens on an ARP reply. And it's deadlocking because we already have the DHP lease locked where? Um, kernel source net. If I make that a set once, I would be fine, but... Uh, Receive lease. Ah, I see. I can just pass in that lease. Um. Oh, RIP. IPv4 adder. Three oh eight lease dot client IP. Okay, that should dodge that deadlock. Uh fill the netmap file.
That looks good to me. That looks good to me. Fuck yeah, let's do this uh, for offset in zero dot dot mapping dot len uh, step by 4096 um, core pointer read volatile mapping offset on safe so we're just gonna read that. Here we go. That was an MM196. Okay, for some reason, sometimes the server isn't seeing those packets. Uh, okay, 196. Let's fix a couple of these. 196. Free memory ref. Free memory ref on the boot args. That allows us to allocate new fizz. That makes sense. Okay. Um, to do that, we want to we want to set that on free mem. No preempt. Okay. Kernel entry. At this point, it's basically every, almost all locks are no preempting. Okay. There, it's getting stuck. I have a webcam today. Hell yeah. May I ask why Rust? Because Rust is a safe language. Um, and the act of Rust being a safe language uh, makes it a lot easier to develop code. You don't have security bugs. You don't have race conditions. It's easier because you don't have to manage your allocations and freeze um, manually. So there are just kind of a bunch of things that I think really make Rust great to work with. I think it's uh, faster to write code in, it's a higher level language, and it still has the same performance properties as C and C++. So I don't know what causes that state. Let's, uh, let's get Wireshark on that, try and figure out what's going on here. Fill the netmap file. Okay. I asked for foobar, and it responded with a one. But it took a second. Took a second for this to respond. And that was so close to right over a second. Okay, here I'm requesting and I'm not seeing packets. Seems like the receive side of the network card seems to go down. We must be like truly deadlocking something. Um What do you think about Golang? I think Golang is a, a great language, but it's uh, it's not very good for systems dev, which is all I do. Uh, what do you think about Temple OS? I'm pretty impartial. I think it does some neat things, but I don't think it's anything like it's it's strange, and I respect that because my OSs are strange as well. Um, all right, are we fucking up those checksums? You know, last time we had this issue was checksums. 
ADP. Let's go to net and check some. We need to write a thorough test for our checksum stuff because I'm guessing we probably have issues with it. Um, all right, let's see if this fixes it. Build a net map. Why did that take a second to respond? Yeah, it's some UDP check some shit. Mm, I'm still sending these requests. Why does that stop? I'm not deadlocked. I, I know I'm not deadlocked. Do I... Are my checksums just fucked? Does it ignore both checksums on IP and EDP? I swear we tested those. Maybe I maybe I changed something or reverted something. Filled a netmap file. Uh netmap file. Filled a netmap file. Let's set that to uh, not on read. On the net mapping side of things, we'll just set a five second timeout. Because it seems like sometimes it's taking a second for our server to respond. And then that gets stuck. What? What? What is causing that? It's sending me stuff. All right, I guess we add prints again to this. Uh, prints IP stuff O2X self dot raw. It might be hard to get it in the same state. Ugh. Is this printing too slow? Too slow? Damn it. Debugging this is gonna suck. There we go, got stuck. So these guys. Oh, one second. All 
Okay. Okay, so... Um... Yeah, what is going on here? Why... Why did we stop... Oh, it's sending a four. No, four is what we want. Right? Zero, one, two, three, four. It's a it's sending a read okay. I don't know if we're fucking up the nick state and we're not getting packets from the nick anymore. Why does it work for the first set? And why is it not always the same amount that it fails after? Two eight one two seven? I'm sending retries, and then for some reason, I just stop caring about what it sends me. So we are here. We're in this stage. We are sending this packet. I'm going to print uh, OK. Hopefully this isn't too spammy. There we go. Is this printing? Okay, we're not getting... We're not even getting this packet. Clearly, we're sending it. And we're getting the response, and we just... We don't... We don't believe that. For some reason... It's not taking a second for the server to respond, is it? No. Server's responding right away. Uh, what do you need internet for at startup? This is just to download files for stuff. Okay. And then we're not responding to our it's like it's like the network card is just dead. Like it it seems like the Intel Nick just just stops. And that would make no sense. Let's go to one twenty eight on these. I wonder if I don't know. I mean, we've we've stress tested this pretty hard. Printing good. And we're getting nothing. Nothing. Uh Where's that receive at? Um, let's see, this one, uh, print packet O2X question mark for packets raw to eight bytes just to limit the spew.
Okay. Yup. Looks good. Those prints had so much of a delay though, it might be hard to actually observe the results here. Who runs the server for starting these files though? Uh, are you supposed to hook up a file server to your router? Yeah, I would have a file server always hooked up on the network. So I would, I would run this server whenever I'm using this uh, kernel. Ugh. It's going to be hard to debug if I can't print. I mean, it's not deadlocking. It's just the, the network card just stops receiving packets, it seems. And I, I, don't, I don't know why. Oh, sweet. It's stuck. And we're not seeing any received packets. What would that be? Why does that stop receiving packets? Like we're Okay, uh receive No packet present. Print packet present. I don't I don't think we're deadlocking or or doing anything crazy like that. No, we can't be deadlocking because we're still sending packets. It's the receive side just gets completely busted. This is right on the receive side of things. If the status in one is not zero, then there's a packet present. Maybe the head and tail are getting fucked? Like, I'm pretty sure that I tried this uh, yesterday with a, a different network card set up. And I had no issues. Like, I, I did, like, four gig transfers yesterday. No problem. This protocol is slightly different. To be useful for the internet of things, wouldn't it? Update the server once and all your stuff gets updated too. Don't have to have anything other than RAM as storage on the things. Um, not necessarily. You're still going to need like some ROM or something. Um, I don't know. Flash is so cheap that you're kind of better off with Flash such that you can still boot. Because you, you can't purely network boot an IoT device because you need to have like the network configuration stored. And you need some sort of firmware that's capable of running the Wi-Fi chip. Okay, is this just not failing now? Or are we getting unlucky? Read volatile, swap the head, write the descriptor. Zeroing it out. 
and then we bump the head. Um. Oh, can I s can I get too far ahead on the head here? No. So I bump the tail to head. The fact that I added delay here makes me feel like it's something network card related. Like there it gets stuck at, at 31 million. Packet present. Adding that delay seems to fix it. Um, check the head. The head starts at zero. If that's not equal to zero, race, uh, race condition with the descriptors not being released too quickly? Yeah, I'm not sure. Allocate a packet, get a physical address of the new packet, place that into the, swamp that buffer in, and then at the head, Um, but I don't know how that would work. Like, clearly printing fixes it. Let's add a um, time sleep. We'll sleep for 10 milliseconds. Great. Okay, that's a little too easy. Let's go to 0.1 millis. Just a small delay there. It's a tiny delay there. Let me get rid of the OK print. Wherever that was at. Um, like the only thing I could think of is like, if the receive buffer is entirely full, do I do the wrong thing? Do I like consume out of bounds? But I, I don't think so. Uh, where the print was changing it, whether it was getting inlined or not. Hmm. Let me turn off this. And I'll get rid of this print. Probably should add a print at the end. 
when the transfer is complete. It's got whole buffer. Uh, n load. Uh, IPA. N load verber two. It's pretty solid. It's still going. It hasn't gotten stuck. So let's bump this down. Not getting stuck at this rate. Uh, that's a pretty damn good speed, I would say. I'd actually say that's a pretty fucking amazing speed for uh for this case. Pretty happy with that. Okay, sleep one. I don't like that. Okay, here we go back to normal. Maybe it was something about the prints. Maybe something about the prints is breaking stuff. I. That's fully back to original state. Net. I will disable the UDP checksum, but I will keep the TCP checksum. I don't care about the EDP checksum. Oh, that got stuck, didn't it? Hmm. Yep, there it goes. Um, okay. So... We'll add the sleep one back in. I don't know if something's getting reordered, like some memory's getting reordered. Shouldn't be the case. Just got back. What did you manage to finish today? Um, we're working on a um, uh, like network mapped files that will effectively allow us to remotely uh, map whatever file we want to look at. And that means we can kind of download the file as needed as like random as the file is randomly accessed. So we're testing that right now. There's some weird bug where eventually my like receive path just breaks and like stops working, um, which seems to make no sense. Adding a, sm oh, okay. But adding a sleep seems to fix it, which leads me to believe that there's some like weird caching issues. Um, Like, it feels like the head is, like, skipping ahead. But I don't know how that's possible. Because this will zero it out. We will, like, this will read zero in a loop. And then once that bit is set, then we'll fall through. 
Um, we'll read the length of the buffer. We'll allocate a packet. Get the physical address in the new packet. We'll swap that in place of the Rx buffers. Get the head. We write to the head location. Um, and then, so we've zeroed out the descriptor, and then we advance the tail, and then we advance our internal head. So if we were to go back, we would now read the next descriptor. Uh, I just, I don't know, because I didn't have this issue yesterday. Maybe it's the network card that I'm getting scheduled to. Maybe it's the, like, relaxed ordering stuff. But I, I, I really, I... I don't have any evidence of that being the case. Okay, that died. Those packets are going out, and I'm not receiving them. What do I set the tail to? Head is zero, head tail is zero for TX. We set the tail to the descriptor length minus one, which leaves one slot that is empty. And all the descriptors start off zeroed out. Does the card support iWarp? It does not. Fuck. What the hell? Tail. Do I have to wait for the head to advance in the nick? I clear the descriptor. I mean, the head should have advanced in the nick. Maybe I'm beating it? Like, that would be the only thing I could think of, is that I'm, somehow, the network card's head is not getting updated, but it, it should. The head should be reflected by this bit. Let me try the other Nick. I'm going to remove the E1000E entirely. Okay, this is just the E1000. Seems fine so far. Yeah, I wonder if it's like the relaxed ordering stuff happening on the E1000E. So I think the E1000E does support that. How long does this transfer take? 360 divided by 8, 45, 4,096. This is a about a minute and a half to do this transfer. Oh, and let's get rid of the sleep just to stress it as much as we possibly can. Reset. Okay, that gets stuck on the 
normal E1000. How? But having a sleep there seemingly changes it. Volatile read. Swap the heads, write this, bump this. Shouldn't the sleep prevent reordering? I don't think it's a reordering thing. I Well, on the network card. The network card can do reordering stuff. But not this E1000. Not the base E1000 model. So it can't be that. Um... Unless it's some like stat register getting full or stuck. None of this stuff is tri lock. It it seems like my head is getting desynced with the the Nick's head. And like for some reason I'm one behind or one ahead. Let's see if it's a. Uh, let's see if it's a memory corruption thing. How much RAM do I give this thing? Plenty. Um, maybe I, maybe I'm filling in the wrong thing. Maybe my like mapping the page tables is causing issues. It's uh. I will not map that. And I won't write to the page. Okay. So now I won't write memory. Maybe I'm maybe I'm clobbering some memory for some reason, but I I don't know how I would. So this is performing the allocations, but we're not copying into it. We're still zeroing out the end of the packet. Okay, let's put this in. We're actually going to set up the page, but we're not going to map the memory in into the page tables. Okay, that breaks it. Let's... Maybe it's a Rust aliasing issue. Um, can I get an interrupt there? I cannot get an interrupt there. Oh, that broke. Okay. Uh. Alright, so I'll get rid of the actual allocation and slicing of that page. So now I won't even make that page and I won't zero it out. So now we're basically doing nothing with memory. We're just doing receives. We shouldn't be getting exceptions. And I guess I'll just, oh, it died. Okay, so it just it just seems like something on the Nick is just stopping and just giving up. But I didn't have this last time. <sighs> what did I change, man? I can still send packets. Let 
Nothing here should really affect it. I don't know. I gotta go to bed. I've been up for 23 hours. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Gotta figure out this bug tomorrow. I will start doing some dev. But thanks for stopping by. Perf actually looks pretty good on this. That's probably what we're gonna get. We, we have to fix why it's getting stuck. But the performance is probably gonna be uh, around that, uh, which is actually really good. 400, 400 megabits a second for uh, random access is pretty crazy. So, hell yeah. See y'all around. Cheers.